Preface and Chapter One of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Teresa Bauman. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Preface All persons like stories. Children call for them from their earliest years. The purpose of this book is to provide children and youth with stories worth rereading, stories relating incidents of history, missionary effort, and home and school experiences. These stories will inspire, instruct, and entertain the readers. Nearly all of these have appeared in print before, and are reprinted in this form through the courteous permission of their writers and publishers. Stories worth rereading can be obtained only as a premium with the youth's instructor, a 16-page weekly, published by the Review and Herald Publishing Association, Tacoma Park, Washington, D.C. End of Preface Chapter 1. Their Word of Honor The president of the Great Bee Railway System laid down the letter he had just reread three times and turned about in his chair with an expression of extreme annoyance. I wish it were possible, he said slowly, to find one boy or man in a thousand who would receive instructions and carry them out to the letter without a single variation from the course laid down. Cornelius, he looked up sharply at his son, who sat at a desk close by, I hope you are carrying out my ideas with regards to your sons. I have not seen much of them lately. The lad Cyrus seems to me a promising fellow, but I am not so sure of Cornelius. He appears to be acquiring a sense of his own importance as Cornelius Woodbridge III, which is not desirable, sir, not desirable. By the way, Cornelius, have you yet applied the Hezekiah Woodbridge test to your boys? Cornelius Woodbridge, Jr., looked up from his work with a smile. No, I have not, father, he said. It's a family tradition, and if the proper care has been taken that the boys should not learn of it, it will be as much a test for them as it was for you and for me and for my father. You have not forgotten the day I gave it to you, Cornelius? That would be impossible, said his son, still smiling. The elder man's somewhat stern features relaxed, and he sat back in his chair with a chuckle. Do it at once, he requested, and make it a stiff one. You know their characteristics. Give it to them hard. I feel pretty sure of Cyrus. But Cornelius? He shook his head doubtfully and returned to his letter. Suddenly he wheeled around again. Do it Thursday, Cornelius, he said in his peremptory way. And whichever of them stands it shall go with us on the tour of inspection. That will be reward enough, I fancy. Very well, sir, replied his son, and the two men went on with their work without further words. They were in the habit of dispatching important business with the smallest possible waste of breath. On Thursday morning, immediately after breakfast, Cyrus Woodbridge found himself summoned to his father's library. He presented himself at once, a round-cheeked, bright-eyed lad of fifteen, with an air of alertness in every line of him. Cyrus, said his father, I have a commission for you to undertake, of a character which I cannot now explain to you. I want you to take this envelope, he held out a large and bulky packet, and, without saying anything to anyone, follow its instructions to the letter. I ask of you your word of honor that you will do so. The two pairs of eyes looked into each other for a moment, singularly alike in a certain intent expression, developed into great keenness in the man, but showing as yet only an extreme wide awakeness in the boy. Cyrus Woodbridge had an engagement with a young friend in half an hour. But he responded firmly, I will, sir. On your honor? Yes, sir. That is all I want. Go to your room and read your instructions. Then start at once. Mr. Woodbridge turned back to his desk with a nod and smile of dismissal to which Cyrus was accustomed. The boy went to his room, opening the envelope as soon as he had closed the door. It was filled with smaller envelopes, numbered in regular order. In folding these was a typewritten paper which read as follows. Go to the reading room of the Westchester Library. There open envelope number one. Remember to hold all instructions secret. C.W. Jr. Cyrus whistled. That's funny. It means my date with Harold is off. Well, here goes. He stopped on his way out to telephone his friend of his detention, took a Westchester Avenue car at the nearest point, and in twenty minutes was at the library. He found an obscure corner and opened envelope number one. Go to the office of W.K. Newton, room 703, 10th floor, Norfolk Building, X Street, reaching there by 9.30 a.m. Ask for letter addressed to Cornelius Woodbridge, Jr. 
On way down elevator, open envelope number two. Cyrus began to laugh. At the same time, he felt a trifle irritated. What's father at? He questioned in perplexity. Here I am, away uptown, and he orders me back to the Norfolk building. I passed it on my way up. Must be he made a mistake. Told me to obey instructions, though. He usually knows just about why he does things. Meanwhile, Mr. Woodbridge had sent for his elder son, Cornelius, a tall youth of seventeen with strong family features, varied by a droop in the eyelids and a slight drawl in his speech, lounged to the door of the library. Before entering, he straightened his shoulders. He did not, however, quicken his pace. Cornelius, said his father, promptly, I wish to send you upon an errand of some importance, but of possible inconvenience to you. I have not time to give you instructions, but you will find them in this envelope. I ask you to keep the matter and your movements strictly to yourself. May I have from you your word of honor that I can trust you to follow the orders to the smallest detail? Cornelius put on a pair of eyeglasses and held out his hand for the envelope. His manner was almost indifferent. Mr. Woodbridge withheld the packet and spoke with decision. I cannot allow you to look at the instructions until I have your word of honor that you will fulfill them. Is not that asking a good deal, sir? Perhaps so, said Mr. Woodbridge, but no more than is asked of trusted messengers every day. I will assure you that the instructions are mine and represent my wishes. How long will it take? inquired Cornelius, stooping to flick an imperceptible spot of dust from his trousers. I do not find it necessary to tell you. Something in his father's voice sent the languid Cornelius to an erect position and quickened his speech. Of course I will go, he said, but he did not speak with enthusiasm. And your word of honor? Certainly, sir. The hesitation before the promise was only momentary. Very well, I will trust you. Go to your room before opening your instructions. And the second, somewhat mystified boy went out of the library on that memorable Thursday morning to find his first order one which sent him to a remote district of the city, with the direction to arrive there within three quarters of an hour. Out on an electric car, Cyrus was speeding to another suburb. After getting the letter from the tenth floor of Norfolk building, he had read, Take Crosstown Car on L Street, transfer to Louisville Avenue, and go out to Kingston Heights. Find corner West and Dwight Streets and open envelope number three. Cyrus was growing more and more puzzled, but he was also getting interested. At the corner specified, he hurriedly tore open number three, but found to his amazement only the singular direction. Take Suburban Underground Road for Duane Street Station. From there go to Sentinel Office and secure third edition of yesterday's paper. Open envelope number four. "'Well, what under the sun, moon, and stars did he send me out to Kingston Heights for?' cried Cyrus aloud. He caught the next train, thinking longingly of his broken engagement with Harold Dunning, and of certain plans for the afternoon which he was beginning to fear might be thwarted, if this seemingly endless and aimless excursion continued. He looked at the packet of unopened envelopes. "'It would be easy to break open the whole outfit and see what this game is,' he thought. "'Never knew father to do a thing like this before. "'If it's a joke,' his fingers felt the seal of envelope number four. I might as well find it out at once. Still, father would never joke with a fellow's promise the way he asked it of me. My word of honor, that's putting it pretty strong. I'll see it through, of course. My, but I'm getting hungry. It must be near luncheon time. It was not, but by the time Cyrus had been ordered twice across the city and once up a 16-story building in which the elevator service was out of order, it was past noon, and he was in a condition to find envelope number seven a very satisfactory one. Go to Café Reynold on Westchester Square. Take a seat at table in left alcove. Ask waiter for card of Cornelius Woodbridge, Jr. Before ordering luncheon, read envelope number eight. The boy lost no time in obeying this command and sank into his chair in the designated alcove with a sigh of relief. He mopped his brow and drank a glass of ice water at a gulp. It was a warm October day and the sixteen flights had been somewhat trying. He asked for his father's card and then sat studying the attractive menu. I think I'll have... He mused for a moment, then said with a laugh. Well, I'm about hungry enough to eat the whole thing. Bring me the... Then he recollected, paused, and reluctantly pulled out envelope number eight, and broke the seal. Just a minute, he murmured to the waiter, and his face turned scarlet, and he stammered under his breath. Why, why, this can't be. Envelope number eight ought to have been bordered with black, judging by the dismay its order to a lecture hall to hear a famous electrician caused. But the Woodbridge blood was up now, and it was with an expression resembling that of his grandfather Cornelius, under strong indignation, that Cyrus stalked out of that charming place to proceed grimly to the lecture hall. 
Who wants to hear a lecture on an empty stomach, he groaned. I suppose I'll be ordered out anyway the minute I sit down and stretch my legs. Wonder if father can be exactly right in his mind. He doesn't believe in wasting time, but I'm wasting it today by the bucketful. Suppose he's doing this to size me up some way. He isn't going to tire me out so quick as he thinks. I'll keep going till I drop. Nevertheless, when, just as he was getting interested, he was ordered to go three miles to a football field and then ordered away again without the sight of the game he had planned for a week to see, his disgust was intense. All through that long, warm afternoon, he raced about the city and suburbs, growing wearier and more empty with every step. The worst of it was the orders were beginning to assume the form of a schedule, and commanded that he be here at 3.15 and there at 4.05, and so on, which forbade loitering, had he been inclined to loiter. In it all, he could see no purpose except the possible one of trying his physical endurance. He was a strong boy, or he would have been quite exhausted long before he reached envelope number 17, which was the last but three of the packet. This read, Reach home at 6.20 p.m. Before entering house, read number 18. Leaning against one of those big white stone pillars on the porch of his home, Cyrus wearily tore open number 18, and the words fairly swam before his eyes. He had to rub them hard to make sure he was not mistaken. Go again to Kingston Heights, corner of West and Dwight Streets. Reaching there by 6.50. Read number 19. The boy looked up at the windows, desperately angry at last. If his pride and his sense of the meaning of that phrase, my word of honor, as the men of the Woodbridge family were in the habit of teaching their sons, had not been of the strongest sort, he would have rebelled and gone defiantly and stormily in. As it was, he stood for one long minute with his hands clenched and his teeth set, and he turned and walked down the steps away from the longed-for dinner and out toward L Street and the car for Kingston Heights. As he did so, inside the house, on the other side of the curtains, from behind which he had been anxiously peering, Cornelius Woodbridge, Sr., turned around and struck his hands together, rubbing them in a satisfied way. He's come and gone, he cried softly, and he's on time to the minute. Cornelius Jr. did not so much as lift his eyes from the evening paper as he quietly answered, Is he? But the corners of his mouth slightly relaxed. The car seemed to crawl out to Kingston Heights. As it at last neared its terminus, a strong temptation seized the boy Cyrus. He had been on a purposeless errand to this place once that day. The corner of West and Dwight Streets lay more than a half mile from the end of the car route, and it was an almost untenanted district. His legs were very tired, his stomach ached with emptiness. Why not wait out the interval which it would take to walk out to the corner and back in a little suburban station, read envelope number 19, and spare himself? He had certainly done enough to prove that he was a faithful messenger. Had he? Certain old and well-worn words came to his mind. They had been in his writing book in the early school days. A chain is no stronger than its weakest link. Cyrus jumped off the car before it fairly stopped and started at a hot pace for the corner of West and Dwight Streets. There must be no weak places in his word of honor. Doggedly, he went to the extreme limit of the indicated route, even taking the longest way round to make the turn. As he started back beneath the arc light at the corner, there suddenly appeared a city messenger boy. He approached Cyrus and, grinning, held out an envelope. Ordered to give you this, he said, if you made connections. If you've been later than five minutes past seven, I was to keep dark. You've got seven and a half minutes to spare. Queer orders, but the big railroad boss, Woodbridge, gave them to me. Cyrus made his way back to the car with some self-congratulations that served to brace up the muscles behind his knees. This last incident showed him plainly that his father was putting him to severe tests of some sort, and he could have no doubt that it was for a purpose. His father was the sort of man who does things with a very definite purpose indeed. Cyrus looked back over the day with an anxious searching of his memory to be sure that no detail of the singular service required him had been slighted. As he once more ascended the steps of his own home, he was so confident that his labors were now ended that he almost forgot about envelope number 20, which he had been directed to read in the vestibule before entering the house. With his thumb on the bell button, he recollected, and with a sigh broke open the final seal. Turn about and go to Lenox Street Station, B Railroad, reaching there by 8.05. Wait for messenger and west end of station by telegraph office. It was a blow, but Cyrus had his second wind now. He felt like a machine, a hollow one, which could keep on going indefinitely. The Lenox Street station was easily reached on time. The hands of the big clock were only one minute past eight when Cyrus entered. At the designated spot, the messenger met him. Cyrus recognized him as a porter on one of the trains of the road, of which his grandfather and father were officers. Why, yes, he was the porter of the Woodbridge special car. He brought the boy a card which ran thus. Give Porter the letter from Norfolk Building, the card received at restaurant, the lecture coupon, yesterday evening sentinel, and the envelope received at Kingston Heights. Cyrus silently delivered up these articles, feeling a sense of thankfulness that not one was missing. 
The porter went away with them, but was back in three minutes. This way, sir, he said, and Cyrus followed, his heart beating fast. Down the track he recognized the fleet wing, President Woodbridge's private car, and Grandfather Cornelius he knew to be just starting on a tour of his own and other roads, which included a flying trip to Mexico. Could it be possible? In the car, his father and grandfather rose to meet him. Cornelius Woodbridge, Sr., was holding out his hand. Cyrus, lad, he said, his face one broad, triumphant smile. You have stood the test, the Hezekiah Woodbridge test, sir, and you may be proud of it. Your word of honor can be depended upon. You are going with us through 19 states to Mexico. Is that reward enough for one day's hardships? I think it is, sir, agreed Cyrus, his round face reflecting his grandfather's smile, intensified. Was it a hard pull, Cyrus? questioned the senior Woodbridge with interest. Cyrus looked at his father. I don't think so. Now, sir, he said. Both gentlemen laughed. Are you hungry? Well, just a little, grandfather. Dinner will be served the moment we're off. We have only six minutes to wait. I'm afraid, I am very much afraid. The old gentleman turned to gaze searchingly out the car window into the station. That another boy's word of honor is not? He stood watch in hand. The conductor came in and remained, awaiting orders. Two minutes more, Mr. Jefferson, he said. One and a half, one half minute. He spoke sternly. Pull out at 814 on the second, sir. Ah! The porter entered hurriedly and delivered a handful of envelopes into Grandfather Cornelius's grasp. The old gentleman scanned them at a glance. Yes, yes, all right, he cried with the strongest evidence of excitement Cyrus had ever seen in his usually quiet manner. As the train made its first gentle motion of departure, a figure appeared in the doorway. Quietly and not at all out of breath, Cornelius Woodbridge, third, walked into the car. Then Grandfather Woodbridge grew impressive. He advanced and shook hands with his grandson as if he were greeting a distinguished member of the board of directors. Then he turned to his son and shook hands with him also solemnly. His eyes shone through his gold-rimmed spectacles, but his voice was grave with feeling. I congratulate you, Cornelius, he said, on possessing two sons whose word of honor is above reproach. The smallest deviation from the outline schedule would have resulted disastrously. Ten minutes' tardiness at the different points would have failed to obtain the requisite documents. Your sons do not fail. They can be depended upon. The world is in search of men built on those lines. I congratulate you, sir. Cyrus was glad presently to escape to his stateroom with Cornelius. Say, what did you have to do? he asked eagerly. Did you trot your legs off all over town? Not much I didn't, said Cornelius grimly from the depths of a big towel. I spent the whole day in a little hole of a room at the top of an empty building with just ten trips down the stairs to the ground floor to get envelopes at certain minutes. I had not a crumb to eat nor a thing to do and could not even snatch a nap for fear I'd oversleep one of my dates at the bottom. I believe that was worse than mine, commented Cyrus reflectively. I should say it was. If you don't think so, try it. Dinner, boys, said their father's voice at the door, and they lost no time in responding. End of their word of honor. Chapter 2 of Stories worth rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Jasper Sutton. Stories worth rereading by Various. Chapter 2 Heroism. A tone of pride or petulance repressed a selfish inclination firmly fought, a shadow of annoyance set at naught, a measure of disquietude suppressed, a peace in opportunity possessed, a reconcilement generously sought, a purpose put aside, a vanquished thought, a word of self-explaining unexpressed. Trifles they seem, these petty soul restraints, Yet he who proves them so must needs possess. A constancy and courage grand and bold. They are the trifles that have made the saints. Give me to practice them in humbleness. And nobler power than mine doth no man hold. End of chapter 2 Recording by Andrew Jasper Sutton Chapter 3 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Welch. 
Tampa. Stories worth rereading by Various. Chapter 3. Muriel's Bright Idea. My friend Muriel is the youngest daughter in a large family of busy people. They are in moderate circumstances, and the original breadwinner has been long gone. So, in order to enjoy many of the comforts and a few of the luxuries of life, the young people have to be wage earners. I'm not sure that they would enjoy life any better than they do now if such were not the case, though there are doubtless times when they would like to be less busy. Still, even this condition has its compensations. Other people do not know how lovely vacations are was the way Esther expressed it as she sat one day on the side porch, hands folded lightly in her lap, and an air of delicious idleness about her entire person. It was her week of absolute leisure, which she had earned by a season of hard work. She is a public school teacher, belonging to a section and grade where they work their teachers 14 hours of the 24. Alice is a music teacher and goes all day from house to house in town and from school to school with her music role in hand. Ben, a young brother, is studying medicine in a doctor's office, also in town, and serving the doctor between times to pay for his opportunities. There are two others, an older brother just started in business for himself and a sister in a training school for nurses. So it was that this large family scattered each morning to their duties in the city ten miles away, and gathered at night like chickens to the home nest, which was mothered by the dearest little woman, who gave much of her time and strength to the preparation of favorite dishes with which to greet the wage earners as they gathered at night around the home table. It's a very happy family, but it was not about any of them that I set out to tell you. In truth, it was Muriel's apron that I wanted to talk about, but it seemed necessary to describe the family in order to secure full appreciation of the apron. Muriel, I should tell you, is still a high school girl, hoping to be graduated next year, though at times a little anxious lest she may not pass, and with ambitions to enter college as soon as possible. The entire family have ambitions for Muriel, and I believe that she will get to college in another year. But about her apron. I saw it first one morning when I crossed the street to my neighbor's side door that opens directly into the large living room and met Muriel in the doorway. As pretty a picture as a fair-haired, bright-eyed girl of 17 can make. She was in what she called her uniform, a short dress made of dark print, cut lower in the neck than a street dress. It had elbow sleeves and a bit of white braid stitched on their bands and around the square neck set off the little costume charmingly. Her apron was of strong dark green denim, wide enough to cover her dress completely. It had a bib waist held in place by shoulder straps and the garment fastened behind with a single button making it adjustable in a second. But its distinctive feature was a row of pockets, or rather several rows of them, extending across the front breadth. They were of varying sizes and all bulged out as if well filled. What in the world? I began and stared at the pockets. Muriel's merry laugh rang out. Haven't you seen my pockets before? she asked. They astonish you, of course. Everybody laughs at them, but I am proud of them. They are my own invention. You see, we're such a busy family all day long and so tired when we get home at night that we have a bad habit of dropping things just where they happen to land and leaving them. By the last of the week, this big living room is a sight to behold. It used to take half my morning to pick up the thousand and one things that did not belong here and carry them to their places. You do not know how many journeys I had to make because I was always overlooking something. So I invented this apron with a pocket in it for every member of the family and it works like a charm. Look at this big one with a bee on it. That is for Ben, of course, and it is always full. Ben is a great boy to leave his pencils and his handkerchiefs and everything else about. Last night, he even discarded his necktie because it felt choky. This pocket is Esther's. She leaves her letters and her discarded handkerchiefs as well as her gloves. 
and Kate sheds hair ribbons and hat pins wherever she goes. Just think how lovely it is to have a pocket for each and drop things in as fast as I find them. When I'm all through dusting, I have simply to travel once around the house and unpack my load. I cannot tell you how much time and trouble and temper my invention has saved me. It is a bright idea, I said, and I mean to pass it on. There are other living rooms and busy girls. Whose is that largest pocket, marked M? <laughs> Why, I made it for mother. But do you know, I have found out just in this very way that mothers do not leave things lying around. It is queer, isn't it? When they have so many cares, it seems to be natural for mothers to think about other people. So I made the M stand for miscellaneous, and I put into that pocket articles which will not classify and that belong to all of us. There are hosts of things for which no particular one seems to be responsible. Is it not a pity that I did not think of pockets last winter when we all had special cares and were so dreadfully busy? It is such a simple idea, you would have supposed that any person would have thought of it, but it took me two years. I just had to do it this spring because there simply was not time to run up and down stairs so much. You've proved once more the truth of the old proverb, necessity is the mother of invention, I said. And besides, you have given me a new idea. I'm going home to work it out. When it is finished, I will show it to you. Then I went home and made rows and rows of strong pockets to sew on a folding screen I was making from my workroom. Pansy in Christian Endeavor World By permission of Lothrop, Lee, and Shepherd Company End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Stories Worth Rereading」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Just Do Your Best Just do your best. It matters not how small, how little heard of. Just do your best, that's all. Just do your best, God knows it all, and in his great plan you count as one. Just do your best until the work is done. Just do your best, reward will come to those who stand the test. God does not forget, press on, nor doubt, nor fear, just do your best. Ernest Lloyd End of chapter 4 Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 5 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ross Clayton, June 3rd, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 5 The Strength of Clinton. When Clinton Stevens was 11 years old, he was taken very sick with pneumonia. During convalescence, he suffered an unexpected relapse, and his mother and the doctor worked hard to keep him alive. It is ten to one if he gets well, said Dr. Bemis, shaking his head. If he does, he will never be very strong. Mrs. Stevens smoothed Clinton's pillow even more tenderly than before. Poor Clinton, who had always been such a rollicking, rosy-cheeked lad, surely it was hard to bear. The long March days dragged slowly along, and April was well advanced before Clinton could sit at the window and watch the grass grow green on the slope of the lawn. He looked frail and delicate. He had a cough, too, a troublesome bark, that he always kept back as long as he could. The bright sunlight poured steadily in through the window, and Clinton held up his hand to shield his eyes. "'Why, Ma Stevens,' he said after a moment, "'just look at my hands.' They are as thin and white as a girl's, and they used to be regular paws. It does not look as if I would pull many weeds for Mr. Carter this summer, does it? Mrs. Stevens took his thin hands in her own patient ones. Never mind, dearie, she said. They will grow plump and brown again, I hope. A group of schoolchildren were passing by, shouting and frolicking. Clinton leaned forward and watched them till the last one was gone. 
some of them waved their caps but he did not seem elated mother he said presently i believe i will go to bed if you will help me i i guess i am not quite so strong now as i used to be clinton did not pull weeds for mr carter that summer but he rode around with the milkman and did little outdoor work for his mother which helped him to mend one morning in july he surprised the village by riding out on his bicycle but he overdid the matter and it was several weeks before he again appeared his cough still continued though not so severe as in the spring and it was decided to let him go to school in the fall dr bemis told mrs stevens that the schoolroom would be a good place to test clinton's strength and he was right in no other place does a young person's strength develop or debase itself so readily for honor or dishonor of course the doctor had referred to physical strength but moral strength is much more important clinton was a bright lad for his years and although he had not looked into his books during the summer he was placed in the same grade he had left when taken sick he did not find much difficulty in keeping up with any of his studies except spelling whenever he received a perfect mark on that subject he felt that a real victory had been won about christmas time the regular examinations were held the teacher offered a prize to each grade the pupil receiving the highest average in all studies to receive the prize much excitement no little speculation and a great deal of studying ensued clinton felt fairly confident over all his studies except spelling so he carried his spelling book home every night and he and his mother spent the evenings in wrestling with the long and difficult words examination day came at length and the afternoon for the seventh grade spelling was at hand the words were to be written and handed in across the aisle from clinton sat harry myers several times when teacher pronounced a word harry looked slyly into the palm of his hand clinton watched him his cheeks growing pink with shame then he looked round at the others many of them had some dishonest device for copying the words clinton swallowed something in his throat and looked across at matthews who pursed up his lips and nodded as if to say that he understood the papers were handed in and school was dismissed on monday after the morning exercises miss brooks gave out the prizes to the three grades under her care i have now to award the prize for the highest average to the seventh grade she said but first i wish to say a few words on your conduct during the recent examination in spelling i shall censure no one in particular although there is one boy who must set no more bad examples no one spelled the words correctly clinton stevens the least of any making his average quite low yet the prize goes to him i will tell you why as a chorus of oh oh greeted her ears spelling is clinton's hardest subject but he could easily have spelled more words right had he not possessed sufficient strength to prevent him from falling into the way followed by some of you as clinton went up the aisle for his prize he felt like crying but he managed to smile instead a few days before harry myers had ridiculed him because he was not strong enough to throw a snowball from the schoolhouse to the road now the teacher had said he was strong clinton's aunt jenny came to visit the family in december bringing her little daughter grace with her now grace had a mania for pulling other people's hair but there was no one in the stevens family upon whom she dared operate except clinton she began on him cautiously then aggressively clinton stood it for a while and then asked her politely but firmly to stop she stopped for half a day one night clinton came home from school pale and tired some of the boys had been taunting him on his spare frame and imitating his cough which had grown worse as the winter advanced sitting down by the window he looked out at the falling snow grace slipped up behind him and gave his hair a sharp tweak he struck out hastily and hit her uh, she was not hurt only very much surprised but she began to cry lustily and aunt jenny came hurrying in and took the child in her arms that night after supper clinton went into the sitting-room and called grace to him i want to tell you something he said i am sorry that i hit you and i ask your pardon will you forgive me dear grace agreed quickly and said shyly next time i want to pull anyone's hair i will pull my own 
Aunt Jenny was in the next room and overheard the conversation. It strikes me, Sarah, she said to Mrs. Stevens, later, that Clinton is a remarkably strong boy for one who is not strong. Most boys would not have taken the trouble to ask a small girl to forgive them, even if they were very much in the wrong. But Clinton has a strong character. The year Clinton was thirteen, the boys planned to have a corn roast one August night. We will get the corn in old Carter's lot, said Harry Myers. He has just acres of it and can spare a bushel or so as well as not. I suppose you will go with us, Clint? Clinton hesitated. No, said he, I guess not, and I should think if you want to roast corn, you could get it out of your own gardens. But if Mr. Carter's corn is better than any other, why can you not ask him? Oh, come now, retorted Harry. Do not let it worry you. Half the fun of roasting corn is in in taking it. And don't you come, Clinton. Don't. We would not have you for the world. You are too nice, Mr. Coffin. Clinton's cheeks flushed red, but he turned away without a word. When Mr. Carter quizzed Billy Matthews and found out all about it, Clinton was made very happy by the old man's words. It is not every chap that will take the stand you took. You ought to be thankful that you have the strength to say no. In the fall, when Clinton was fifteen, his health began to fail noticeably, and Dr. Bemis advised a little wine to build him up. Mother, said the boy, after thinking it over, I am not going to touch any wine. I can get well without it. I know I can. I do not want liquor, he continued. Wine is a mocker, you know. Did you not tell me once that Zyke Hastings, over in East Bloomfield, became a drunkard by drinking wine when he was sick? yes clinton i believe i told you so well then i do not want any wine i have seen zyke hastings too many times in december aunt jenny and grace made their annual visit with them came uncle jonathan who took a great liking to clinton my boy said he one day placing a big hand on the lad's shoulder early in the new year aunt jenny and i start for the pacific coast should you like to go with us well i rather guess i should gasped the surprised boy clasping his hands joyfully very well then you shall go returned uncle jonathan and your mother too clinton began to feel better before they were outside of pennsylvania when they had crossed the mississippi and reached the prairies his eyes were sparkling with excitement the mountains fairly put new life in him uncle jonathan watched him with pleasure Tell me, he said one day, when they were winding in and out among the Rockies, what has given you so much strength of character? Why, it was this way, said Clinton, bringing his eyes in from a chasm some hundreds of feet below. One day, when I was beginning to recover from that attack of pneumonia, I saw a lot of the boys romping along, and I felt pretty bad, because I could not romp and play, too. Then I thought that if I could not be strong that way, I could have the strength to do right so i began to try and succeeded admirably said uncle jonathan approvingly and really my boy i see no reason why you should not shout and play to your heart's content in a few months and uncle jonathan's words proved true for clinton in a sun-kissed california valley grew well and strong in a few months but through all his life he will have cause to be glad that he learned the value of the strength that is gained by resisting temptation controlling one's spirit, and obeying the Lord's command. Benjamin Keach End of chapter 5 The Strength of Clinton Chapter 6 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Stories worth rereading by Various. Chapter 6 The Doctor's Cow. I'm afraid she's done for, said the veterinary surgeon as he came out of the barn with Dr. Layton after working for an hour over Brindle, who had broken into the feed bins and devoured bran and middlings till she could eat no more. But keep up the treatment faithfully, and if she lives through the night, she will stand some show of getting well. The doctor walked down through the driveway with the surgeon, and stood for a few minutes at the gate under the maple trees that lined the sidewalk, talking earnestly. Then he went back into the house by the kitchen door. 
his wife met him with the oft-repeated words, I told you so, I said that boy would turn out of no earthly account. But he has turned out of some account, contradicted the doctor mildly. In spite of this carelessness, he has been a great help to me during the last month. It was boyish ignorance more than mere carelessness that brought about this disaster. To be sure, I have cautioned him not to leave the door of the feed room unfastened, but he had no idea how a cow would make a glutton of herself if she had a chance at the bins. You cannot expect a boy who was reared in a city tenement to learn all about the country and the habits and weaknesses of cattle in one short month. No, I shall not set him adrift again, not even if poor Brindle dies. You mean to say you are going to keep him just the same, John Layton? cried the doctor's wife. Well, if you are not the meekest man, Moses was not anything to you. He did lose his temper once. The doctor smiled and said quietly, Yes, and missed entering the promised land on account of it. Perhaps I should have done the same thing in his place, but I am sure that Moses, if he were in my place today, would feel just as I do about discharging Harry. It is pretty safe to assume that he, even if he did lose his temper at the continual grumbling of the croakers who were sighing for the fleshpots of Egypt, never ordered a young Israelite boy whose father and mother had been bitten by the fiery serpents and died in the wilderness, to clear out of camp for not putting a halter on one of the cows. "'John Layton, you are talking scripture!' remonstrated the perturbed housewife, looking up reprovingly as she sadly skimmed the cream from the very last pan of milk poor Brindle would ever give her. "'I certainly am, and I am going to act scripture too,' declared the doctor, with the air of gentle firmness that always ended any controversy between him and his excellent, though somewhat exacting, wife. "'Harry is a good boy, and he had a good mother too,' he says, "'but he has had a hard life, ill-treated by a father who was bitten by the fiery serpent of drink.' Now, because of his first act of negligence, I am not going to set him adrift in the world again. Not if it costs you a cow, remarked the woman. No, my dear, not if it costs me two cows, reasserted the doctor. A cow is less than a boy, and it might cost the world a man if I sent Harry away in a fit of displeasure, disgraced by my discharge, so that he could not find another place in the town to work for his board and go to school. Besides, Brindle will die anyway, and discharging the boy will not save her. No, of course not, but it was your taking the boy in, a penniless unknown fellow that has cost you a cow, persisted the wife. I told you at the time you would be sorry for it. I have not intimated that I am sorry I took the boy in, remarked the doctor, not perversely, but with steadfast kindness. If our own little boy had lived, and had done this thing accidentally, would I have been sorry that he had ever been born? or if little ted had grown to be thirteen and you and i had died in the wilderness of poverty leaving him to wander out of the city to seek for a home in god's fair country where his little peaked face could fill out and grow rosy as harry's had would you think it just to have him sent away because he had made a boyish mistake of course you would not mother your heart is in the right place even if it does get covered up sometimes and i guess to come right down to it you would not send harry away any more than i would when the poor boy is almost heartbroken over this unfortunate affair now, let us have supper, for I must be off. We cannot neglect sick people for a poor dying cow. Harry will look after Brindle. He will not eat a bite, I am afraid, so it is no use to call him in now. By and by you would better take a plate of something out to him, but do not say a harsh word to the poor fellow to make it any harder for him than it is. The doctor ate his supper hurriedly, for the sick cow had engaged every moment of his spare hours that day, and he had postponed until his evening round of visits a number of calls that were not pressing. When he came out to his buggy, Harry Aldous stood at the horse's head, at the carriage steps beside the driveway, his chin sunk on his breast, in an attitude of hopeless misery. "'Keep up the treatment, Harry. Make her as easy as possible,' said the doctor as he stepped into his buggy. "'Yes, sir. I'll sit up all night with her, Dr. Layton, if I can only save her,' was the choking answer, as the boy carefully spread the lap robe over the doctor's knees. "'I know you will, Harry, but I'm afraid nothing can save the poor creature.' about all we can do is to relieve her suffering until morning giving her a last chance and if she is no better then the veterinary surgeon says we would better shoot her and put her out of her misery the boy groaned oh dr layton why do you not scold me i could bear it better if you would just say one cross word he sobbed you have been kinder to me than my own father ever was and i have tried so hard to be useful to you now this dreadful thing has taken place all because of my carelessness i wish you would take that buggy whip to me i deserve it the doctor took the whip 
and gently dropped its lash across the drooping shoulders bowed on the horse's neck as the boy hid his face in the silken mane he loved to comb. Indeed, Dandy's black satin coat had never shone with such a lustre from excessive currying as in the month past, since the advent of this new little groom, who slept in the little back bedroom of the doctor's big white house, and thought it a nook in paradise. "'There's no use in scolding or thrashing a fellow who is all broken up anyway over an accident, as you are,' the doctor said kindly. "'Of course, it is a pretty costly accident for me, but I think I know where I can get a heifer, one of Brindle's own calves, that I sold to a farmer two years ago. That will make as fine a cow as her mother.' "'But the money, Dr. Layton! How can I ever earn that to make good your loss?' implored the boy, looking up. "'The money?' "'Oh, well, some day when you are a rich man you can pay me for the cow,' laughed the doctor, taking up the reins. "'In the meantime, make a good, trustworthy, honest man of yourself, no matter whether you get rich or not, and keep your thinking cap on a little better.' "'You had better eat some supper,' said a voice in the doorway a little later, as Mrs. Layton came noiselessly to the barn and surprised the boy kneeling on the hay in the horse's stall, adjoining the one where Brindle lay groaning, his face buried in his arms which were flung out over the manger. The lad scrambled to his feet in deep confusion. "'Oh, thank you, Mrs. Layton, but I cannot eat a bite,' he protested. "'It is ever so good of you to think of me, but I cannot eat anything.' "'You must,' said the doctor's wife firmly. "'Come outside and wash in the trough if you do not want to leave Brindle. You can sit nearby and watch her if you think you must, though it will not do a particle of good, for she is bound to die anyway. What were you doing in there on your knees, praying?' The woman's voice softened perceptibly as the question passed her lips, and she looked half pityingly into the pale, haggard young face, thinking of little Ted, and wondering how it would have looked at thirteen if he had done this thing. Yes, muttered Harry, plunging his hands into the water of the trough and splashing it over the red flame of a sudden burning blush that kindled in his ash-pale cheeks. Isn't it all right to pray for a cow to get well? It most kills me to see her suffer so. Mrs. Layton smiled unwillingly for the value of her pet cow's products touched her more deeply than a boy's penitent tears particularly when that boy was not her own there is no use of your staying in there and watching her suffer you cannot do her any good she insisted stay out here in the fresh air do you hear yes ma'am choked harry drying his face on the sleeve of his gingham shirt he sat down on a box before the door the plate of food in his lap and made an attempt to eat the daintily cooked meal but every mouthful almost choked him at about midnight the sleepless young watcher lying on the edge of the hay just above the empty manger over which a lantern swung lifted himself on his elbow at the sound of a long low shuddering groan and in another moment harry knew that poor brindle had ceased to suffer the effects of her gluttonous appetite creeping down to the stall he saw at a glance that the cow was dead and for a moment alone there in the stillness and darkness of the spring night he felt as if he were the principal actor in some terrible crime poor old hoss he sobbed kneeling down and putting his arm over the still warm neck i i've killed you after all the rich milk and butter you have given me that have made me grow strong and fat just by my carelessness <laughs> in after years the memory of that hour came back to harry aldous as the dominant note in some real tragedy and he never again smelled the fragrance of new hay mingled with the warm breath of sleeping cattle without recalling the misery and self-condemnation of that long night's watch in the early dawn dr layton found the boy lying beside the quiet form of the stall fast asleep from exhaustion and grief his head pillowed on the soft tawny coat he loved to brush until it gleamed like silk child alive he gasped, bending over and taking the lad in his arms and carrying him out into the sweet morning air. "'Harry, why did you not come and tell me and then go to bed?' he cried, setting the bewildered boy on his feet and leading him to the house. "'Now, my boy, no more of this grieving. The thing is done, and you cannot help it now. There is no more use in crying for a dead cow than for spilled milk. Now come in and go to bed, and stay there until tonight, and when you wake up, the new heifer, Brindle's daughter, will be in the barn waiting for you to milk her.' I am going to buy her this morning. Five years after that eventful night, Harry Aldous stood on the doctor's front porch, a youth of eighteen, bidding good-bye to the two who had been more to him than father and mother. He was going to college in the West, where he could work his way, and in his trunk was a high school diploma, and in his pocket a gilt-edged recommendation from Dr. Layton.
God bless you, my boy. Don't forget us, said the doctor, his voice husky with unshed tears, as he wrung the strong young hand that had been so helpful to him in the busy years flown by. Forget you, my more than father, murmured the young man, not even trying to keep the tears out of his eyes. No matter how many years it may be before I see you again, I shall always remember your unfailing kindness to me. And can I ever forget how you saved me for a higher life than I could possibly have lived if you had set me adrift in the world again for leaving that barn door unfastened and killing your cow? As long as I live, I shall remember that great kindness and try to deserve it by my life. Sure, Harry, said the doctor. That was nothing but common humanity. Uncommon humanity, corrected the youth. Goodbye, Mrs. Layton. I shall always remember your kindness, too, and that you never gave me any less butter or cream from poor Brindle's daughter for my grave offence. You have been like an own mother to me. You have deserved it all, Harry, said the doctor's wife, and there was a tear in her eye, too, which was an unusual sight, for she was not an emotional woman. I do not know it was such a great calamity, after all, to lose Brindle just as we did, for Daisy is a finer cow than her mother was, and there has not been another chance since to get as good a heifer. So it was a blessing in disguise, after all, Harry, laughed the doctor. As for you, you have been a blessing undisguised from that day to this. May the Lord bless and prosper you. Write to us often. Four years passed, and in one of the western states a young college graduate stepped from his pedestal of oratorical honours to take a place among the rising young lawyers of a prosperous new town that was fast developing into a commercial centre. "'I am doing well, splendidly,' he wrote Dr. Layton after two years of hard work, "'and one of these days I am coming back to make that promised visit.' But the years came and went, and still the West held him in its powerful clutch. Success smiled upon his pathway, and into his life entered the sweet new joy of a woman's love and devotion. Into his home came the happy music of children's voices. When his eldest boy was eight years old, his district elected him to the state senate, and four years later sent him to Congress, an honest, uncompromising adherent to principle and duty. And now at last, he wrote Dr. Layton, I am coming east, and I shall run down from Washington for that long-promised visit. Why do you write so seldom, when I have never yet failed to inform you of my pyrotechnic advancement into the world of politics? It is not fair. And how is the family cow? Surely Madame Daisy sleeps with her poor mother ere this, or has been cut up into roasts and steaks? And to this letter the doctor replied briefly but gladly. So you are coming at last, my boy. Well, you will find us in the same old house, a little worse for wear, perhaps, and leading the same quiet life. No, not the same, though it is quiet enough, for I am growing old, and the town is running after the new young doctors, leaving us old ones in the rear to trudge along as best we can. There isn't any family cow now, Harry. Daisy was sold long ago for beef, poor thing. We never got another, for I am getting too old to milk, and there never seemed to come along another boy like the old Harry, who would take all the barnyard responsibility on his shoulders. Besides, mother is crippled with rheumatism, and can hardly get around to do her housework, let alone to make butter. We are not any too well off since the Union Bank failed, for besides losing all my stock, I have had to help pay the depositors' claims. But we have enough to keep us comfortable, and much to be thankful for. Most of all, that our famous son is coming home for a visit. Bring your wife too, Harry, if she thinks it will not be too much of a drop from Washington society to our humble home. And the children, all five of those bright boys and girls, bring them all. I want to show them the old stall in the barn where twenty-five years ago I picked their father up in my arms one early spring morning as he lay fast asleep on the neck of the old cow over whose expiring breath he had nearly broken his poor little heart. Yes, father, of course it has paid to come down here. I would not have missed it for all the unanimous votes of the third ballot that sent me east, declared the United States Senator at the end of his three days' visit. Long ago, the Honourable Henry Aldous had fallen into the habit of addressing Dr. Layton in his letters by the paternal title. It does not seem possible that it is twenty years since I stood here, saying goodbye when I started west. By the way, do you remember what you told me that memorable night when the lamented Brindle laid down her life because of my carelessness and her own gluttony? I was standing at the horse's head, and you were sitting in your buggy, there at the carriage steps, and I said I wished you would horse with me instead of treating me so kindly. I remember you reached over and tickled my neck with the lash playfully, and told me there was no use in thrashing a fellow who was all broken up anyway over an accident. 
The doctor laughed as he held his arms more closely about the shoulders of Senator Aldous's two eldest boys, while Grandmother Layton, with little Ted in her lap, was dreaming again of the little form that had long, long ago been laid in a graveyard on the hillside. "'Yes, yes,' said the doctor. "'I remember. What a blessed thing it was I did not send you off that day to the tune the old cow died on.' And he laughed through his tears. "'Blessed?' echoed Mrs. Layton, putting down the wriggling Ted. "'It was providential!' "'You know, Harry, I was not so kind-hearted as John in those days, "'and I thought he ought to send you off, "'but he declared he would not, even if you had cost him two cows. "'He said that if he did, it might cost the world a man, "'and so it would have, if all they say you were doing out west "'for clean government is true.' "'Senator Aldous laughed and kissed the old lady. "'I did not know about that,' he said modestly. "'I am of the opinion that he might have saved more of a man for the world.' but certain it is he saved whatever manhood there was in that boy from going to waste by his noble act of kindness. But what I remember most, father, is what you told me there at the carriage step, that when I became a rich man I could pay you for that cow. Well, I'm not exactly a rich man, for I'm not in politics for all the money that I can get out of it, but I am getting a better income than my leaving that barn door open would justify anyone in believing I could ever get by my brains. So now I can pay that long-standing debt without inconvenience. It may come handy for you to have a little fund laid by, since the Union Bank went to smash and all your stock with it. And so much of your other funds went to pay the poor depositors of that defunct institution. It was just like you, father, not to dodge the assessments, as so many of the stockholders did, by putting all your property in your wife's name. So, since you made one investment twenty-five years ago that has not seemed to depreciate in value very much, an investment in a raw young boy who did not have enough gumption to fasten a barn door, here is the interest on what the investment was worth to the boy, at least a little of it, for I can never begin to pay it all. Good-bye, both of you, and may God bless you. Here comes our carriage, Helen. When the dust of the departing hack had filtered through the morning sunlight, two pairs of tear-dimmed eyes gazed at the slip of blue paper in Dr. Layton's hand, a cheque for five thousand dollars. We saved a man that time, sure enough, murmured the old doctor softly. End of chapter 6 by Emma S. Allen in The Wellspring Chapter 7 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Andrew Jasper Sutton Stories worth rereading. Brotherly kindness. A man may make a few mistakes, regardless of his aim, but never, never criticise, and cloud him o'er with blame. For all have failed in many things, and keenly feel the smarting stings, which haunt the mind by day and night, till they have made offences right. So liberal be with those you meet, e'en though they may offend and wish them well as on they go, till all the journey end. Sometimes we think our honours hurt, when someone speaks a little pert. But never mind, just hear the good, and ever stand where patience stood. Look for the good, the true, the grand, in those you wish to shun, and you will be surprised to find some good in every one. Then help the man who makes mistakes to rise above his little quakes, to build a new with courage strong, and fit himself to battle wrong. End of chapter 7 Recording by Andrew Jasper Chapter 8 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Honey at the Phone Honey's mama had gone to market, leaving her home with Nurse. Nurse was upstairs making beds, while little Honey, with hands behind her, was trudging about the sitting room looking for something to do. There was a phone in the house, which was a great mystery to Honey when it first came. She could hear voices talking back to mama, yet could not see a person. Was someone hidden away in the horn her mother put to her ear? or was it in the machine itself? Honey never failed to be on hand when the bell rang, and found that her mother generally talked to her best and dearest friends. 
ladies who were such frequent callers that honey knew them all by name her mamma wrote down the names of her friends with the number of their phones and because the child was so inquisitive about it she very carefully explained to her just how the whole thing worked never thinking that honey would sometime try it for herself and indeed for a while honey satisfied herself by playing phone she would roll up a piece of paper and call out through it hello asking and answering all the questions herself one day on finding herself alone she took down the receiver and tried to talk to one of her mamma's friends but it was a failure she watched mamma still more closely after that on this particular morning while mamma was at market she tried again commencing with the first number on her mamma's list taking down the receiver she called out hello the answer came back hello i want a215 said honey holding the receiver to her ear yes came the reply are you miss samor asked honey yes was the reply we wants you to come to our house tonight to supper mamma and me who's mamma and me asked the voice honey was the reply honey through the phone eh laughed the voice tell mamma i will come with pleasure honey was not only delighted but greatly excited she used every number on her mother's list inviting them all to supper about four o'clock in the afternoon the guests began to arrive much to mamma's amazement and consternation especially when they divested themselves of their wraps and proceeded to make themselves comfortable what could it mean she would think she was having a surprise party if everyone had not come empty-handed perhaps it was a joke on her if so they would find she would take it pleasantly there was not enough in the house to feed half that crowd but she had the phone and she fairly made the orders fly for a while when her husband came home from his office he was surprised to find the parlors filled with company while helping the guests he turned to his wife saying why this is sort of a surprise is it not mamma's face flamed and she looked right down to her nose without saying a word why did you not tell me you were going to invite them and i would have brought home some flowers said honey's papa honey who sat next to her papa resplendent in a white dress and flowing curls clutched his sleeve and said it's my party papa i whited em through the phone honey likes to have clean clothes on and have company it was the visitors turned out to blush but honey's papa and mamma laughed so heartily and made them feel that it was all right even if honey had sent out the invitations and not one went home without extending an invitation to her host and hostess to another dinner or supper and in every one honey was included just what she wanted said her papa as he tossed her up in his arms and kissed her then turning to his wife he said never mind mother she will learn better as she grows older End of honey at the phone Chapter 9 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb K. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Authors. One of Father's Stories by Ethel Hobbs Walters. When children, nothing pleased us more than to listen to Father's Stories. Mother Goose melodies were nothing beside them in fact we never heard fairy stories at home and when father told of his boyhood days the stories had a charm which only truth can give i can hear him now as he would reply to our request for a story by asking if he had ever told us how his father tried to have a raising without rum of course we had heard about it many times but we were sure to want our memories refreshed so we would sit on a stool at his feet or climb upon his knee while he told us his story my grandfather, George Hobbs, was one of the pioneers of the Kennebec Valley. He had an indomitable will and was the kind of man needed to subdue a wilderness and tame it into a home. He was a revolutionary pensioner, having enlisted when only twelve years of age. He was too young to be put in the ranks and was made a waiter in the camp. When I was a boy, I can remember that he drove twenty miles, once a year, to Augusta, Maine's capital, to draw his pension. Snugly tucked under the seat of his sleigh was a four-gallon keg in a box. The keg was to be filled with Medford rum for himself and the box with nuts and candy for his grandchildren. After each meal, as far back as father could remember, grandfather had mixed his rum and water in a pewter tumbler, stirred in some brown sugar with a wooden spoon, and drunk it with an air of one who was performing an unquestionable duty. Grandfather was a ship carpenter by trade, and therefore in this new country was often employed to frame and raise buildings. Raisings were great social events. 
the whole neighborhood went and neighbors covered more territory than they do now the raising of a medium-sized building required about a hundred and fifty men and their good wives went along to help in the preparation of the dinner the first thing on the day's program was the raising and not a stroke of work was done until all had been treated to a drink of rum the common liquor of the day after the frame was erected one or two men whose courage fitted them for the feat had the honor of standing erect on the ridge pole and repeating this rhyme here is a fine frame stands on a fine spot may god bless the owner and all that he's got men would sometimes walk the ridge pole and sometimes one more daring than the others would balance himself on his head upon it then followed a bountiful dinner in which meat and potatoes baked beans boiled and fried eggs indian pudding and pumpkin pies figured prominently often as many as one hundred and twenty-five eggs were eaten after dinner came wrestling boxing and rough and tumble contests in which defeat was not always taken with the best of grace this was before the subject of temperance was agitated much in the good old state of maine the spirit of it however was awakening in the younger generation my father was enthusiastic over it and announced his intention of raising his new house without the aid of rum to grandfather this was no trifling matter it was the encroachment of new ideas upon old ones a pitting of the strength of the coming generation against his own to his mind no less than to fathers a principle was involved and the old soldier prepared to fight his battle with some spirit he said to his father it cannot be done jotham it cannot be done but father was just as sure that it could it was grandfather's task to fit the frame he went industriously to work and father thought that he had quietly yielded the point the day for the raising came the first in that part of the county to be conducted on temperance principles there were no telephones to spread the news but long before the day arrived everybody far and near knew that jotham hobbs was going to raise his new house without rum the people came some eager to help to establish the era of temperance and some secretly hoping that the project would fail a generous dinner was cooking indoors for the host intended to refuse his guest nothing that was good the song of mallets and hammers rang out and the timbers began to come together but the master framer was idle over by the old house door sat grandfather he positively refused to lend a hand to the enterprise unless treated to his rum for a time the work progressed rapidly then there came a halt there was a place where the timbers would not fit after much delay and many vain attempts to go on with the work father asked grandfather to help but he only shook his head and grimly replied that it was ten to one if it ever came together without rum there were more vain attempts more delays finally father seeing that he must yield or give up the work got some rum and handed it to grandfather the old man gravely laid aside his pipe drank the medford and walked over to the men he took a tenon marked ten and placed it on the mortise marked one the problem was solved he had purposely marked them in that way instead of marking them alike as was customary with a sly twinkle in his eye he said i told you it was ten to one if it ever came together but the cause of temperance had come to stay and grandfather met his waterloo when squire low built his one hundred foot barn three hundred men were there to see that it went up without rum grandfather and a kindred spirit old uncle benjamin burl stood at a safe distance hoping to see another failure but section after section was raised the rafters went on and finally the ridge pole the old men waited to see no more they dropped their heads turned on their heels and walked away these events occurred between eighteen hundred and thirty and eighteen hundred and forty since then the cause of temperance has made rapid progress in the state capital of augusta maine is a petition sent to the legislature in eighteen hundred and thirty five by one hundred and thirty nine women of brunswick maine it is a plea for a prohibitory law and is probably the first attempt made to secure a legislative enactment against the liquor traffic one paragraph which is characteristic of the whole document is worth quoting we remonstrate against this method of making rich men richer and poor men poorer of making distressed families more distressed of making a portion of the human family utterly and hopelessly miserable debasing the moral nature thus clouding with despair their temporal and future prospects this petition met with no recognition by that legislator there were many customs to be laid aside many prejudices to overcome and it was not till eighteen hundred and fifty one that maine became a prohibition state since that time her health and wealth have steadily increased in greater proportion than other states which have not adopted temperance principles and public sentiment which is a powerful ally is against the liquor traffic end of one of father's stories 
by Ethel Hobbs Walters. Recording by Deb K. Chapter 10 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 10 What Rum Does. I was sitting at my breakfast table one Sunday morning when I was called to my door by the ringing of the bell. There stood a boy about fourteen years of age, poorly clad, but tidied up as best he could. He was leaning on crutches, for one leg was off at the knee. In a voice trembling with emotion, and with tears coursing down his cheeks, he said, "'Mr. Hoagland, I am Freddy Brown. I have come to see if you will go to the jail and talk and pray with my father. He is to be hanged to-morrow for the murder of my mother.' My father was a good man, but whiskey did it. I have three little sisters younger than myself. We are very, very poor and have no friends. We live in a dark and dingy room. I do the best I can to support my sisters by selling papers, blacking boots, and doing odd jobs. But, Mr. Hoagland, we are very poor. Will you come and be with us when father's body is brought home? The governor says we may have his body after he is hanged. I was deeply moved to pity, I promised, and made haste to the jail, where I found his father. He acknowledged that he must have murdered his wife, for the circumstances pointed that way, but he had not the slightest remembrance of the deed. He said that he was crazed with drink, or he never would have committed the crime. He said, "'My wife was a good and faithful mother to my little children,' Never did I dream that my hand could be guilty of such a crime. The man could bravely face the penalty of the law for his deed, but he broke down and cried as if his heart would break when he thought of leaving his children in a destitute and friendless condition. I read and prayed with him and left him to his fate. The next morning I made my way to the miserable quarters of the children— I found three little girls upon a bed of straw in one corner of the room. They were clad in rags. They would have been beautiful girls had they had the proper care. They were expecting the body of their dead father, and between their cries and sobs they would say, Papa was good, but whiskey did it. In a little time two strong officers came, bearing the body of the dead father in a rude pine box. They set it down on two old rickety stools. The cries of the children were so heart-rending that the officers could not endure it, and made haste out of the room. In a moment the manly boy nerved himself and said, "'Come, sisters, kiss Papa's face before it is cold.' They gathered about his face and smoothed it down with kisses, and between their sobs cried out, "'Papa was good, but whiskey did it. Papa was good, but whiskey did it. I raised my heart to God and said, O oh God, did I fight to save a country that would derive a revenue from a traffic that would make a scene like this possible. Youth's Outlook End of chapter 10 Recording by Christine Lehman Chapter 11 of Stories Worth Rereading this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Welch, Tampa. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 11 My Mother's Ring I am living now on borrowed time. The sun of my allotted life day has set, and with the mellow twilight of old age, there come to my memory reflections of a life which, if not well spent, has in it enough of good at least to make these reflections pleasant. And yet, during all the years in which I have responded to the name Carter Brassfield, but a single fortnight of time, it seems to me, is worth recounting. 
We were living in Milwaukee, having recently moved there from York State, where I was born. My father, a bookkeeper of some expertness, not securing a position in our newly adopted city as soon as he had expected, became disheartened, and, to while away the time that hung so heavily, took to drinking beer with some newly acquired German friends. The result was that our funds were exhausted much sooner than they should have been, and Mother took it upon herself to turn breadwinner for the family by doing some plain sewing. A small allotment of this money she gave to me one day on my return from school, and sent me to Mr. Blodgett, the grocer, to purchase some supplies. After giving my order to one of the clerks, I immediately turned my attention to renewing my acquaintance with Tabby, the store cat. While I was thus engaged, I heard my name repeated by a stranger who was talking with Mr. Blodgett, and ere long the man sauntered over, spoke to me, and after some preliminary remarks, asked if I was Carter Brassfield. He was dark, had a sweeping mustache, and wore eyeglasses. Upon being assured that I was Carter Brassfield, he took from his pocket a gold ring, and turning it around carefully in the light, read the inscription on its inner side. "'Is your mother's name Alice?' he asked. I told him that it was. "'And your father's name Carter?' "'Yes, sir,' said I. Then he showed the ring to me and asked if I had seen it before. I at once recognized the ring as my mother's. Since I could remember she had worn it, until recently, of late she had grown so much thinner that the ring would no longer stay on her finger, and she was accustomed, therefore, to keep the circlet in a small drawer of her dresser, secure in an old purse with some heirlooms of coins, and I was greatly surprised that it should be in the possession of this stranger. I told him that it was my mother's ring, and asked him how he came by it. "'Your father put it up in a little game the other day,' said he, and it fell into my possession. He dropped the ring into his purse, which he then closed with a snap. I have been trying for several days to see your father, and give him a chance at the ring before I turned it in to the pawnbrokers. If your mother has any feeling in the matter, tell her she can get the ring for ten dollars he added as he turned away. I did not know what to do. I was so ashamed and hurt to think that my father, whom I loved and in whom I had such implicit confidence, should have gambled away my mother's ring, the very ring I was old enough to appreciate, he had given her in pledging to her his love. My eyes filled with tears, and as I stood, hesitating, Mr. Blodgett came forward, admonishing me not to forget my parcels. He evidently observed my tears, although I turned my face the other way, for shame of crying. At any rate, he put his hand on my shoulder and said very kindly, "'It's pretty tough, Carter, my boy, isn't it?' He referred, I thought, to my father, for father was uppermost in my thoughts. Then, lowering his voice, he said, "'But I will help you out, son. I will help you out.' I forgot all about hiding my tears, and faced about, attracted by his kindness. I will redeem the ring and keep it for you until you can get the money. What do you say? You can rest easy then, knowing that it is safe, and you can take your time. What do you say? With some awkwardness I acquiesced to his plan. Then he called the stranger, and, leading the way back to his desk, paid to him the ten dollars requiring him to sign a paper though i did not understand why he then placed the ring carefully in his safe there carter said he rubbing his hands together it is safe now and we need not worry i held out my hand to him then without a word took my parcels and started on a run for home that evening father was more restless than usual he repeatedly lamented his long and forced idleness after retiring that night, I lay awake for a long time, evolving in my mind plans whereby I might earn ten dollars to redeem the ring. Finally, with my boyish heart full of hope and adventure, I fell asleep in the wee hours of morning. After breakfast, I took my books as usual, but instead of going to school, I turned my steps toward a box factory where I knew a boy of about my own age to be working. I confided to him as much of my story as I thought advisable, and he took me to the superintendent's office and introduced me. I was put to work at five dollars a week, with the privilege of stopping at four each day. 
every afternoon I brought my schoolbooks home and studied as usual till bedtime and took them with me again in the morning. During the two weeks I was employed at the factory, neither father nor mother suspected that I had not been to school each day. In fact, I studied so assiduously at night that I kept up with my classes, but my mother observed that I grew pale and thin. At the end of two weeks, when I told the manager I wanted to stop work, he seemed somewhat disappointed. He paid me two crisp five-dollar notes, and I went very proudly to Mr. Blodgett with the first ten dollars I had ever earned, and received that gentleman's hearty praise and my mother's ring. That evening, father was out as usual, and I gave the ring to mother, telling her all about it and what I had done. She kissed me, and, holding me close in her arms for a long time, cried, caressing my hair with her hand, and told me that I was her dear good boy. Then we had a long talk about father, and agreed to lay nothing to him, at present, about the ring. The next evening, when I returned from school, father met me at the hall door, and asked if I had been to school. I saw that he had been drinking, and was not in a very amiable mood. I met Clarence Stevenson just now, he said, and he inquired about you. He thought you were sick, and said you had not been to school for two weeks, unless you had gone today. I stood for a moment without answering. What do you say to that? he demanded. Clarence told the truth, father, I replied. He did, eh? What do you mean by running away from school in this manner? He grew very angry, catching me by the shoulder, gave me such a jerk that my books, which I had under my arm, went flying in all directions. Why have you not been to school? He said thickly. I, I was working, but I did not intend to deceive you, father. Working? Working? Where have you been working? At Mr. Hazelton's box factory. At a what factory? Box factory. How much did you earn? he growled, watching me closely to see if I told the truth. Five dollars a week, I said timidly, feeling all the time that he was exacting from me a confession that I wished on his account to keep secret. Five dollars a week? Where's the money? Show me the money! He persisted incredulously. I cannot, father. I do not have it. I was greatly embarrassed and frightened at his conduct. Where is it? he growled. I, I, I spent it, I said, not thinking what else to say. A groan escaped through his shut teeth as he reeled across the hall and took down a short rawhide whip that had been mine to play with. Although he had never punished me severely, I was now frightened at his anger. Don't whip me, father, I pleaded as he came staggering toward me with the whip. Don't whip me, please. I started to make a clean breast of the whole matter, but the cruel lash cut my sentence short. I had on no coat, only my waist, and I am sure a boy never received such a whipping as I did. I did not cry at first. My heart was filled only with pity for my father. Something lay so heavy in my breast that it seemed to fill up my throat and choke me. I shut my teeth tightly together and tried to endure the hurt but the biting lash cut deeper and deeper until I could stand it no longer. Then my spirit broke, and I begged him to stop. This seemed only to anger him the more, if such a thing could be. I cried for mercy and called for mother, who was out at one of the neighbors. Had she been at home, I am sure she would have interceded for me. But he kept on and on, his face as white as the wall. I could feel something wet running down my back, and my face was slippery with blood when I put my hand up to protect it. I thought I should die. Everything began to go round and round. The strokes did not hurt any longer. I could not feel them now. The hall suddenly grew dark, and I sank upon the floor. Then I suppose he stopped. When I returned to consciousness, I was lying on the couch in the dining room with a wet cloth about my forehead, and my mother was kneeling by me, fanning me and crying. I put my arms about her neck and begged her not to cry, but my head ached so dreadfully that I could not keep back my own tears. I asked where father was, and she said he went downtown when she came. He did not return at supper time, nor did we see him again until the following morning. 
i could eat no supper that night before going to bed and mother came and stayed with me i am sure she did not sleep for as often as i dropped off from sheer exhaustion i was wakened by her sobbing then i too would cry i tried to be brave but my wounds hurt me so and my head ached i seemed to be thinking all the time of father my poor father i felt sorry for him and kept wondering where he was all through the night it seemed to me that i could see him drinking and drinking and bedding and bedding my back hurt dreadfully and mother put some ointment and soft cotton on it it was late in the morning when i awoke and heard mother and father talking downstairs with great difficulty i climbed out of bed and dressed myself when i went down mother had a fire in the dining-room stove and father was sitting or rather lying with both arms stretched out upon the table his face buried between them by him on a plate were some slices of toast that mother had prepared and a cup of coffee which had lost its steam without being touched i went over by the stove and stood looking at father i had remained there but a moment my heart full of sympathy for him and wondering if he were ill when he raised his head and looked at me i had never before seen him look so haggard and pale as his eyes rested on me the tears started down my cheeks carter my child he said hoarsely i have done you a great wrong can you forgive me in an instant my arms were about his neck i felt no stiffness nor soreness now he folded me to his breast and cried as i did after a long time he spoke again if i had only known your mother has just told me it was the beer carter the beer i will never touch the stuff again never he said faintly then he stretched out his arms upon the table and bowed his head upon them i stood awkwardly by the tears streaming down my cheeks but they were tears of joy mother who was standing in the kitchen doorway with her apron to her eyes came and put her arm about him and said something very gently which i did not understand then she kissed me several times i shall never forget the happiness of that hour for a long time after that father would not go downtown in the evening unless i could go with him he lived to a good old age and was for many years head bookkeeper for mr blodgett he kept his promise always mother is still living and still wears the ring alva h sons m d in the union signal end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories worth rereading by various. The Lad's Answer. Our little lad came in one day with dusty shoes and weary feet. His playtime had been hard and long out in the summer's noontide heat. I'm glad I'm home, he cried and hung his torn straw hat up in the hall while in the corner by the door he put away his bat and ball i wonder why his auntie said this little lad always comes here when there are many other homes as nice as this and quite as near he stood a moment deep in thought then with the love light in his eye he pointed where his mother sat and said here she lives that is why with beaming face the mother heard her mother heart was very glad a true sweet answer he had given that thoughtful loving little lad and well i know that hosts of lads are just as loving true and dear that they would answer as did he tis home for my mother's living here Arthur V. Fox End of chapter 12
Chapter Thirteen of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter Thirteen The Bridal Wine Cup. Pledge with wine. Pledge with wine, cried young and thoughtless Harvey Wood. Pledge with wine, ran through the bridal party. The beautiful bride grew pale. The decisive hour had come. She pressed her white hands together, and the leaves of the bridal wreath trembled on her brow. Her breath came quicker, and her heart beat wilder. Yes, Marion, lay aside your scruples for this once, said the judge in a low tone, going toward his daughter. The company expects it. Do not so seriously infringe upon the rules of etiquette. In your own home do as you please, but in mine, for this once, please me. Pouring a brimming cup, they held it, with tempting smiles, toward Marian. She was very pale, though composed, and her hand shook not as, smiling back, she gracefully accepted the crystal tempter and raised it to her lips. But scarcely had she done so when every hand was arrested by her piercing exclamation of, "'Oh, how terrible!' "'What is it?' cried one and all, thronging together, for she had slowly carried the glass at arm's length and was fixedly regarding it. "'Wait,' she answered, while a light which seemed inspired shone from her dark eyes. "'Wait, and I will tell you.' "'I see,' she added slowly, pointing one finger at the sparkling ruby liquid. A sight that beggars all description. And yet, listen, I will paint it for you if I can. It is a lovely spot. Tall mountains, crowned with verdure, rise in awful sublimity around. A river runs through, and bright flowers grow to the water's edge. But there a group of Indians gather. They flit to and fro, with something like sorrow upon their dark brows. In their midst lies a manly form, but his cheek, how deathly! His eyes are wild with the fitful fire of fever. One friend stands before him, nay, I should say, kneels, for see, he is pillowing that poor head upon his breast. Oh, the high, holy-looking brow! Why should death mark it, and he so young? Look how he throws back the damp curls! see him clasp his hands, hear his thrilling shrieks for life, mark how he clutches at the form of his companion, imploring to be saved. Oh, hear him call piteously his father's name, see him twine his fingers together as he shrieks for his sister, his only sister, the twin of his soul, weeping for him in his distant native land. See, she exclaimed, while the bridal party shrank back, the untasted wine trembling in their faltering grasp, and the judge fell overpowered upon his seat. See, his arms are lifted to heaven. He prays, how wildly, for mercy. Hot fever rushes through his veins. He moves not. His eyes are set in their sockets. Dim are their piercing glances. In vain his friend whispers the name of father and sister. Death is there. Death! and no soft hand, no gentle voice to soothe him. His head sinks back, one convulsive shudder. He is dead. A groan ran through the assembly. So vivid was description, so unearthly her look, so inspired her manner, that what she described seemed actually to have taken place then and there. They noticed also that the bridegroom hid his face in his hands and was weeping, dead she repeated again her lips quivering faster and faster and her voice more broken and there they scoop him a grave and there without a shroud they lay him down in that damp reeking earth the only son of a proud father the only idolized brother of a fond sister there he lies my father's son my own twin brother a victim to this deadly poison father she exclaimed, turning suddenly, while the tears rained down her beautiful cheeks. Father, shall I drink it now? The form of the old judge was convulsed with agony. 
He raised not his head, but in a smothered voice he faltered, No, no, my child, no. She lifted the glittering goblet and let it suddenly fall to the floor where it was dashed in a thousand pieces. Many a tearful eye watched her movement, and instantaneously every wine-glass was transferred to the marble table on which it had been prepared. Then, as she looked at the fragments of crystal, she turned to the company, saying, "'Let no friend hereafter who loves me tempt me to peril my soul for wine. Not firmer are the everlasting hills than my resolve, God helping me, never to touch or taste the poison cup.' and he to whom I have given my hand, who watched over my brother's dying form in that last solemn hour, and buried the dear wanderer there by the river in that land of gold, will, I trust, sustain me in that resolve. His glistening eyes, his sad sweet smile, were her answer. The judge left the room. When, an hour after, he returned, and with a more subdued manner took part in the entertainment of the bridal guests, no one could fail to read that he had determined to banish the enemy forever from his princely home. Touching Incidents and Remarkable Answers to Prayer End of Section 13 Recording by Christine Lehman Chapter 14 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. A Mother's Sorrow and a Short Poem. A company of southern ladies assembled in a parlor were one day talking about their different troubles. Each had something to say about her own trials, but there was one in the company, pale and sad-looking, who for a while remained silent. Suddenly rousing herself, she said, My friends, you do not any of you know what trouble is. Will you please, Mrs. Gray, said the kind voice of one who knew her story, Tell the ladies what you call trouble. I will if you desire it, for in the words of the prophet, I am the one who has seen affliction. My parents were very well off, and my girlhood was surrounded by all the comforts of life. Every wish of my heart was gratified, and I was cheerful and happy. At the age of nineteen, I married one whom I loved more than all the world besides. Our home was retired, but the sun never shone upon a lovelier spot or a happier household. Years rolled on peacefully. Five lovely children sat around our table, and a little curly head still nested in my bosom. One night about sundown, one of those fierce black storms came up, which are so common to our southern climate. For many hours the rain poured down incessantly. Morning dawned, but still the elements raged. The country around us was overflowed. The little stream near our dwelling became a foaming torrent. Before we were aware of it, our house was surrounded by water. I managed with my babe to reach a little elevated spot where the thick foliage of a few widespread trees afforded some protection while my husband and sons strove to save what they could of our property at last a fearful surge swept away my husband and he never rose again ladies no one ever loved a husband more but that was the trouble presently my sons saw their danger and the struggle for life became the only consideration they were as brave, loving boys as ever blessed a mother's heart, and I watched their efforts to escape with such an agony as only mothers can feel. They were so far off that I could not speak to them, but I could see them closing nearer and nearer to each other as their little island grew smaller and smaller. The swollen river raged fearfully around the huge trees, Dead branches, upturned trunks, wrecks of houses, 
drowning cattle and masses of rubbish all went floating past us. My boys waved their hands to me and then pointed upward. I knew it was their farewell signal, and you mothers can imagine my anguish. I saw them perish, all perish, yet that was not trouble. I hugged my baby close to my heart, and when the water rose at my feet, I climbed into the low branches of the tree, and so kept retiring before it, till the hand of God stayed the waters that they should rise no farther. I was saved. All my worldly possessions were swept away. All my earthly hopes were belighted. Yet that was not trouble. My baby was all I had left on earth. I labored day and night to support him and myself, and sought to train him in the right way. But as he grew older, evil companions won him away from me. He ceased to care for his mother's counsels. He sneered at her entreaties and agonizing prayers. He became fond of drink. He left my humble roof, that he might be unrestrained in his evil ways. And at last one night, when heated by wine, he took the life of a fellow creature. He ended his days upon the gallows. God had filled my cup of sorrow before. Now it ran over. That was trouble, my friends, such as I hope the Lord of mercy will spare you from ever knowing. Boys and girls, can you bear to think that you might bring such sorrow on your dear father or mother? If you would not, be on your guard against intemperance. Let wine and liquors alone. Never touch them. Selected. Ah, oh, none but a mother can tell you, sir, how a mother's heart will ache with the sorrow that comes of a sinning child, with grief for a lost one's sake, when she knows the feet she trained to walk have gone so far astray, and the lips grown bold with curses that she taught to sing and pray. A child may fear, a wife may weep, but of all sad things, none other seems half so sorrowful to me as being a drunkard's mother. End of A Mother's Sorrow and Short Poem Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 15 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various 15. The Reprimand at the sound of Mr. Troy's bell, Eleanor Graves vanished into his private office. Ten minutes later, she came out with a deep flush on her face and tears in her eyes. He lectured me on the spelling of a couple of words and a mistake in a date, she complained to Jim Forbes. Anybody's liable to misspell a word or two in typing, and I know I took the date down exactly as he gave it to me. Jim looked uncomfortable. I would not mind he said awkwardly. We all have to take it sometimes or other. Besides, he glanced hesitatingly at the pretty indignant face. I suppose the boss thinks we ought not to make mistakes. As if I wanted to, Eleanor retorted stiffly. But she worked more carefully next week, for her pride was touched. Then, with restored confidence, came renewed carelessness and an error crept into one of the reports she was copying. The error was slight, but it brought her a sharp reprimand from Mr. Troy. It was the second time he reminded her that she had made that blunder. At the reproof, the girl's face flushed painfully, and then pale. "'If my work is not satisfactory, you had better find someone who can do it better,' she said. Whirling around in his swivel chair, Mr. Troy looked at her. He had never really noticed his latest stenographer before, but now his keen eyes saw many things that showed that she came from a home where she had been petted and cared for. "'How long have you been at work?' he asked. "'This is my first position,' Eleanor answered. Mr. Troy nodded. "'I understand. Now, Miss Graves, let me tell you something. 
You have many of the qualities of a good businesswoman. You are punctual. You are not afraid of work. You are fairly accurate. I have an idea that you take pride in turning out a good piece of work. But you must learn to stand criticism and profit by it. We must all take it some time, every one of us. A weakling goes under. A strong man or woman learns to value it, to make every bit of it count. That is what I hope you will do. Eleanor braced herself to meet his eyes. If you will let me, I will try again, she said. Youth's Companion, End of Chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Stories Worth Rereading》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Stories Worth Rereading by Various》Sixteen, The Kingfisher A kingfisher sat on a flagpole slim, and watched for a fish till his eye was dim. I wonder, said he, if the fishes know that I, their enemy, love them so. I sit and watch and blink my eye, and watch for fish and passers-by. I must occasionally take to wing, on account of the stones that past me sing. I nearly always work alone, for past experience has shown that I can't gather something to eat and visit my neighbor across the street. So whether I'm fishing, early or late, I usually work without a mate, since I can't visit and watch my game for fishing's my business, and fisher's my name. Maybe by watching from day to day my life and habits in every way, you might be taught a lesson or two that all through life might profit you. Or if you only closely look, this sketch may prove an open book and teach a lesson you should learn. Look closely, and you will discern. Charles E. E. Sanborn, End of Chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. 17. An Example. Stealing away from the ones at home who would be sad when they found out about it. Stealing away from honor, purity, cleanliness, goodness, and manliness. The minister's boy and the boy next door were preparing to smoke their first cigarettes. They had skulked across the back pasture and were nearing the stone wall that separated Mr. Meadow's cornfield from the road, and here, screened by the wall on one side and by corn on the other, they intended to roll the little coffin nails and smoke them unseen. The minister's boy, whose name was Johnny Brighton, and who was an innocent, unsuspicious child, agreed that it would be a fine, manly thing to smoke. So the lads waited and planned, and now their opportunity had come. The boy next door, whose name was Alexander Beecher, saw old Jerry Grimes, the worst character in Roseland, drop a small bag of tobacco and some cigarette papers. The lad, being unobserved, transferred the stuff from the sidewalk to his pocket, then hid it in the woodshed. At last their plan seemed about to be carried out. Albert's mother was nursing a sick friend, and the minister, secure in his study, was preparing a sermon. Johnny's mother was dead, his Aunt Priscilla was his father's housekeeper, and she was usually so busy that she had little time for small boys. Today, as she began her sewing, Johnny slipped quietly from the house and joined his chum. The boys reached the stone wall and sat down with the tobacco between them to enjoy what they considered a manly deed. After considerable talk and a few blunders, each succeeded in rolling a cigarette and was about to pass it to his lips when a strange voice, almost directly above their heads, said it pleasantly, Trying to kill yourselves, boys? With a guilty start, Johnny and Albert turned instantly and beheld the strangest specimen of humanity that either had ever seen. 
an unmistakable tramp with a pale sickly face covered partly with grime and partly with stubby black beard stood leaning with his arms on top of the wall looking down at them although it was summer he wore a greasy winter cap and his coat too spoke of many rough journeys through dirt and bad weather his lips were screwed into something resembling a smile but as he spoke his haunted sunken eyes roved restlessly from one upturned face to the other as the only answer the boys gave him was an astonished frightened stare the man continued i would not do it boys it is an awful thing awful i was trying to get a little sleep over here he continued when i heard your voices and thought i would see what was going on did not anyone ever tell you about cigarettes why each one contains enough poison to kill a cat if it was fixed right i mean he passed a thin shaking hand over his face and went on do you want to fool with such things not a few are wise you see the cigarette habit will kill you sometimes by inches if not right away or else drive you crazy and no sane person wants to kill himself or spoil his health that's what i'm doing though he admitted with a bitter smile and a sad shake of his head but i cannot stop it now i have gone too far and i cannot help myself i am a wreck a blot on the face of the earth both lads had thrown their cigarettes to the ground scrambled to their feet johnny sober-faced and round-eyed was gazing intently up at the man but albert feigning indifference stood digging his toe into the earth. He was listening, however. "'It is this way with me,' the stranger went on, seeing he had an audience. "'I have gone from bad to worse, till I cannot stop, no matter how hard I try. Why, I was once a clean little chap like you, but I got to reading trash, and then I began to smoke, and pretty soon I had drifted so far into evil ways that I had no control over myself. Here, Johnny and Albert exchanged a painful glance. "'The worst thing about cigarettes,' the man continued, "'is that they usually lead to something worse. "'I am a drunkard and a thief because of evil associations. "'Tramps never have any ready money, "'so when I have to have cigarettes, which is all the time, "'I either steal them or steal the money to buy them with. "'Besides,' with another sad shake of the head, "'I am what is known as a drug fiend.' And yes, I guess I'm everything bad. If your folks knew who was talking to you, their blood would run cold. And it is all principally due to cigarettes. He broke forth savagely, emphasizing his words with his fist and speaking more excitedly. Just look at me and behold a splendid example of the cigarette curse. Why, I was naturally bright. I might have been a man to honor. But a bad habit, uncontrolled, soon ruins one. My nerves are gone. I am only a fit companion for jailbirds and criminals. I cannot even look an honest man in the face, yet I am not naturally bad at heart. The best way is never to begin. Then you will never have to suffer. Cigarettes will surely hurt you some day, though you may not be able to see the effects at first. The speaker's manner had changed greatly during the past few moments. At first he had spoken calmly, but he was now more than agitated. His eyes rolled and flashed in their dark caverns, and he spoke vehemently with excited gestures. Johnny and Albert stood close together, regarding him with frightened eyes. "'I wish I could reform,' he exclaimed, "'but I cannot. The poison is in my veins.' A thousand devils seem dragging me down. I wish I could make every boy stop smoking these things. I wish I could warn them of the horrible end. With a sudden shriek, the man threw up his hands, fell backward, and disappeared. After a second's hesitation, both lads ran to the wall, climbed up, and looked over. In an unmistakable fit, the man was writhing on the ground. Johnny and Albert quickly ran across lots and into Reverend Paul Brighton's study. After learning that the boys had found a man in a fit, Johnny's father hailed two passing neighbors, 
and the little party of rescuers followed the lads to the scene of the strange experience. It was a sorry spectacle that greeted them. The poor fellow's paroxysm had passed, and he lay still and apparently lifeless, covered with dust and grime. The minister bent over him, and, ascertaining that he was alive and conscious, lifted him up, then, with the help of the two men, took the outcast to the parsonage. That evening, before the minister had asked his boy three questions, Johnny broke into convulsive sobs and made a clean breast of the matter from the beginning, blaming himself for not having won the child's heart securely long before this, the minister did not censure him severely. He knew that after such an example, the sensitive lad would never go wrong, as far as cigarettes were concerned. And Priscilla took her nephew in her arms, and kissing the lips that were yet sweet and pure, said, If I have neglected you, Johnny, I am sorry and after this I am going to spend considerable time being good to my precious laddie. Johnny slipped an arm around Aunt Priscilla's neck. That is just what I want, he said happily. I hope this will teach you a lesson, Albert, said Mrs. Beecher to her son. When he, with the help and advice of the minister, had made a full confession of his share in the matter, after such an example I should think you would never want to see another cigarette. I do not, said Albert, soberly. If I can help it, I am not going to. I will fight them. Cigarettes certainly did not make a man of that fellow. They unmade him. For several days, during which the minister thought of what could be done for him, the outcast stayed at the parsonage. He was invited to try the gospel cure. If you will put yourself unreservedly in the hands of God and remain steadfast, said Mr. Brighton, there is hope for you. Besides, I know of some medical missionaries who can help doctor the poison out of your system, if you will let them. At last the poor fellow yielded, and after a hard, bitter struggle, during which a higher power helped him, he won the victory. He joined a band of religious people whose work is to help rebuild wrecked lives, and although weak at first, and never robust, he was still able to point the right way to many an erring mortal. He did much good, and Johnny and Albert, at least, never forgot the practical example he gave them of what the cigarette can accomplish for its slaves. Benjamin Keach End of Chapter 17Chapter 18 of Stories What Rereading this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Fighting the Good Fight A number of years ago, at an orphan asylum in a northern state, there lived a boy whom we shall call Will Jones. He was just an ordinary boy. No, he was not so in one respect, which I must point out to his discredit. Will Jones had a temper that distinguished him from the general run of boys. Will's temper might have been inherited from a Spanish pirate, and yet Will was a boy whom everyone loved. But this hair-trigger temper at times terribly spoiled things. It would be tedious to recount his uprisings of anger and the direful consequences that often followed. Mr. Costa, the superintendent of the asylum, had hopefully striven to lead Will to the paths of right, but it was a difficult task. Sometimes it needs but one small breach to begin the overthrow of a giant wall. One small key, if it's the right one, will open the most resistant door. One small phrase may start a gem thought growing in a human mind, which in after years may become a mighty oak of character. So. Will Jones, the incorrigible fighter, was to demonstrate this principle, as we shall see. On a Sabbath evening, as the hundred or more orphans met at Vespers and sang, On what Christian soul jazz, the saw a stranger seated in the speaker's desk in the home chapel. He was a venerable old man, straight and dignified, his hoary head a crown of honor, for he was all that he appeared, a father in Israel. In a brief speech, 
He told the boys that he had once been a Union soldier and had fought in the battles of his country. He told of the courage it required to face death upon the battlefield. He described the charges his company had made and met, the sieges and the marches, the sufferings they endured, and lastly, the joys that victory and the end of conflict brought. Then, when the boys were at the height of interested expectancy, he skillfully drew the lesson he wanted them to learn. He told of a greater warfare, requiring a higher courage, and bringing as a reward a larger and more enduring victory. Boys, he said, the real soldiers are Christian soldiers. The real battle is the battle against sin. The battleground is where that silent struggle is constantly waging within our minds. Then he told of Paul, who said, I have fought a good fight. Did any of you boys ever fight a bad fight? Every head but one turned to a common point at this juncture, and the eyes of only one boy remained upon the speaker. Will Jones had the record for bad fights, and that is why about 99 pairs of eyes had involuntarily sought him out when the speaker asked the question, which he hoped each would ask himself. And the reason Will Jones did not look around accusingly at any of the other boys was because he had taken to heart all that had been said. And because of this, the turning point had come. His conversion had begun. Henceforth, he determined so to leave that he could say with Paul, I have fought a good fight. No sooner does a boy determine to fight the good fight than Satan accepts the challenge and gives him a combat such as will seem like a fiery trial to try him. These struggles develop the moral backbone, and if a boy does not give in, he will find his moral courage increasing with each moral fight. Just let that stay in your mind, underscored in bold-faced italics and printed in indelible ink. And if you have a tendency to be a spiritual jellyback, it will be like a rod of steel to your spine. The fear of Will Jones's knuckles had won a degree of peace for him. He had lived a sort of armed truce, so to speak. Now he was subjected to petty persecutions by mean boys who took advantage of his new stand. He did not put on the look of a matter either, but kept good-natured, even when the old volcano within was rumbling and threatening to bury the tormentors in hot lava and ashes. The old desire to fight the bad fight was turned into the new channel of determination to fight the good fight. Today, Will Jones is still a good fighter, and I hope he always will be, and someday will be crowned with eternal victory. For he who fights the good fight is fighting for eternity. Will you not try so to live each day, subduing every sinful thought, that at night, when you kneel to pray, you can say to the Lord, I have fought a good fight today? End of Fighting the Good Fight Recording by Apinoko Chapter 19 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Chapter 19 Our Help is Near Temptations dark and trials fall on all who labor here, but we have one on whom to call, our Lord is ever near. So let us, when these trials come, lean on his strength alone, till we have reached the promised home where sorrows are unknown. Max Hill End of chapter 19 Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California Chapter 20 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Liz Trollinger, 
Vienna, Virginia. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 20. Tightening the Saddle Girth. A Time of Grave Crisis. Upon the events of the next few minutes would hang the issue of a hard-fought battle. Already at one end of the line the troops seemed to be wavering. Was it indeed defeat? Just where the fight was most fierce, a young officer was seen to leap from his horse. His followers, sore pressed though they were, could not help turning toward him, wondering what had happened. The bullets flew like hail everywhere, and yet, with steady hand, the gallant soldier stood by the side of his horse and drew the girth of his saddle tight. He had felt it slip under him, and he knew that upon just such a little thing as a loose buckle might hinge his own life and, perhaps, the turn of the battle. Having secured the girth, he bounded into the saddle, rallied his men, and swept on to victory. Many a battle has been lost on account of no greater thing than a loose saddle girth. A loose screw will disable the mightiest engine in the world. A bit of sand in the bearing of an axle has brought many a locomotive to a standstill, and thrown out of order every train on the division. Lives have been lost, business houses wrecked, private fortunes laid in the balance just because someone did not tighten his saddle girth. Does it seem a small thing to you that you forgot some seemingly unimportant thing this morning? Stop right where you are and go back and do the thing you know you should have done in the first place. One of the finest teachers in the leading school of one of our cities put stress day after day on that one thing of cultivating the memory so that it will not fail in time of stress. Do the thing when it should be done, she insists. If you forget, go back and do it. You have no right to forget. No one has. Tighten up the loose screw the moment you see it loose. Pull the strap through the buckle as soon as you feel it give. Wipe the axle over which you have charge clean of dust or grit. If your soul is in the balance, stop now, today, this very moment, and see that all is right between you and God. Kind words. End of chapter 20. Recording by Liz Trollinger. Vienna, Virginia. Chapter 21 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. STORIES WORTH REREADING BY VARIOUS IF YOU BUT KNEW O oh, LAD, MY LAD, IF YOU BUT KNEW THE GLOWING DREAMS I DREAMED FOR YOU, THE TRUE STRAIGHT COURSE OF DUTY RUN, THE NOBLE DEEDS, THE VICTORIES WON, AND YOU THE HERO OF THEM ALL, I KNOW THAT YOU WOULD STRIVE TO BE THE LAD THAT IN MY DREAMS I SEE, NO TEMPTER'S VOICE COULD MAKE YOU FALL. Ah, oh, lad, my lad, your frank, free smile has cheered me many a weary mile, and in your face, e'en in my dreams, potent of future manhood beams, manhood that lives above the small, manhood all pure and good and clean, that scorns the base, the vile, the mean, that hears and answers duty's call. And lad, my lad, so strong and true, this is the prayer I pray for you. Lord, take my boy and guide his life through all the pitfalls of the strife. Lead him to follow out thy plan, to do the deeds he ought to do, to all thy precepts ever true. Make him a clean and noble man. Max Hill End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of Stories Worth Rereading。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb K. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Herrings for Nothing. 
I want you to think of a bitter, east, windy day, fast-falling snow, and a short, muddy street in London. Put these thoughts together, and add to them the picture of a tall, stout man in a rough greatcoat, and a large comforter round his neck, buffeting through wind and storm. The darkness is coming rapidly, as a man with a basket on his head turns the corner of the street, and there are two of us on opposite sides. He cries loudly as he goes, Herrings! Three a penny! Red herrings! Good and cheap! Three a penny! So crying, he passes along the street, crosses at its end, and comes to where I am standing at the corner. Here he pauses, evidently wishing to fraternize with somebody, as a relief from the dull time and disappointed hopes of trade. I presume I appear a suitable object, as he comes close to me and begins conversation. Governor, what do you think of these here herrings? Three in his hand, while the remaining stock are deftly balanced in the basket on his head. Don't you think they're good? And he offered me the opportunity of testing them by scent, which I courteously but firmly declined. And don't you think they're cheap as well? I asserted my decided opinion that they were good and cheap. Then, look you, Governor, why can't I sell them? Yet have I walked a mile and a half along this dismal place, offering these good and cheap ones, and nobody don't buy none. I do not wonder at all at that, I answered to his astonishment. Tell us why not, Governor. The people have no work, and are starving. There are plenty of houses round here that have not a single penny in them, was my reply. Ah, then, Governor, he rejoined, I put my foot in it this time. I knew they was wery poor, but I thought three a penny a tent em. But if they haven't the tuppence, they can't spend em, sure enough. So there's nothing for it but to carry em back, and try to sell em elsewhere. I thought by selling cheap, after buying cheap, I could do them good, and earn a trifle for myself. But I'm done this time. How much will you take for the lot? I inquired. First a keen look at me, then down came the basket from his head, then a rapid calculation, then a grinning inquiry. Do you mean profit at all, governor? Yes. Then I'll take four shillin and be glad to get em. I put my hand in my pocket, produced that amount, and handed it to him. Right, Governor, thank ye. Now what'll I do with em? he said, as he quickly transferred the coins to his own pocket. Go round this corner, into the middle of the road, and shout with all your might, herrings for nothing, and give three to every man, woman, or child that comes to you till the basket is empty. On hearing these instructions, he immediately reproduced the money, and examined it. Being satisfied of his genuineness, he again replaced it, and then looked keenly and questioningly at me. Well, I said, is it all right and good? Yes, replied he. Then the herrings are my property, and I can do as I like with them. But if you do not like to do as I tell you, give me back my money. All right, governor, and they are yours, so if you say it, here goes. Accordingly, he proceeded into the middle of the joining street, and went along shouting aloud, herrings for nothing, good red herrings for nothing. Out of sight myself, I stood at the corner to watch his progress, and speedily he neared the house where a tall woman stood at the first floor window, looking out upon him. Here you are, missus, he bawled. Herrings for nothing, a fine chance for you. Come and take em. The woman shook her head unbelievingly, and left the window. What a fool, he said. But they won't all be so. Herrings for nothing. A little child came out and looked at him, and he called to her. You're my dear, take these to into your mother. Tell her how cheap they are. Herrings for nothing. But the child was afraid of him, and them, and ran indoors. So down the street, in the snowy slush and mud, went the cheap fish, the vendor crying loudly as he went, Herrings for nothing! And then adding savagely, Oh, you fools! Thus he reached the very end, and turning to retrace his steps, he continued his double cry as he came, Herrings for nothing! And then in a lower key, Oh, you fools! Well, I said to him calmly, as he reached me at the corner. Well, he replied, if you think so, when you gave me the money for herrings, as you didn't want, I thought you was training for a lunatic asylum. Now I thinks all the people round here are fit company for you. But what'll I do with the herrings, if you don't want em, and they won't have em? We will try again together, I replied. I will come with you, and we will both shout. Into the road we both went, and he shouted, Herrings for nothing, and then I called out also. Will anyone have some herrings for tea? They heard the voice, and they knew it well, and they came out at once, in twos and threes and sixes, men and women and children, all striving eagerly to reach the welcome food. As fast as I could take them from the basket, I handed three to each eager applicant, until all were speedily disposed of. When the basket was empty, 
the hungry crowd who had none were as far greater than those that had been supplied but they were too late there were no more herrings foremost among the disappointed was the tall woman who with a bitter tongue began vehemently, why haven't i got any ain't i as good as they ain't my children as hungry as theirs before i had time to reply the vendor stretched out his arms toward her saying why governor that's the very woman as i offered em to at first and she turned up her nose at em i didn't she rejoined passionately i didn't believe you meant it your just goes without then for your unbelief he replied good night and thank ye governor you smile at this story which is strictly true are you sure you are not ten thousand times worse their unbelief cost them only a hungry stomach but what may your unbelief of god's offer cost you god not man god has sent his messenger to you repeatedly for years to offer pardon for nothing salvation for nothing he has sent to your homes your hearts the most loving and tender offers that even an almighty could frame and what have you replied have you not turned away in scornful unbelief like the woman god says because i have called and ye refused i have stretched out my hand and no man regarded i will also laugh at your calamity i will mock when your fear cometh proverbs chapter one verse twenty four through twenty six but he also says ho oh, every one that thirsteth come ye to the waters and he that hath no money come ye buy and eat yea come buy wine and milk without money and without price isaiah chapter fifty five verse one for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever so believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life john chapter three verse sixteen answer him will you have it c j whitmore end of herrings for nothing recording by deb k Chapter 23 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Come. Ho, oh, every one that thirsteth, come to the living stream, and satisfy your longing soul where silver fountains gleam. Come weary, faint, and hungry, before you now is spread a rich supply for all your needs. Receive the living bread. Why do you linger longer? Come while tis called today. Here's milk and honey without price. Oh, do not turn away. Why feed on husks that perish? Enter the open door. Thy Saviour stands with outstretched hands. Eat, drink, and want no more. May Wakem. End of chapter 23。Chapter 24 of Stories Worth Rereading。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 24 The Power of Song. My Own Experience. Near the summit of a mountain in Pennsylvania is a small hamlet called Honeyville, consisting of two log houses, two shanties, a rickety old barn, and a small shed, surrounded by a few acres of cleared land. In one of these houses lived a family of seven, father, mother, three boys, and two girls. They had recently moved from Michigan. The mother's health was poor, and she longed to be out on the beautiful old mountain where she had spent most of her childhood. Their household goods had arrived in Pennsylvania just in time to be swept away by the great Johnstown flood of 1889. The mother and her two little girls, Nina and Dot, were Christians, and their voices were often lifted in praise to God as they sang from an old hymn-book, one of their most cherished possessions. One morning the mother sent Nina and Dot on an errand to their sister's home 
three and one-half miles distant. The first two miles took them through dense woods, while the rest of the way led past houses and through small clearings. She charged them to start on their return home in time to arrive before dark, as many wild beasts, bears, catamounts, and occasionally a panther, were prowling around. These animals were hungry at this time of year, for they were getting ready to hole up or lie down in some cozy cave or hole for their winter's nap. The girls started off merrily chasing each other along the way, and arrived at their sisters in good time, and had a jolly romp with the baby. After dinner the sister was so busy, and the children were so absorbed in their play, that the time passed unheeded until the clock struck four. Then the girls hurriedly started for home, in the hope that they might arrive there before it grew very dark. The older sister watched until they disappeared up the road, anxiously wishing someone was there to go with them. Nina and Dot made good time until they entered the long stretch of woods, when Nina said, "'Oh, I know where there is such a large patch of winter green berries, right by the road. Let's pick some for Mama." So they climbed over a few stones and logs, and sure enough the berries were plentiful. They picked and talked, sometimes playing hide-and-seek among the bushes. When they started on again, the sun was sinking low in the west, and the trees were casting heavy shadows over the road, which lengthened rapidly. When about half of the distance was covered, Dot began to feel tired and afraid. Nina tried to cheer her, saying, "'Over one more long hill and we shall be home,' but now they could only see the sun shining on the top of the trees on the hill." They had often played, trying to scare each other, by one saying, Oh, I see a bear or a wolf up the road, and pretending to be afraid. So Dot said, Let's scare each other. You try to scare me. Nina said, All right. Then, pointing up the road, she said, Oh, look up the road by that black stump. I see a... She did not finish, for suddenly, from almost the very spot where she had pointed, a large panther stepped out of the bushes, turning his head first one way and then another. Then, as if seeing the girls for the first time, he crouched down and, crawling, sneaking along like a cat after a mouse, he moved toward them. The girls stopped and looked at each other. Then Dot began to cry and said, in a half-smothered whisper, "'Oh, Nina, let's run!' But Nina thought of the long, dark, lonely road behind, and knew that running was useless. Then, thinking of what she had heard her father say about showing fear, she seized her little sister's hand and said, No, let's pass it. God will help us. And she started up the road toward the animal. When the children moved, the panther stopped and straightened himself up. Then he crouched again, moving slowly uneasily toward them. When they had nearly reached him, and Nina, who was nearest, saw his body almost rising for the spring, there flashed through her mind the memory of hearing it said that a wild beast would not attack anyone who was singing. What should she sing? In vain she tried to recall some song, but her mind seemed a blank. In despair she looked up and breathed a little prayer for help, then, catching a glimpse of the last rays of the setting sun, touching the tops of the trees on the hill, she began the beautiful hymn. There is sunlight on the hilltop, there is sunlight on the sea. Her sister joined in, and although their voices were faint and trembling at first, by the time the children were opposite the panther, the words of the song rang out sweet and clear on the evening air. The panther stopped and straightened himself to his height. His tail, which had been lashing and switching, became quiet as he seemed to listen. The girls passed on, hand in hand, never looking behind them. How sweet the words! Oh, the sunlight, beautiful sunlight, oh, the sunlight in the heart, sounded as they echoed and re-echoed through the woods. As the children neared the top of the hill, 
the rumbling of a wagon fell upon their ears so they knew that help was near but still they sang when they gained the top at the same time the wagon rattled up for the first time they turned and looked back just in time to catch a last glimpse of the panther as he disappeared into the woods the mother had looked often and anxiously down the road and each time was disappointed in not seeing the children coming finally she could wait no longer and started to meet them when about halfway there she heard the words oh the sunlight beautiful sunlight oh the sunlight in the heart jesus smile can banish sadness it is sunlight in the heart at first a happy smile of relief passed over her face but it faded as she listened there was such an unearthly sweetness in the song so strong and clear that it seemed like angels music instead of her own little girls the song ceased and the children appeared over the hill she saw their white faces and hurried toward them when they saw her how their little feet flew but it was some time before they could tell her what had happened what a joyful season of worship they had that night and what a meaning that dear old hymn has had to them ever since a few days later a party of organized hunters killed the panther that had given the children such a fright but the memory of that thrilling experience will never fade from the mind of the writer who was one of the actors in it nina case end of chapter 24 recording by christine layman reseda california Chapter 25 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb K. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Authors. Jack's Fidelity by E. Hammond in Early Conversion. There was held in Hartford some years ago a convention of the Colored Baptist Association of New England. I was invited to address one of the sessions, to show what those converted in early life are sometimes enabled to endure by God's grace. I related the following story. What's that, Willie? That's a spelling book, Jack. What's the spelling book for? To learn how to read. How's you do it? We learn some things first. And so Jack learned A, B, C, etc. Mastered the spelling book, and then learned to read a little though the law forbade any colored person to do it. One day, Willie brought home a little black book, and Jack said, What's that, Willie? That is the New Testament that tells about Jesus. And ere long, Jack learned to read the New Testament, and when he read that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, and that he really loved us and died for us, and that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. His heart went out in love to Jesus. He believed in him, his sins were forgiven, his heart was changed, and he became a happy Christian. Though a mere child, he at once began to tell others of Jesus' love. When he became a young man, he was still at work for the Lord. He used to go to the neighboring plantations, read his Bible, and explain it to the people. One day the master said to him, Jack, I am told you go off preaching every Sunday. Yes, Master, I must tell sinners how Jesus died on the cross for them. Jack, if you go off preaching on Sunday, I will tell you what I will do on Monday. What will you do on Monday, Master? I will tie you to that tree, take this whip, and flog all this religion out of you. Jack knew that his master was a determined man, but when he thought of Christ's suffering for us, and heard his Lord saying unto him, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He resolved to continue his work for the Lord the next Sunday. With his New Testament in hand, he went down to the plantation and told them that his master might whip him half to death the next day, but if he did, he would not suffer more than Christ had suffered for us. The next morning his master said, Jack, I hear you were preaching again yesterday. Yes, master. I must go and tell sinners how Jesus was whipped that we might go free. But Jack, I told you if you went off preaching Sunday, I would whip you on Monday and now I will do it. Blow after blow fell upon Jack's back, while oaths fell from the master's lips. 
Then he said, There, Jack, I don't believe you will preach next Sunday. Now go down to the cotton field and go to work. When next Sunday came, Jack could not stand straight, for his back was covered with sores and scars. But with his testament in hand, he stood before the people on the plantation and said, Master whipped me most to death last Monday, and I don't know but he will kill me tomorrow, but if he does, I shall not suffer more than Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. Monday morning the master called him and said, Jack, I hear you have been preaching again. Yes, master, but I must go and tell sinners how Christ was wounded for our transgressions, how he sweat drops of blood for us in the garden, and wore the cruel crown of thorns that we might wear a crown of joy when he comes. But I don't want to hear your preaching. Now bear your back, and take the flogging I told you I should give you if you weren't off preaching. Fast flew the cruel lashes, until Jack's back was covered with wounds and blood. Now, Jack, go down to the cotton field and go to work. I reckon you'll never want to preach again. When the next Sunday came, Jack's back was in a terrible condition. But hobbling along, he found his friends in the neighboring plantation and said, Master Witch, we most to death them last Monday. But if I can only get you to come to Jesus and love him, I am willing to die for your sake tomorrow. If there were scoffers there, do you not think they were led to believe there was a realty in religion? If any were there who are inclined to think that ministers preach only when they get money for it, do you not think they changed their minds when they saw what wages Jack got? Many were in tears, and some gave themselves to that Savior, for whose sake Jack was willing to die the death of a martyr. Next morning the master called Jack and said, Make bare your back again, for I told you just as sure as you went off preaching, I would whip you till you gave it up. The master raised the ugly whip, and as he looked at Jack's back, all lacerated, he could find no new place to strike, and said, Why do you do it, Jack? You know that as surely as you go off preaching Sunday, I will whip you most to death the next day. No one pays you anything for it. All you get is a terrible flogging, which is taking your life from you. You ask me, master, what I said doing it for? I'll tell you, master. I said doing it to take all those stripes and all those scars, master, up to Jesus, by and by, to show him how faithful I have been. "'Cause he loved you and me, Messer, and bled and died on the cross for you and me, Messer." The whip dropped, and that master could not strike another blow. In a subdued tone, he said, "'Go down to the cotton field.' "'Do you think Jack went away cursing his master, saying, "'Oh, Lord, punish him for his cruelty to me?' "'No, no. His prayer was, "'Lord, forgive him, for Jesus Christ's sake.' About three o'clock, a messenger came down to the cotton field, crying, Master's dying, Master's dying. Come quick, Jack, Master's dying. In his private room, Jack found his master on the floor in agony, crying, Oh, Jack, I'm seeking down to hell. Pray for me, pray for me. I have been praying for you all the time, Master. You must pray for yourself. I don't know how to pray, Jack. I know how to swear, but I don't know how to pray. You must pray, Master. And finally, they both prayed and God revealed Christ on the cross to him, and then and there he became a changed man. A few days after, he called Jack to him and said, Jack, here are your freedom papers. They give you your liberty. Go and preach the gospel wherever you will, and may the Lord's blessing go with you. While telling this story at the convention, I noticed a man, perhaps sixty years of age, with quite gray hair, who was deeply moved. When I had finished, he sprang to his feet, and, with a clear but tremulous voice, said, I stand for Jack. Mr. Hammond has been speaking of me. He has been trying to tell my sufferings, but he cannot describe the terrible agony I endured at the hands of my master, who, because I was determined to preach the gospel on the plantations around us, every Monday morning for three weeks called me up and laid the cruel lash upon my back, and with his own hands, until my back was like raw beef. But God helped me to pray for him until he was forgiven and saved through Christ. And, thank God, Jack still lives. I have given you only a few of his burning words, but I can tell you that there were many eyes filled with tears during this touching scene, which will not soon be forgotten by those who witnessed it. End of Jack's Fidelity Recording by Deb Kay. Chapter 26 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. 
Stories worth rereading by various. Chapter twenty six Honor Thy Father and Thy Mother. Here is a touching story told of the famous Dr. Samuel Johnson, which has had an influence on many a boy who has heard it. Samuel's father, Michael Johnson, was a poor bookseller in Litchfield, England. On market days, he used to carry a package of books to the village of Otto Exeter and sell them from a stall in the marketplace. One day the bookseller was sick and asked his son to go and sell the books in his place. Samuel, from a silly pride, refused to obey. Fifty years afterward, Johnson became the celebrated author the compiler of the English dictionary, and one of the most distinguished scholars in England, but he never forgot his active unkindness to his poor, hard-toiling father. So when he visited Otto Exeter, he determined to show his sorrow and repentance. He went into the marketplace at the time of business, uncovered his head, and stood there for an hour in the pouring rain, on the very spot where the bookstall used to stand this he says was an act of contrition for my disobedience to my kind father the spectacle of the great dr johnson standing bareheaded in the storm to atone for the wrong done by him fifty years before is a grand and touching one there is a representation of it in marble on the doctor's monument many a man in afterlife has felt something harder and heavier than a storm of rain beating upon his heart when he remembered his acts of unkindness to a good father or mother now in the grave dr john todd of pittsfield the eminent writer never forgot how when his old father was very sick and sent him away for medicine he a little lad had been unwilling to go and made up a lie saying that the druggist had no such medicine the old man was dying when little johnny came in but he said to johnny my boy your father suffers great pain for want of that medicine johnny started in great distress for the medicine but it was too late on his return the father was almost gone he could only say to the weeping boy love god and always speak the truth for the eye of god is always upon you now kiss me once more and farewell through all his afterlife dr todd often had a heartache over that act of falsehood and disobedience to his dying father it takes more than a shower to wash away the memory of such sins the words honor thy father and thy mother mean three things always do what they bid you always treat them lovingly and take care of them when they are sick and grown old i never yet knew a boy who trampled on the wishes of his parents who turned out well god never blesses a willful boy when washington was sixteen years old he determined to leave home and become a midshipman in the colonial navy after he had sent off his trunk he went to bid his mother good-bye she wept so bitterly because he was going away that he said to his negro servant bring back my trunk i am not going to make my mother suffer so by leaving her he remained at home to please his mother this decision led to his becoming a surveyor and afterward a soldier his whole glorious career in life turned on simple act of trying to make his mother happy happy too will be the child who never has occasion to shed bitter tears for any act of unkindness to his parents let us not forget that god has said honor thy father and thy mother theodore l quayler in pittsburgh christian advocate End of section 26chapter 27 of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by s k edison new jersey stories worth rereading by various chapter 27 the sleigh ride in one of the largest cities of new england 50 years ago a party of lads, all members of the same school, got up a grand sleigh ride. There were about twenty-five or thirty boys engaged in the frolic. 
The sleigh was a large and splendid conveyance, drawn by six grey horses. The afternoon was as beautiful as anybody could desire, and the merry group enjoyed themselves in the highest degree. It was a common custom of the school to which they belonged, and on previous occasions their teacher had accompanied them. Some engagement upon important business, however, occupying him, he was not in this time with them. It is quite likely, had it been otherwise, that the restraining influence of his presence would have prevented the scene which occurred. On the day following the ride, as he entered the schoolroom, he found his pupils grouped about the staff in high merriment as they chatted about the fun and frolic of their excursion. He stopped a while and listened, and in answer to some inquiries which he made about the matter, one of the lads, a fine, frank, manly boy, whose heart was in the right place, though his love of sport sometimes led him astray, volunteered to give a narrative of their trip and its various incidents. As he drew near the end of his story, he exclaimed, Oh, sir, there was one little circumstance which I almost forgot to tell you. Toward the latter part of the afternoon, as we were coming home, we saw, at some distance ahead of us, a queer-looking affair on the road. We could not exactly make out what it was. It seemed to be a sort of a half-and-half -half monstrosity. As we approached it, it proved to be a rusty old sleigh fastened behind a covered wagon, proceeding at a very slow rate, and taking up the whole road. Finding that the owner was disposed not to turn out, we determined upon a volley of snowballs and a good hurrah. These we gave with a relish, and they produced the right effect, and a little more, for the crazy machine turned out into the deep snow by the side of the road, and the skinny old pony started on a full trot. As we passed, someone who had the whip gave the jilt of a horse a good crack, which made him run faster than he ever did before, I'll warrant. And so, with another volley of snowballs pitched into the front of the wagon, and three times three cheers, we rushed by. With that, an old fellow in the wagon, who was buried up under an old hat and beneath a rusty cloak, and who had dropped the reins, bawled out, Why do you frighten my horse? Why don't you turn out then? said the driver. So we gave him three rousing cheers more. His horse was frightened again and ran up against a loaded team, and I believe almost capsized the old man and so we left him. Well, boys, replied the instructor, this is quite an incident, but take your seats, and after our morning service is ended, I'll take my turn to tell you a story, and all about a sleigh ride, too. Having finished the reading of a chapter in the Bible, and all having joined in the Lord's Prayer, he began as follows. Yesterday afternoon, a very venerable and respectable old man, a clergyman by profession, was on his way from Boston to Salem to pass the residue of the winter at the house of his son, that he might be prepared for journeying, as he proposed to do in the spring, he took with him his light wagon, and for the winter his sleigh, which he fastened behind the wagon. He was, as I have told you, very old and infirm. His temples were covered with thinned locks, which frosts of eighty years had whitened. His sight and hearing, too, were somewhat blunted by age, as yours will be, should you live to be as old. He was proceeding very slowly and quietly, for his horse was old and feeble, like his owner. His thoughts reverted to the scenes of his youth, when he had periled his life in fighting for liberties of his country, to the scenes of his manhood, where he had preached the gospel of his divine master to the heathen of the remote wilderness and to the scenes of riper years, when the hard hand of penury had lain heavily upon him. While thus occupied, almost forgetting himself in the multitude of his thoughts, he was suddenly disturbed and even terrified by loud hurrahs from behind, and by a furious pelting and clattering of balls of snow and ice upon the top of his wagon. In his trepidation he dropped his reins, and as his aged and feeble hands were quite benumbed with cold, he found it impossible to gather them up, and his horse began to run away. In the midst of the old man's troubles, there rushed by him, with loud shouts, a large party of boys in a sleigh drawn by six horses. "'Turn out, turn out, old fellow! Give us a road, old boy! What'll you take for your pony, old daddy? Go it, frozen nose! What's the price of oats?' were the various cries that met us here. "'Pray, do not frighten my horse!' exclaimed the infirm driver. "'Turn out, then! Turn out!' was the answer, which was followed by repeated cracks and blows from the long whip of the grand sleigh, 
with showers of snowballs and tremendous hurrahs from the boys. The terror of the old man and his horse was increased, and the latter ran away to the imminent danger of the man's life. He contrived, however, after some exertion, to secure the reins which had been out of his hands during the whole of the affray, and to stop his horse just in season to prevent his being dashed against a loaded team. As he approached Salem, he overtook a young man who was walking toward the same place whom he invited to ride. The young man alluded to the grand sleigh which had just passed, which induced the old gentleman to inquire if he knew who the boys were. He replied that he did, that they all belonged to one school, and were a set of wild fellows. Aha! exclaimed the farmer with a hearty laugh, for his constant good nature had not been disturbed. Do they indeed? Why, their master is very well known to me. I am now going to his house, and I think I shall give him the benefit of the affair. A short distance brought him to his journey's end, the home of his son. His old horse was comfortably housed and fed, and he himself provided for. That son, boys, is your instructor, and that aged and infirm old man, that old fellow, that old boy, who did not turn out for you, but who would gladly have given you the whole road had he heard your approach, that old boy, that old daddy, and frozen nose, is Reverend Daniel Oliver, your master's father, now at my home, where he and I will gladly welcome any and all of you. As the master, with an undisturbed and serene countenance, gave his version of the ride, it was very manifest, from the expression of the boys' faces and the glances they exchanged, that they recognized the history of their doings of the previous day, and it is not easy to describe nor to imagine the effect produced by this new translation of their own narrative. Some buried their heads behind their desks, some cried, some looked askance at one another, and many hastened down to the desk of the teacher with apologies, regrets, and acknowledgments without end. We did not know it was your father, they said. Ah, my lads, replied the teacher, what odds does it make whose father it was? It was probably somebody's father, an inoffensive traveller, an aged and venerable man, entitled to kind treatment from you and everybody else. But never mind, he forgives it all, and so do I. Freely pardoned, they were cautioned that they should be more civil for the future to inoffensive travellers and more respectful to the aged and infirm. Years have passed by. The lads are men, though some have found an early grave. The boy who related the incident to his master is in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. They who survive, should the story meet their eye, will easily recall its scenes and throw their memories back to the schoolhouse in Federal Street, Salem, and to their friend and teacher. Henry K. Oliver The tongue can no man tame. Lord, tame my tongue and make it pure, and teach it only to repeat thy promises, all safe, all sure, to tell thy love so strong and sweet. Lord, tame my tongue and make it kind, the faults of others to conceal, and all their virtues call to mind, teach it to soothe, to bless, to heal. Elizabeth Rosa End of chapter 27 Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Chapter 28 of Stories Worth Reviewing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Reviewing by Various The Tongue Can No Man Tame Lord, tame my tongue and make it pure, and teach it only to repeat thy promises all safe all sure to tell thy love so strong and sweet lord tame my tongue and make it kind the faults of others to conceal and all their virtues call to mind teach it to soothe to bless to heal elizabeth roser end of chapter twenty eight recording by sarah hale Chapter 29 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Welch, Tampa. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 29 Samuel Smiles, the Author of Self Help. When Samuel Smiles was a schoolboy in Scotland, he was fonder of frolic than of learning. He was not a prize winner and so was not one of his teacher's favorites. One day his master, vexed by his dullness, cried out, Smiles, you will never be fit for anything but sweeping the streets of your native borough. From that day, the boy's mates called him by the name of the street sweeper in the little town. But he was not discouraged. If I have done anything worthy of being remembered, he wrote more than sixty years later, when his name was known over the whole world, it has not been through any superiority of gifts, but only through a moderate portion of them, accompanied, it is true, with energy and the habit of industry and application. As in the case of everyone else, I had for the most part to teach myself. Then I enjoyed good health, and health is more excellent than prizes. Exercise, the joy of interest and of activity, the play of the faculties, is the true life of a boy, as of a man. I had also the benefit of living in the country, with its many pleasures and wonders. When he was fourteen, he was apprenticed to a physician. In the intervals of his work, he sought to continue his education by reading. Books were expensive then, but several libraries were open to him. The death of his father near the end of his medical course, and consequent financial reverses, made him hesitate as to the wisdom of finishing his studies. In speaking of this, he made mention for the first time of his indebtedness to his mother. You must go back to Edinburgh, she said, and do as your father desired. God will provide. She had the most perfect faith in Providence, and believed that if she did her duty, she would be supported to the end. She had wonderful pluck and abundant common sense. Her character seemed to develop with the calls made upon her. Difficulties only brought out the essence of her nature. I could not fail to be influenced by so good a mother. But he was not to find his life work as a doctor. For some years he practiced medicine. Then he became editor of a political paper. Later he was a railroad manager. Experience in writing gained in the newspaper office prepared him for literary work, by which he is best known. These being the chief events and influences of his boyhood, the story of his most famous book, Self-Help, is just what might be expected. It is a story full of inspiration. In 1845, at the request of a committee of working men, he made an address to the society which they represented on the education of the working classes. This excited such favorable comment that he determined to enlarge the lecture into a book. Thus, Self-Help was written but it was not to be published for many years. In 1854, the manuscript was submitted anonymously to a London publisher and was politely declined. Undaunted, he laid it aside and began an account of the life of George Stevenson, with whom he had been associated in railway work. This biography was a great success. Thus encouraged, he took from the drawer, where it had lain for four years, the rejected manuscript of self-help rewrote it and offered it to his publishers. It was not his intention even then to use his name as author, so little did he think of himself, but listening to the advice of friends, he permitted his name to appear. Very soon he was famous, for 35,000 copies were sold during the first two years. In less than 40 years, 258,000 copies had been disposed of in England alone. American publishers reprinted the book almost at once, and it soon became a favorite in school libraries in many states. It was translated into Dutch, German, Swedish, French, Portuguese, Czech, Croatian, Russian, Italian, Spanish, Turkish, Danish, Polish, Chinese, Siamese, Arabic, and several dialects of India. But the author did not look on the fame and fortune brought to him by his book as his chief reward. It had been his desire to be helpful to the plodding, discouraged men and boys. As he expressed it himself, It seemed to me that the most important results in daily life are to be obtained not through the exercise of extraordinary powers, 
but through the energetic use of simple means and ordinary qualities with which all have been more or less endowed. As his greatest reward, he looked upon the grateful testimony of men of many countries who had been inspired by the book to greater effort, and so spurred on to success. An emigrant in New England wrote that he thanked God for the volume, which had been the cause of an entire alteration in his life. A working man wrote, Since perusing the book, I have experienced an entire revolution in my habits. Instead of regarding life as a weary course, which has to be gotten over as a task, I now view it in the light of a trust, of which I must make the most. A country schoolboy received a copy as a prize, and his life was transformed by the reading. By perseverance, he secured an education and became a surgeon. After a few years, he lost his life in an attempt to help others. Such testimonies as these made Mr. Smiles happy and are a fitting memorial to him. He died in 1904 at the age of 92. How much more satisfying to look back on a life of such usefulness than to say, as Jules Verne, author of many books, was compelled to say, I amount to nothing in literature. John T. Ferris, Doctorate of Divinity in Self-Help, published by Frederick A. Stokes Company, New York. End of chapter 29「Chapter Thirty of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Life's Battles. Life's Battles Thou Must Fight All Single Handed. No friend, however dear, can bear thy pain. No other soul can ever bear thy burdens. No other hand for thee the prize may gain. Lonely we journey through this vale of sorrow. No heart in full respondeth to our own. Each one alone must meet his own tomorrow. Each one must tread the weary way alone. Ah, weary heart, why art thou sad and lonely? Why this vain longing for an answering sigh? Thy griefs, thy longings, trials, and temptations Are known and felt by him who reigns on high. Arthur V. Fox End of chapter 30「Chapter 31 of Stories Worth Rereading » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Welch, Tampa. Stories worth rereading by Various. Chapter 31 David Livingstone On March 19, 1813, a hero was born in Blantyre, Central Scotland. It was an age of great missionary activity, and the literal fulfillment of the spirit of the Great Commission had led Carey, Judson, Moffat, and scores of others to give their lives to the promulgation of the gospel of the kingdom of God in heathen lands. A dozen missionary societies were then in their youth. Interest in travel and exploration was at its height, and the attention of adventurers centered in the dark continent, the last of the great unknown regions of the world to be explored into the kingdom for such a time and to do a divinely appointed work came david livingstone his home was a humble cottage a rugged constitution came to him as a birthright for his parents were of sturdy peasant stock they served god devoutly they served god devoutly and though poor in this world's goods were honest and industrious being able to teach their children lessons in economy and thrift which proved of lifelong help to them david was a merry brown-eyed lad and a general favorite perseverance seemed bred in his very bone when only nine years old he received from his sunday school teacher a copy of the new testament as a reward for repeating the one hundred nineteenth psalm on two successive evenings with only five errors 
The following year, at the age of 10, he went to work in the cotton factory near his home as a piecer. Out of his first week's wages, he saved enough to purchase a Latin grammar and set himself resolutely to the task of thoroughly mastering its contents, studying for the most part alone after leaving his work at 8 o'clock in the evening. His biographer tells us that he often continued his studies until after midnight, returning to Livingstone work in the factory was not brighter at six than other morning. boys, nor precocious in anything save determination. He was very fond of reading and devised the plan of fastening a book on his spinning jenny in the factory so that he could catch a sentence now and then while tending the machines. In this way, he familiarized himself with many of the classics. His aptitude for scientific pursuits early revealed itself, and he had a perfect passion for exploration. When only a boy, he usually chose to spend his holidays scouring the country for botanical, geological, and zoological specimens. In his twentieth year, the embryo missionary and explorer was led to accept Jesus Out of Christ the fullness as his of personal peace, savior. Joy and satisfaction which filled his heart, he wrote. It is my desire to show my attachment to the cause of him who died for me by devoting my life to his service. The reading of an appeal by Mr. Gutzlaff to the churches of Britain and America in behalf of China brought to the young student's attention the need of qualified missionaries and led him to dedicate his own life as well as all that he possessed to foreign service. As a surgeon carefully selects the instruments with which he works, so it is ever with the divine physician and though livingstone was anxious to enter his chosen field providence led him to tarry for a little while in preparation during this time of waiting he put into practice the motto which in later life he gave to the pupils in a sunday school trust god and work hard having set his face toward china he had no notion of turning back in the face of difficulties and finally, after four years of untiring effort, he earned in 1840 a medical diploma, thus equipping himself with a training indispensable for one whose life was to be hidden for years in the fevered jungles of Africa. He wrote, With unfeigned delight, I became a member of a profession which with unwearied energy pursues from age to age its endeavors to lessen human woe. Livingstone also secured the necessary theological training and was duly accepted by the London Missionary Society as a candidate for China. But the breaking out of the Opium War effectually closed the doors of that field. Just at this time came his providential acquaintance with Robert Moffat. The missionary was home on a furlough, and at a meeting which the young physician attended, stated that sometimes he had seen in the morning sunlight the smoke of a thousand villages in the dark continent where no missionary had ever been to tell the sweet old story of redeeming love. This message came to Livingstone as a Macedonian cry, and he willingly answered, Here am I, send me. The purpose once formed, he never swerved from it. The change of fields caused some alteration in his plans, and he remained for a long time in England, further preparing for his mission with scrupulous care. On November 17, 1840, Dr. Livingstone spent the last evening with his loved ones in the humble Blantyre home, going at once to London, where he was ordained as a missionary. He sailed for the Cape of Good Hope on the 8th of December. Arrived in Africa, the new recruit immediately turned his steps toward the interior, where there were real things to do. After a brief stop at Kuraman, the home of the Moffats, he spent six months alone among the Bakwains, acquainting himself in with that their time, language, laws, and customs. In that time, he gained not only customs, these points, but the goodwill and affection of the natives as well. His door of opportunity had opened, and from the Bakwains he pressed farther north until, within the first three years of his service in the Dark Continent, he was giving the gospel to heathen far beyond Both any Livingstone point before and his visited wife by learned white early men. the secret of power that comes from living with the heathen rather than merely living among them. He possessed a certain indefinable power of discipline over the native mind, which made for orderly, thorough, and effective service. 
the natives knew him for their friend as well as their teacher. Under his loving care, heathen chiefs became Christian leaders of their own people. Christian customs replaced heathen practices, and peace settled down where trouble had been rife. Leaving his well-established work among the Namanguato, the Baca, the Makalaka, and the Bechuana tribes to be carried on by trained native helpers, this fearless man pressed on, always toward the dark interior. When his course was criticized, he wrote, I will go anywhere, provided it be forward, and forward he went. Livingstone's mind was one of that broad character which at the outset grasps the whole of a problem, and to those who have followed his later course, it is clear why he saw no duty in settling down on one fixed spot to teach and preach in a slavery-harrowed land. He knew that first there must be a mighty clearing out of this evil. As for his own intent, he said, Cannot the love of Christ carry the missionary where the and slave so, trade right carries through the to traitor? the west coast he marched, carrying and diffusing everywhere a knowledge of the redeeming Christ, and illustrating by his own kindly life and words and deeds the loving mercies of the Lord? The physician and the scientist, the minister and the reformer, were all combined in this one purposeful man. The people believed him to be a wizard and even credited him with power to raise the dead. Heathen, sick and curious, crowded about his wagon, but not an article was stolen. One day the chief of a savage tribe said, I wish you would change my heart. Give me medicine to change it, for it is proud, proud and angry, angry always. Livingstone left on record in his journals invaluable data of rivers, lakes, and streams, treacherous bogs and boiling fountains, plants, animals, seasons, products, and tribes, together with the most accurate maps. Near the mighty but then unknown Zambezi, Livingstone found the Makaloko people, a tribe from which came his most devoted native helpers. When he left them to journey toward the west coast, as many men as he needed willingly agreed to accompany him. After a terrible journey of seven months, involving imminent starvation and endless exposure, the party at last reached their destination, St. Paul de la Wanda, Full as a this Portuguese journey was settlement. of incident, one of the most impressive things about it all was the horrors of the slave trade, which came home to the missionary with heart-rending directness. Every day he saw families torn asunder, dead bodies along the way, gangs chained and yoked, skeletons grinning against the trees by the roadside. As he rode along on the beautiful River Shire, the paddles of his boat were clogged in the morning with the bodies of women and children who had died during the night and were thus disposed of by their masters. And when he was sure that the wretched system was entrenched from the center of the continent to the coast, is it any wonder that he determined to make the exposure of this gigantic iniquity his principal work until the open sore of the world should be healed? The slave raiders were Livingstone's bitter enemies and did everything possible to hinder his work. Just the story. Into a quiet little village on the shores of Lake Nyasa came some strangers one beautiful afternoon. The king sent to inquire as to their business. We are Livingstone's children, they said. Our master has found a road to the coast and sent us back for his supplies. The day is late. We wish to spend the night in your village. The white master is our friend, said the king, and he commanded his men to prepare the best huts for Livingstone's children. Some of the servants left at once to carry out the king's command, and soon the visitors were comfortably settled. The people flocked to their huts, bringing many gifts, and lingered about until the day was ended. Late that night, when all the village was asleep, suddenly there was a piercing scream, then another, and another. The people rushed from their huts, for many of their homes were on fire. The white men, who called themselves Livingstone's children, were seizing women and children and binding them with strong cords of leather. Around the necks of the men they fastened great Y-shaped sticks, riveting the forked ends together with iron. "'We have been deceived!' cried the natives. 
the visitors were not livingstone's children they were slave raiders oh why did we ever trust them if the white master were here he would save us he never takes slaves in the gray light of the morning leaving their village a heap of smoldering ruins the sad procession was marched off heavily guarded for two days their merciless captors drove them under the hot tropical sun without food or water late the second afternoon they suddenly came upon a camp at a sharp bend of the road and there in plain view stood dr livingstone every slave driver took to his heels and disappeared in the thickets they had all respect for that one white man they knew he was in africa to stop the slave trade the whole procession of slaves fell on their knees in thanksgiving rejoicing in this unexpected deliverance do you wonder that the poor heathen loved the missionary he never once betrayed their confidence almost immediately after reaching the portuguese settlement on the coast he was prostrated with a very severe illness an english ship in the harbor was about to sail in his great weakness livingstone longed for the bracing air of the scottish highlands and the sight of his beloved wife and children in the homeland but he prepared his reports charts and observations put them aboard the ship and after watching it set sail made ready to march back into the interior why did he not go home there was just one reason he had promised his native helpers that if they would journey with him to the coast he would see them back safely to their homes and his word to the black men of africa was just as sacred as it would have been if pledged to the queen he kept it as faithfully as an oath made to almighty god it involved a journey of nearly two years in length a line of march two thousand miles long through jungles swamps and desert through scenes of surpassing beauty but the result was worth the cost for two years later when he came out on the east coast at quillamaine he was the best known best loved and most perfectly trusted man in africa many times through all these wanderings he was in danger once during his early explorations he had an adventure with a lion which nearly cost his life he says of it in a letter the beast rushed from the bushes and bit me on the arm breaking the bone i hope i shall never forget god's mercy it will be well before this reaches you do not mention it to anyone i do not like to be talked about he never voluntarily referred to it but for thirty years thereafter, all adventures and exposures and hardships were undertaken with an arm so maimed that it was painful to raise a fowling piece to his shoulder. After his death, the body was identified by that scar and the compound fracture made by the lion's teeth. Livingstone's visits to the homeland were brief, and each day was filled to the brim with interviews, lectures, and literary work. He returned to Africa for the third and last time in 1866, ascended the Ravuma, and for three years was lost to the outside world. During this time, he visited Lakes Moreau and Tanganyika, preaching the gospel to thousands and tens of thousands waiting in heathen darkness. In 1871, his strength utterly gave way, and on October 23rd, reduced to a living skeleton, he reached Ujiji after a perilous journey of 600 miles taken expressly to secure supplies. He was bitterly disappointed to find that the rascal to whom the delivery of the goods had been charged had disposed of the whole lot. For 80 days he was obliged to keep his bed, and during this time he read his Bible through four times. On the flyleaf he wrote, no letters for three years i have a sore longing to finish Relief, and go home letters and if supplies God wills. had all been sent him but he never received them many of the letters which he wrote never even reached the coast as the portuguese destroyed them whenever possible during all this time england and in fact the world waited with intense anxiety for news of the hero a report came that he was dead then a relief expedition brought back the word that Livingstone was alive and in Africa, but that they had not been able to find him. Just at this crucial moment, Henry M. Stanley was sent out by James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald with the order, 
Take what money you want, but find Livingstone. You can act according to your own plans in your search, but whatever you do, find Livingstone, dead or alive. Stanley went. For 11 months, he endured incredible hardships, but his expedition pressed forward into the interior. One day, a caravan passed and reported that a white man had just reached Ujiji. Was he young or old? questioned Stanley anxiously. He is old. He has white hair on his face. He is sick, replied the natives. As the searching party neared the village, flags were unfurled and a salute fired from the guns. They were answered by shouts from hundreds of Africans. Stanley was greeted by Susi, Livingstone's servant, and soon stood face to face with the great missionary explorer. He had found Livingstone. The brief visit which they enjoyed meant much to both men. In vain did Stanley plead with the doctor to go home with him. The old explorer's heart was resolute, and he set his face as a flint. He did not feel that his work was done. At length, the newspaper man and his company started eastward. Livingstone went some distance with them, and then a broken old man, clad in faded gray clothes, with bowed head and slow step, returned to his chosen solitude. Five months later, the relief party reached Zanzibar, and news of Livingstone's safety and whereabouts was flashed to all parts of the world. As the explorer again took up his weary way, physically weak and in constant pain, the buoyant spirit rose above hardship, and Scotch pluck smiled at impossibilities. He wrote in his diary, Nothing earthly will make me give up my work in despair. I encourage myself in the Lord my God and go forward. Weary months followed, filled with travel, toil, and physical suffering. The last of April, 1873, a year after Stanley left him, he reached the village of Ilala at the southern end of Lake Banguiolo. He was so ill that his attendants were obliged to carry him as they journeyed, but the heroic spirit was still struggling to finish a work which would make possible the evangelization of the dark continent. While the spirit was willing, the flesh was weak indeed, and on the morning of the 1st of May, his faithful servants found him kneeling at the bedside, with his head buried in his hands upon the pillow. He had passed away without a single attendant, on the farthest of all his journeys, but he had died in the act of prayer, prayer offered in that reverential attitude about which he was always so particular, commending his own spirit with all his dear ones, as was his wont, into the hands of his Savior, and commending Africa, his own dear Africa, with all her woes and sins and wrongs, to the avenger of the oppressed and the redeemer of the lost. Laura Clement End of chapter 31「He was by no means handsome. He had a turned-up nose and a little squint in one eye, and Jenny Mills said you could not stick a pin anywhere on his face where there was not a freckle, and his hair, she said, was carrot color, which pleased the children so much that they called him Carroty for short. Oh, nobody ever thought of calling Tommy Carter handsome. For that matter, no one thought him a hero. Yet even then he had some of the qualities which helped to make heroes. For instance, he was brave enough to go to school day after day with patched knees and elbows, the patches of quite a different color from the trousers and shirtwaist, and to say not a word at home of the boys who shouted, Hello, Patchy, or of Jenny Mills asking whether she should not bring him a piece of her yellow cashmere for patches to match his hair and freckles. He had shed a few tears in private that day. The boys yelled and shouted so over what Jenny said that he could not help it, 
the scholars were used to laughing at jenny mills's sayings and she was spoiling her character by always trying to think of something to say that would make people laugh but on his way home tommy stopped at the fountain on the square and gave his eyes a good wash so his mother would not suspect tears tommy knew that he had his mother to think about she had been left in his care tommy was only seven when his father tom carter was crushed between two engines nobody seemed to know just how it happened only the man who had charge of the other engine had been drinking anyway it happened they took tom carter home on a stretcher just before he died he said good-bye tommy father trusts you to take care of mother and sissy after that would tommy say anything to his mother about patches or teasing or let her see tears there was another thing that tommy had courage to do that was to take constant care of sissy all day saturday and all day sunday and just as much time as he could spare on school days tommy gave to sissy it was he who fed her and washed her face a great many times a day and coaxed her to sleep and took her to ride in her little cart or walked very slowly when she chose to toddle along by his side and changed her dress when she tumbled into the coal box or sat down in a mud puddle and he had been known to wash out a dress and a nightgown for sissy when his mother was ill there was really nothing too hard or too girlish for tommy to do for his little sister once somebody who saw him trying to mend a hole in the baby's petticoat called him sissy and the name clung for a time the schoolyard rang with shouts of sissy carter but not one word of this did mother carter hear did you have a good time today his mother would ask and tommy with sissy in his arms crowing with delight that she had got him again would answer cheerfully a first-rate time i got a big a for spelling and teacher said i had improved in my writing and not a word would be hinted about the nicknames or the jeers but better school days came to tommy before the last thing happened by which the people found out that he was a hero a new little girl came into the fourth grade she was a pretty girl and wore pretty dresses and had a fluff of brown curls about her face she was smart too the boys said they said she could say lots funnier things than jenny mills then her name pleased them very much it was angela whether or not she was smarter than jenny mills it is true that angela said some things that jenny had never thought of tommy carter is real good-natured she said one day and he is not one bit selfish don't you know how he gave the best seat to little eddie cooper this morning and stood off in a corner where he could not see much i like tommy the scholars stared somehow it had never occurred to them to like tommy but when once it had been mentioned they seemed to wonder that they had not thought of it tommy was good-natured and very obliging not a day passed in which he did not in some small way prove this as for his patches angela did not seem to notice them at all and if she did not why should anybody so in a few days a queer thing happened the boys stopped teasing tommy and began in little ways to be kind to him some of the older ones when they happened to have an extra apple or pear fell into the habit of saying here want this and would toss it to tommy and when they discovered that he saved a piece of everything for sissy they did not laugh at all for angela said how nice for him to do that soon they began to save up bright little things themselves for sissy bits of paper half-worn toys once a new red ball none of them realized it but this was really the influence of the new little girl with brown curls in that way it came to pass that tommy lost many of his chances for being a hero but a new chance was coming tommy lived in a large tenement house on one of the back streets of san francisco seven other families lived in the same house one tuesday evening mrs carter told the woman who lived across the hall that she had done the hardest day's work of her life and was so dead tired that she felt as if she would like to go to bed and never get up 
At five o'clock the next morning, she, Sissy, close beside her, and Tommy, in a little cot at the farther end of the room, were all sound asleep. Suddenly the walls of the big tenement house began to sway from side to side in the strangest manner, and there was, at the same second, a terrible crashing noise. The kitchen table in the corner tipped over, and the dishes in the corner cupboard slid to the floor and went to pieces. The big wardrobe, which was a bureau and a clothes closet all in one, moved out into the middle of the room, and the stove fell down. All these things happened so fast, and the earth was full of such strange, wild noises, that for a second nobody knew what was the matter. Tommy Carter got to his mother's side before the noise was over, but he found that she could not stir. Her bed was covered with bricks, and there was a great hole in the wall. Tommy did not know it then, but he understood afterward that the chimney had fallen on his mother's bed. "'Tommy!' she gasped. "'It is an earthquake. Take Sissy and run!' "'But, mother!' he cried. "'Oh, mother, I cannot leave you!' "'Never mind me, Tommy. Take her quick. She is not hurt. Maybe there will be another. Tommy, you take care of Sissy. Run!' And Tommy ran, with just the little shirt on in which he had been sleeping, and with an old quilt that his mother's hands had wrapped around the sleeping baby. What an awful street was that into which he ran! What an awful road he had to go to get to it! Part of the side wall of the house was gone, and the stairs swayed from side to side as he stepped on them. But he reached the street, and it looked as if everything on it had tumbled down, and all the people in the world were running about, wringing their hands and crying. Then suddenly an awful cry arose. Fire! 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 Mother! Oh, mother! Tommy screamed, and he hurried to scramble back over the fallen walls by which he had come. He must take care of his mother. But a strong hand held him. Keep away, youngster. Don't you see that the wall is falling? Run! But where should he run? The whole city seemed to be burning, and everywhere was horror and terror. In trying to cross a street, Tommy was knocked down, and was, for a second, under the feet of a plunging horse. But he got out and reached the sidewalk, with Sissy still safe, and he did not know that his arm was broken. "'Wasn't it lucky that Sissy was on the other arm?' he said, speaking to no one. That awful day! Nobody who lived through it will ever forget it. Tommy Carter spent it struggling, pushing, panting, tugging, trying to get somewhere with Sissy. And Sissy cried for food and then for water, and there was none of either to give her. And then she lay back still, and he thought she was dying. The crowd swarmed and surged about him, crying, groaning, praying, cursing, yelling orders. And above all that fearful din arose the terrifying roar of the fire. The city was burning up. Oh, where was mother? And where was a safe place for Sissy? And why did his arm hurt so? What was the matter with him? His head was whirling round and round. Was he going to die and leave Sissy? He never would. Suddenly he roused with fresh energy. Somebody was trying to take Sissy. Don't you touch her, he cried fiercely. Don't you dare. Let her alone, I say and he fought like a wild animal. "'But my poor boy,' said the doctor, who was bending over him. But Tommy was insane with pain and fear. "'Let her be, I say,' he screamed. "'Mother said I was not to let anybody take her, and I won't. I will kill you if you touch her. I'll—I'll—' I'll... And then Tommy fell back in a dead faint. When he wakened, he was in a large, quiet room, in a clean bed. "'Where is Sissy?' he called out in terror. A woman in white bent over him and spoke low. "'Hush, dear, do not try to move. Sissy is safe and well and happy.' "'Where is she, ma'am?' said Tommy. "'I must have her right here by me. I can take care of her as well as not. I always do, and—I promised mother, you see, and she's awfully afraid of strangers.' "'She is not afraid of us. She is very happy here.' I have sent for her to come and see you. Ah, here she comes this minute. And there was Sissy, smiling in the arms of a woman in a white gown and cap, and herself in the prettiest of white dresses. 
She laughed for joy at sight of Tommy, but was quite willing to stay in the young woman's arms. "'Little darling,' said the nurse, "'she was not hurt a bit, and she is so sweet.' "'And where is mother, ma'am?' asked Tommy. "'Was she hurt so that she cannot take care of Sissy? "'I am afraid that she was. "'When can I go to her? "'I have to take care of mother. "'Does she know that I kept Sissy safe?' The two nurses looked at each other, and seemed not to know just how to answer so many questions, but the doctor, who had come up a moment before, stepped forward and spoke cheerily. Tommy smiled gratefully. "'And when can I go and take care of her, sir? Was mother hurt? I remember all about it now. Is mother safe?' "'You have been very ill, and did not know what was happening. You did not even know Sissy when we brought her to see you.' "'Oh!' said Tommy, with a faint smile. "'How queer! Did not know Sissy. It is so nice that she takes to the pretty lady, and that mother is safe. I am very sleepy, sir. Would it be right to go to sleep if the pretty lady can take care of Sissy for a little while?' "'Quite right, my boy. We will take the best possible care of Sissy.' The doctor's voice was husky, and he turned away soon, with his own eyes dim as Tommy's heavy eyes had closed. "'Oh, doctor,' said both nurses. "'He is going, the brave little hero,' he said. "'And we, you and I, will take care of Sissy for him.' "'Yes, indeed,' said the pretty nurse with a sob. She kissed Sissy. Mrs. G. R. Alden, in Junior Endeavor World, by permission of Lothrop, Lee, and Shepherd Co. End of chapter 32 Recording by Christine Lehman Chapter 33 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bethesda Lilly Stories Worth Rereading by Various Chapter 33 Little Corners Georgia Willis, who helped in the kitchen, was rubbing the knives. Somebody had been careless and let one get rusty. But Georgia rubbed with all her might, rubbed and sang softly a little song. In the world is darkness, so we must shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. Why do you rub at the knives forever? asked Mary. Mary was the cook. Because they are in my corner, Georgia said brightly. You in your small corner, you know, and I in mine. I will do the best I can. That is all I can do. I would not waste my strength, said Mary. I know that no one will notice. Jesus will, said Georgia, and then she sang again. You in your small corner and I in mine. Cooking the dinner is in my corner, I suppose, said Mary to herself. If that child must do what she can, I suppose I must. If Jesus knows about knives, it is likely that he does about dinners. And she took particular pains. Mary, the dinner was very nicely cooked today, Miss Emma said. That is all due to Georgia, said Mary, with a pleased face. Then she told about the knives. Miss Emma was ironing ruffles. She was tired and warm. Helen will not care whether they are fluted or not, she said. I will hurry them over. But after she heard about the knives, she did her best. How beautifully my dress is done, Helen said. Emma, laughing, answered, That is owing to Georgia. Then she told about the knives. No, said Helen to her friend, who urged, I really cannot go this evening. I am going to prayer meeting. My corner is there. Your corner? What do you mean? Then Helen told about the knives. Well, the friend said, if you will not go with me, perhaps I will with you. And they went to the prayer meeting. You helped us ever so much with the singing this evening, their pastor said to them as they were going home. I was afraid you would not be here. It was owing to our Georgia, said Helen. She seemed to think she must do what she could, if it were only to clean the knives. Then she told him the story. I believe I will go in here again, said the minister stopping before a poor little house. I said yesterday there was no use, but I must do what I can. 
In the house a sick man was lying. Again and again the minister had called, but the invalid would not listen to him. Tonight the minister said, I have come to tell you a little story. Then he told him about Georgia Willis, about her knives, and her little corner, and her doing what she could. The sick man wiped the tears from his eyes and said, I will find my corner too. I will try to shine for Jesus. And the sick man was Georgia's father. Jesus, looking down at her that day, said, She hath done what she could, and gave the blessing. I believe I will not go for a walk, said Helen, hesitatingly. I will finish that dress of mother's. I suppose I can, if I think so. My child, are you here sewing? her mother said. I thought you had gone for a walk. No, mother, this dress seemed to be in my corner, so I thought I would finish it. In your corner? her mother repeated in surprise, and then Helen told about the knives. The doorbell rang, and the mother went thoughtfully to receive her pastor. I suppose I could give more, she said to herself, as she slowly took out ten dollars that she had laid aside for missions. If that poor child in the kitchen is trying to do what she can, I wonder if I am. I will make it twenty-five dollars. And I seemed to hear Georgia's guardian angel say to another angel, Georgia Willis gave twenty-five dollars to our dear people in India today. Twenty-five dollars, said the other angel. Why, I thought she was poor. Oh, well, she thinks she is, but her father in heaven is not, you know. She did what she could, and he did the rest. But Georgia knew nothing about all this, and the next morning she brightened her knives and sang cheerfully, In this world is darkness, so we must shine. You in your small corner, and I in mine. The Pansy End of chapter 33 Recording by Bethesda Lilly Chapter 34 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various in the Home When John Howard Payne wrote the immortal words of Home Sweet Home, adapting them to the beautiful Sicilian melody, now so familiar to us all, he gave to the world a precious legacy, which has brought sunshine into millions of hearts. Be it ever so humble, there is no place like home, and there is no other place in all the world where the little courtesies of life should be so tenderly given, where loving ministrations should be so cheerfully bestowed, in short, where good manners in all the varied details of life should be so diligently practiced. Home, sweet home, the place where childhood days are spent, where habits are formed which are to continue through the future, and where the foundation is laid upon, which the superstructure of after years is to be built. What a hollow lingers about the blessed spot, and how the soul of the exile cherishes the pictures which adorn the halls of memory, pictures which the rude hand of time can never efface. This earth has many lingering traces of Eden yet remaining, which rapture the eye of the beholder, but there is no sight in all the world so beautiful as that of a well-ordered, harmonious Christian home, a home where love reigns, where each seems the other better than himself, where the parents are careful to practice what they preach, where the daily lessons enlisted into the minds of the children from babyhood to maturity always and forever include the indispensable drills in good manners. There is no school so important as the home school, no teacher so responsible as the parent, no pupil under such weighty obligations to deport himself credibility as is the son or daughter of the household. And may it not be asserted truthfully that there is no more thrilling commencement scene than that which sees the noble young man or young woman, having passed successfully through all the grades of the parental school, bid a regretful adieu to the dear childhood home, to enter upon a career of usefulness elsewhere, to spend and be sent in saving humanity, 
but how few such commencement scenes do we witness how few pupils ever pass the test satisfactorily in the important branch of ethics when parents practice good manners toward their children when they find as much pleasure in the unaffected please and thank you of the home kindergarten as they do in the same marks of politeness elsewhere when the deportment in the grades of the home school is considered of greater importance than that in the schools away from home our preparatory schools and colleges will have less trouble in securing good behavior on the part of those in attendance and the problem of how to maintain proper decorum will have lost its perplexity every time a child says please it is a reminder that he is not independent that he is in need of assistance every time he says thank you he has yet another reminder that he is not independent that he is under obligations to another for assistance received pure and underfiled religion and good manners cannot be separated the child who is taught to say please because he is in need of human aid may be made easily to comprehend the beautiful significance of prayer because he is in need of divine aid the child who is taught to say thank you for favors received from earthly friends may be led easily to see the appropriateness of offering praise and thanksgiving for divine blessings children who are made to realize that to appear well always in the society of home is infinitely more important than try to appear well occasionally when away from home cause little parental anxiety as to how they will deport themselves when absent and children who practice good behavior in the home when no company is present do not need to be called aside for a hasty lesson in this line when someone is about to call such lessons are very unsatisfactory and are seldom remembered being much like music lessons taken without the intervening practice good manners cannot be put on and off with the best clothing or donned momentarily to suit the occasion but unlike our ordinary appeal the more they are worn the more beautiful they appear good manners in the home means good manners everywhere and each individual simply stands before the world an epitome of all his former training if the child has learned to be honest and truthful in all the details of the home life he may face the world in later years a worthy example of uprightness and all with whom he comes in contact if he has learned to be habitually kind and courteous in the home he is the same wherever he may be if he always appears neat and tidy in the home these pleasing characteristics will remain with him throughout life if the loved members of his own family circle never discover that he has a temper of his own there is little danger that anyone else will ever find it out if his habits and practices at home are such as to ennoble and beautify his own life his influence will rest as a benign benediction upon the beloved of his household and the great world outside will be better because of his having lived in it oh that every boy and girl might rightly appreciate the vast difference between manners of the soul and manners of the head manners of the heart and the manners of the outward appearance one is christian religion the other is called formality one means the salvation of souls the other is but vanity and outward show but we are instructed that true refinement and gentleness of manners can never be found in a home where selfishness reigns we should be self-forgetful ever looking out for opportunities even in little things to show gratitude for the favors we have received from others and watching for opportunities to cheer others and to enlighten and relieve their sorrows and burdens by the acts of tender kindness and little deeds of love these thoughtful courtesies that begin in our families extend outside the family circle and help to make up the sum of life's happiness and the neglect of these little things makes up the sum of life's bitterness and sorrow boys and girls who rightly appreciate good manners will be polite and courteous in the home and will share cheerfully in all the little duties of the household some one has said that idleness is the chief author of all mischief and surely any individual who chooses to be idle rather than to be usefully employed is exceedingly ill-bred children should be taught the nobility of labor and to respect those who faithfully perform the humblest duties of life just as much as those who accomplish the more difficult tasks there is pointed truth in the assertion that there is gospel in a loaf of good bread 
but it is a sad comment on the home training of the present day that so few of our young people recognize this fact it is to be deplored that children nowadays receive so little training in the ins and outs of good housekeeping no young lady should consider herself accomplished until she has acquired the art of making good bread and of knowing how to prepare healthful and palatable meals even if it never should be her privilege to become the queen of a kitchen there are always ample opportunities to impart such valuable knowledge to others the world in its dreadful need of practical boys and girls practical young men and young women who are not afraid to perform faithfully even the smallest duties that lie in the pathway of life and who are willing to tax their thinking powers in order that their work may be done in the best possible manner how much more in keeping with christian manners that the son of the household should share in the burden of keeping the domestic machinery running smoothly rather than misemploy his time and grow up unacquainted with the practical duties of life how much more appropriate that the daughter should assist the mother in performing the various household duties rather than occupy a hammock or an easy chair and spend her time in reading cheap books many a weary mother would appreciate such kindness on the part of her children more than words can express and the children themselves would be the happier because of such thoughtful service the boy or girl who grows up in the belief that honorable labor in any direction is a god-given privilege will realize that housework is not without its fascinations and that mutual training in the school is an important part of the daily curriculum such a child will realize that even an empty water pail or a vacant wood box presents a golden opportunity for usefulness which should not be slighted he will not appropriate for himself the last pint of cold water from the pail or the last cup of hot water from the tea kettle and complacently leave them for someone else to fill that child even though he be grown up who sees nothing in these little opportunities for usefulness will let greater ones pass by with the same lack of appreciation laziness is a deadly enemy to success and the child who is indolent in the home is likely to bring up the rear in the race of life laziness is no kin to true happiness the lazy child is not the truly happy child he lies in bed until late in the morning is often careless about his personal appearance is late to breakfast late to school and his name is entirely wanting when the highest credits are awarded such a child may be sometimes recognized by the neglected appearance of his teeth and finger nails the high water marks about his neck and wrists the dust on his clothing and shoes his untidy hair etc in fact he seems to have adopted as his life motto the paraphrase there is no excellence about great labor a trite story is told of a man who was to be executed because of his persistent laziness while being driven to the scaffold he was given one more chance for his life by a kind-hearted individual who offered him a quantity of corn with which to make a new start upon hearing the suggestion the condemned man slowly raised himself up and rather dubiously inquired is it shelled being informed to the contrary he slowly settled down again with the remark well then drive on now boys and girls you will find many occasions in life when it will be necessary for you to put forth an extra effort in order to succeed but when some golden opportunity presents the corn to you do not stop to inquire is it shelled learn to shell your own corn use your muscle as well as your brain ever bearing in mind that increased strength both physical and mental comes as the result of the proper use of that which you now possess be workers be thinkers in the great world about you the old saying that it is better to wear out than to rust out is not without forceful meaning in accordance with the heaven-born manners let all things be done decently and in order all things include even the little chores which may be done by the members of the home kindergarten it also includes the greatest task of which man is capable if we would learn how particular heaven is in regard to neatness and order we should become familiar with god's instructions to ancient israel 
the arrangement of the camp of israel and the whole round of tabernacle service present a systematic demonstration of order and neatness such as heaven approves and the sad fate of uza korah the san and ibram attests to how particular god is in regard to perfect order if systematic order and neatness are to be maintained in the home the members of the household must be united in putting forth the necessary efforts and the blessed is that family who make of home a little heaven to go to heaven in but let me repeat that true refinement and gentleness of manners can never be found in a home where selfishness reigns and how many temptations to selfishness there are in the home life every day brings the choice between selfishness and self-sacrifice shall i take for myself the choicest apple or shall i share in that which is not so agreeable these may appear to be very insignificant questions but boys and girls do you know that the habitual decisions at which you arrive in childhood determine largely whether or not you will live by principle later on as the twig is bent so the tree inclines but the lesson of always giving cheerfully to others that which the natural heart will selfishly appropriate as its own can be learned only in the school of christ and blessed is that parent or teacher who rightly appreciates the privilege of becoming an assistant in that school blessed is that pupil who realizes what it means to become such a devoted learner that he can find joy in denying self that he may minister to the comfort of others whenever an opportunity is afforded recognizing that every heaven appointed task is a part of the great cause of truth the giving of the gospel to all the world in this generation every kindness shown to others if done in the right spirit is counted in the records of heaven as done to christ himself even the cup of cold water given in his name is never forgotten kind words and loving deeds are as pebbles cast upon the great sea of humanity the ever winding circle of whose influence extends beyond the limited vision of him who projects them and the eternal ages alone will reveal how many souls have been saved and saved forever as the grand result how many girls and boys are watching every opportunity to share in this blessed work mrs m a Lauffer. End of chapter 34 Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 35 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org stories worth rereading by various sometime somewhere you lend a hand to a fallen one a lift in kindness given it saved a soul when help was none and won a heart for heaven and so for the help you proffered there you reap a crown sometime somewhere d g pickers end of chapter thirty five Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 36 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Chapter 36 Giants and Grasshoppers What's the matter? asked Mrs. Hamlin. What's hindering the work? Mr. Hamlin glanced up from his paper. The work? he said. Oh, the old story. There are giants in the land, and the committee feel like grasshoppers. It was Earl's turn to look up. Earl was reading, but he generally had one ear for any conversation that was going on about him. His eyes went back to his book, but he kept wondering just what his father meant. Of course, there were no giants in these days. He waited until his father was turning the paper to another page, then put in his question. Father, what do you mean about giants and grasshoppers? Mr. Hamlin laughed. 
Your ears heard that, did they? Why, I meant what the ten spies did when they whined about giants and called themselves grasshoppers, instead of seizing their chance as the other two wanted them to do. Don't you remember the story? I fear you're not so well posted in Old Testament history as you are in your school history. The report of the spies makes a very interesting reading. You would better look it up. I remember about it now, said Earl, and I guess what you mean about the committee. There are lots of giants around nowadays, aren't there? Plenty of them, said his father. Look out that none of them scare you away from an opportunity. Earl laughed and went back to his book. He knew he was a sort of boy of whom the other boys said that he did not scare worth a cent. It was nearly twenty-four hours afterward that he was in the dining room, which was his evening study, bent over his slate, his pencil moving rapidly. His friend and classmate, Howard Eastman, sat on the arm of the large rocker, tearing bits from a newspaper wrapper and chewing them, while he waited for Earl. "'I do wish you would come on,' he said, between bites of paper. "'The boys will be waiting for us. I told them I would bring you right along, and the fun will all be over before we get there.' "'Bother,' said Earl, consulting his book. "'That is not anywhere near right.' Of course it is not. I knew it would not be. There is not a fellow in the class, nor a girl either, for that matter, who has got that example. Why, I know, because I heard them talking about that very one, and haven't I done that seventy-five times myself? My brother Dick tried to do it for me, and he did not get it either. He said there was some catch about it. I would like to find the catch, said Earl, wistfully. Well, you can't. I tell you there is not one of them who can. You need not think you are smarter than anybody else. We won't get marked on that example. They do not expect us to have it. I heard Professor Bowen tell Miss Andrews that there would not be a pupil in the room who would conquer it. Is that so? said Earl, running his fingers through his hair and looking wearily at the long rows of figures on a slate. I have not got it, that is certain, and I have tried it in every way I can think of. I do not know as there is any use of my going over it again. Of course there is not. It is just one of those mean old catch problems that nobody is expected to get. So just put up your tools and come on. I know the boys are out of all patience with us for being so late. It happened that Cousin Carol was in the library, which opened from the dining room. Cousin Carol was seventeen, and her thirteen-year-old cousin admired her extremely. He had known her but three weeks and already they were the best of friends. He valued her good opinion next to his father's and mother's. At that moment, her face appeared in the doorway, and she said in the sweetest and gentlest of tones, And there we saw the giants. Howard Eastman made haste to take the vats of paper out of his mouth and to get off the arm of the chair, but Miss Carroll's face vanished, and they heard her open the hall door and pass out. Earl's face, meantime, had reddened to his hair. What did she say? inquired Howard, his eyes big with wonder. Oh, never mind what she said. She was talking to me. Look here, Howard Eastman. You may as well cut down to Timmy's and tell them I cannot come. They need not wait for me any longer. There's no use in talking. I'm going to conquer that example if I have to sit up all night to do it. I'm no grasshopper, and it has got to be done. Oh, say now, I think that is mean, growled Howard. There won't be half so much fun without you, and besides, why, you almost got started. You began to put up your books. I know I did, but I am not starting now, and there is no hope of me. Skip along and tell the boys I'm sorry, but it's not my fault. It is this old giant of a problem that's trying to beat me, and he can't. I do not feel a bit like a grasshopper. Say, said Howard, what have giants to do with that example? She said something about them. They have not a thing to do with it, said Earl with energy, and I will prove that they have not. Now you skip, Howard. That's a good fellow. And let me alone. I have a battle to fight. Howard groaned and growled and skipped. Next morning, just as the hour for recitation arrived and the arithmetic class were filing in, company was announced. Just a luck, muttered Howard Eastman. Any other morning this term, I should have been ready for them. Did you know they were coming, Earl? No, Earl did not. He looked up in surprise. 
there were not only his father and cousin carol but a stranger a fine-looking man who it was presently telegraphed through the class was judge denison of buffalo who used to attend the school when he was a boy and then behold came principal bowen who stood talking with his guests a moment after which they all took seats and stayed through the entire hour work went on well until that fatal thirty-ninth example was reached and howard eastman was called upon to go to the board and perform it i cannot do it miss andrews he said i tried it as many as fifty times i think in fifty different ways and i could not get near the answer that is very sad said miss andrews trying not to laugh if you had not tried so many ways but worked faithfully at one you might have done better then she called on the boy next to him with no better success a long row of downcast eyes and blushing faces some of the pupils confessed that they had not even attempted the problem but had been discouraged by the reports of others is there no one who is willing to go to the board said miss andrews and attempt the work carrying it as far as he can at just that moment she caught sight of earl hamilton's face and spoke to him will you try it earl and earl went silence in the classroom all eyes on the blackboard and the quick fingers of one boy handling the crayon how fast he worked had he multiplied right no yes that was right oh but he had blundered in subtraction no he had not every figure was right ah now he had reached the place where none of them knew what to do next but he knew without pause or confusion he moved on through to the very last figure which he made with a flourish moreover he knew how to explain his work just what he did and why he did it as he turned to take a seat the admiring class whose honour he had saved broke into applause which the smiling teacher did not attempt to check i think we owe earl a word of thanks she said i confess my surprise as well as pleasure in his work i did not expect any of you to succeed in truth i gave you the example rather as a trial of patience than in the hope that you could conquer it you remember however that i gave you permission to secure help if you utterly failed will you tell us earl if you had any help yes ma'am said earl my cousin carol helped me and then cousin carol's astonishment suddenly broke into laughter i have not the least idea what he means she said in a clear silvery voice i was so far from helping him that i tried all by myself to do the example and failed the class began to cheer again but hushed suddenly to hear what earl was saying all the same she helped me he said sturdily then seeing that he must explain he added hurriedly we had been talking about the giants you know and the grasshoppers just the night before and i thought to myself then that i was not a grasshopper anyhow but i never thought about the example being a giant and i was just going to quit it when cousin carol came to the door and spoke about the giants and then i went at it again some of the pupils looked hopelessly puzzled mr hamlin's face was one broad smile students of old testament history have the advantage here today i fancy he said earl said miss andrews are you willing to tell us how long you worked in the example i began at six o'clock said earl and i got it just as the clock struck eleven there was no use in trying to keep that class from cheering they felt that their defeat had been forgotten in earl's victory mr hamlin and judge denison stood talking together after the class was dismissed do you know i like best of all that word of his about his cousins helping him said judge denison it was plucky in the boy to keep working and it took brains to study out that puzzle but that little touch which showed that he was not going to accept the least scrap of honour that did not belong to him was what caught me you have reason to be proud of your son mr hamlin pansy by permission of lothrop lee and shepherd company end of chapter thirty six recording by s k edison new jersey Chapter thirty seven of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter thirty seven. As Good as His Bond. I remember that a good many years ago, when I was a boy, 
My father, who was a stonemason, did some work for a man named John Hawes. When the work was completed, John Hawes said he would pay for it on a certain day. It was late in the fall when the work was done, and when the day came on which Mr. Hawes had said he would pay for it, a fearful storm of sleet and snow and wind raged from morning until night. We lived nine miles from the Hawes' home, and the road was a very bad one, even in good weather. I remember that father said at the breakfast table, Well, I guess that we shall not see anything of John Hawes today. It will not make any difference if he does not come, as I am not in urgent need of the money he owes me. It will make no difference if it is not paid for a month. But about noon, Mr. Hawes appeared at our door, almost frozen and covered with sleet and snow. Why, John Hawes, exclaimed my father, when he opened the door, and saw who it was that had knocked. I had not the least idea that you would try to ride away out here in this fearful storm. Did I not say that I would come? said John Hawes abruptly. Oh, yes, but I did not regard it as a promise so binding that you must fulfill it on a day like this. Any promise that I make is binding. Regardless of wind and weather, I said that I would pay the money today, and I am here to keep my word. But then it is only a small sum, and I do not really need it. I need to keep my word. If the sum had been but ten cents, and you were a millionaire, and I had said that I could pay it today, I would be here to pay it if I had been compelled to ride fifty miles. Do you wonder that it was often said of John Hawes that his word was as good as his bond? He was as truthful as he was honest. I remember that a neighbor of ours stopped at our house one day on his way home from the town. He had an almost incredible story to tell about a certain matter, and father said, Why, it hardly seems possible that such a thing can be true. John Hawes told me about it. Oh, then it is true. Yes, or John Hawes never would have told it. It is a fine thing to have a reputation like that. It is worth more than much worldly glory and honor when they are combined with the distrust of the people. There are men in high positions with all that wealth can buy at their command, who are much poorer than humble John Hawes, because their word is of no value, and they have none of that high sense of honor that glorifies the humblest life. End of chapter 37《ハッピーエイト》の3つの映画は、リブロックスのコーディング。リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックスのコーディングは、リブロックス whispered Myrtle Fling across the aisle to her chum. She is the plainest-looking girl I ever saw. Elizabeth nodded her head very positively, and two or three others exchanged knowing glances. A moment later, a little piece of paper fluttered down at Myrtle's feet from a desktop. On it was written, She's so plain. She's rocky mountainy, all ridges and hubbles. Meanwhile, Bernice sat very still, her great black eyes fixed on the teacher's face. Have you ever held a frightened bird in your hand? and felt its heartbeat. That is the way Bernice's heart was going. She was a stranger. Her father had moved to this place from a distant town, and she had walked to school that morning with a pupil who lived on the same street, but who had fluttered away into a little bevy of children almost as soon as she had shown the new girl the cloak room. And Bernice, naturally a bit diffident and sensitive, felt very much alone. This feeling was heightened when the bell struck, and one by one the pupils filed past into the schoolroom with only a rude stare or indifferent glance quite as if she were some specter or exhibition. When the last one had passed her, she clasped and unclasped her hands nervously. It is because I'm so homely, she thought. A month or more went by. Somehow Bernice and her schoolmates had not made so much progress in getting acquainted as one would have thought. The new girl was unobtrusive, attended strictly to her studies, and made few demands on those about her. Yet it was true that there was among them at least an unacknowledged conspiracy to taboo her, or an understanding that she was to be ignored almost completely. This Bernice attributed to her looks. Ever since she could remember, she had been called homely, ugly, 
plain, and similar epithets. Now, though she preserved a calm exterior, she could not help being unhappy, because she was thus slighted. One Monday morning a little flurry of excitement was visible among the pupils of the uptown grammar school. Elizabeth Weston had announced a party to come off later in the week, and several of them had been invited. "'Will you invite Bernice Dahl?' asked Myrtle, bending over her friend. "'I have been thinking about it,' Elizabeth answered slowly. "'Miss Summers says she has the best lessons of any one in her class, and then she was so nice to Jimmy Flanders that day he sprained his arm. I have half a mind to.' and she really did. That night, when Bernice was telling her mother of the invitation she had received, she said, doubtfully, I think I shall not go. Why not? was the reply. It can do no good to stay away, and something may be gained by going. So it chanced that Bernice found herself at Elizabeth's home on the evening of the party. Her hostess met her smilingly. She is really glad that I came, thought Bernice, and she felt her soul suddenly warm to life just as the thirsty earth brightens and glows and sends up little shoots of new green at the patter of summer rain. The long parlor was decorated in green and white. The bright lights, the gay figures stirring beneath, and the shining faces, half of which were strange to Bernice, formed a pretty picture, and the girl moved here and there in the constant shifting kaleidoscope with a freedom and happiness she had not known since coming to the town. At last she found herself with the others sitting very quiet and listening to two girls playing a duet on the piano. Then one of them sang a Scotch song. There was warmth and richness, the warbling of birds, the melody of brooks in the rendering, and Bernice heard a half-sigh close beside her. I wish I could sing. Oh, always I wanted to sing. Then for the first time she saw who sat there, a tall, handsome, beautifully gowned girl whom she had noticed several times during the evening, and to whom everybody seemed to defer. She had heard vaguely that this was Elizabeth's cousin, and wondered if it was for her that Elizabeth had given the party. "'And can't you?' she asked, evincing instant interest. The girl turned towards her with a smile. "'Not at all. Sometimes I used to try when no one heard, and once when I was in the hammock with my brother's little girl, I joined her in the song she was singing. She looked at me in a minute with a rueful countenance and said, "'Aunt Helen, I can't sing when you are making such a noise.' Bernice laughed. "'I haven't tried much since,' the tall girl added. We have singing lessons at school twice a week, Bernice said, presently. But I like the everyday lessons better. Do you? I like mathematics, and sloyd, and a hammer and nails and saw. Mama tells me I ought to be a carpenter. But you don't look like one, Bernice smiled critically, and then continued. We began physical geography this term. It is so interesting, and Miss Somers makes language beautiful. I can't help liking grammar. I never understood it. It was always so blind but Bernice was laughing again. The tall girl turned towards her inquiringly. I was thinking of what Johnny Weeks said down in the primary room the other day, Bernice began in explanation. The teacher asked him what cat was. I guess he was not paying attention. He looked all around and finally said he did not know. She told him it was a noun. Then, he said, after some deliberation, kitten must be a pronoun. An hour afterward, all the lights but one in the house were out. Elizabeth sat with her cousin, talking over the events of the evening. "'And how do you like Bernice Dahl?' she asked, and lent an eager ear, for Helen's word could make or mar things irretrievably. "'Like her? I have never liked anyone better. Perhaps I would not have noticed had you not spoken particularly about her.' "'Well,' said Elizabeth, as her cousin paused, "'she is all life and vivacity. I thought you said she was dumbified.' "'But she was. I never saw her like this before.' Then something woke her. If any seemed ill at ease or lonely, she went to them, and, behold, they chatted like magpies. I saw some of her schoolmates looking at her wonderingly, and at least one sneered, but I watched. She had just one thought, and that was to make every one happy. You could have spared any one of the girls better, in fact, any three of them. Long after Helen had gone to sleep, Elizabeth lay thinking. Jimmy Flanders, she said, and counted off one finger. Another followed, and then another. After all, it was wonderful how many good deeds she could reckon up, and all so quietly done. Strange, she had never thought of them en masse before. How could Bernice be gay among so many frowns and slights? The next forenoon session of grammar school was well under way. Bernice opened her history, and in it was a little slip of paper she had used as a bookmark since the first morning. An odd spirit seized her, and almost before she knew it, she had gone up the aisle and laid it on Elizabeth's desk. The next instant she would have given much to withdraw it. 
Elizabeth glanced down and flushed painfully. There it was. She's so plain. She's rocky mountainy. All ridges and hovels. But Bernice was back at her work again, evidently unruffled. When the bell tapped for intermission, Elizabeth went to her. Bernice, I did write it. Oh, I'm so ashamed. And bursting into tears, she hid her face on Bernice's shoulder. One of those smiles that somehow have the power of transforming the harshest features swept over the girl's face, and picking up Elizabeth's hand, she kissed it softly again and again. I won't kiss her face, she thought. I am so homely. But from that day, she slipped into the queenly place she had a right to occupy, and it was not long before every one forgot her plainness. And let me whisper you a secret, girls, for even now Bernice does not seem to know. As she grew older, the rough lines mellowed and softened. The short figure stretched upward till she was beautiful as ever her dearest wish had pictured. Was it not lovely spirit within, for Bernice was a Christian, molding and modeling the clay into a fit dwelling place for itself? That is a beauty that never quite withers away. Its roots are planted in the soul beautiful, and a beautiful soul can never die. Mrs. Cora Weber End of Plain Bernice Recording by Deb K. Chapter 39 of Stories Worth Rereading this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 39. Say Thank You. I saw a needy one relieved, and forth he went, and glad, but not one word of gratitude that lightened spirit had his benefactor bent by cares went wearily all day while him his kindnesses had served went careless on his way if you had given aught for me ought not my voice return one little word of graciousness o oh, breaking spirits yearn just for the human touch of love to cheer the aching heart to brighten all the paths of toil and take away the smart say thank you then tis small enough return for help bestowed say thank you you would spurn to slight the smallest debt you owed but is not this a debt ah more an honour if true blue your loyal heart of rectitude impels to say thank you b f w sowers end of chapter thirty nine Chapter 40 of Stories Worth Reading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Reading by Various. How the Boy Without a Reference Found One. John was fifteen and anxious to get a desirable place in the office of a well known lawyer who had advertised for a boy john doubted his success in obtaining this position because being a stranger in the city he had no reference to present i am afraid i will stand a poor chance he thought despondently however i will try to appear as well as i can and that may help me a little so he was careful to have his dress and person neat when he took his turn to be interviewed went in with his hat in his hand and a smile on his face. The keen-eyed lawyer glanced him over from head to foot. Good face, he thought, and pleasant ways. Then he noted the neat suit, but other boys had appeared in new clothes. So the well-brushed hair and clean skin. Very well, but there had been others quite as cleanly. Another glance, however, showed the fingernails free from soil. Ah, that looks like thoroughness, thought the lawyer. Then he asked a few direct, rapid questions, which John answered as directly prompt was his mental comment, can speak up when necessary. Let's see your writing, he added aloud. John took a pen and wrote his name. Very well, easy to read and no flourishes. Now, what reference have you? The dreadful question at last. John's face fell. He bad began to feel some hope of success, but this, 
detached it again. I haven't any, he said slowly. I'm almost a stranger in the city. Cannot take a boy without references, was the brusque rejoinder. As he spoke, a sudden thought sent a flush to John's cheek. I haven't any reference, he said with hesitation, but here is a letter from mother I just received. I wish you would read it. The lawyer took it. It was a short letter. My dear John, I want to remind you that wherever you find work, you must consider that work your own. Do not go into it as some boys do, with the feeling that you will do as little as you can and get something better soon. But make up your mind that you will do as much as possible and make yourself so necessary to your employer that he will never let you go. You have been a good son to me, and I can truly say that I have never known you to shrek. But be as good in business, and I'm sure God will bless your efforts. Hmm, said the lawyer, reading it over the second time. That's pretty good advice, John. Excellent advice, I rather think. I will try you, even without the references. John has been with him six years, and last spring was admitted to the bar. Do you intend taking that young man into partnership? asked a friend lately. Yes, I do. I cannot get along without John. He is my right-hand man, exclaimed the lawyer heartily. And John always says the best reference he ever had was his mother's good advice and honest praise. Selected. End of chapter 40 Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 41 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Welch, Tampa. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 41. An Hour a Day for a Year. Only an hour a day. That does not seem much. It hardly seems worth mentioning. But let us consider a little. An hour a day may mean more than we think. In a year, it represents 365 hours, and, allowing 16 hours for a waking day, 365 hours gives nearly 23 days, waking days too, which is worth taking note of, not days one-third of which is spent in necessary sleep. Now, time is a possession to be parted with for something else. Indeed, it forms a large part of the capital with which we trade. We give it in labor, and in exchange get education, money, dexterity, and almost all other things of value. To be watchful of time, then, is wise economy. A person who had astonished many by his achievements was once asked how he had contrived to do so much. The year, he replied, has 365 days, or 8,760 hours. In so many hours, great things may be done. The slow tortoise makes a long journey by losing no time. Just think what an hour's reading daily would amount to in a year. You could read easily a page of an ordinary youth's paper in 20 minutes, and at that rate could get through in 365 hours, no fewer than 1,095 pages. And suppose the matter were printed in small pages of, say, 300 words apiece. Your daily reading for one hour would in a year cover something like 12,000 pages. As to the books in which the year's reading is to be found, let everyone take his choice, remembering that people are known by the company they keep, and that to lead a noble life one should associate as much as possible with the noble. Instead of reading, suppose one took to writing. An hour a day would then produce quite as remarkable results. Even the short rule of no day without a line has resulted in the production of volumes, we might say almost of libraries. What results may indeed be arrived at by an hour's daily industry in anything. An hour in every day, says a writer, withdrawn from frivolous pursuits would, if properly employed, enable a person of ordinary capacity to go far toward mastering a science. It would make an ignorant man a well-informed one in less than ten years. 
Of course, the hour's work must not be done listlessly. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. It is an advantage, too, to work at intervals instead of a long period at a time. We come to the work fresher and in better condition to do it justice. When working hours come together, the best work is usually done during the first hour. After that, even the most energetic fall off. In music, an hour's practicing every day will carry one far in a year. But remember that practicing must be gone through with strict attention. An hour with strict attention is worth more than three hours with carelessness. And if a girl who wants to get on has only one hour to spare each day, she must be to herself a very exacting music master. It is wise to spend an hour a day in exercise. In an hour, one can, without making too great haste, walk three miles. At this rate, a year's walking represents over a thousand miles. Relaxation is essential to keep up the spirit and prevent life from becoming monotonous, as if one were sentenced to perpetual treadmill. Recreation is necessary, and the pursuit of pleasure is sometimes a duty. If we had but an hour a day to spare, what would be the best conceivable use to put it to? The best use, perhaps, would be to sit down and think. Suppose we came every day to a full stop for an hour and thought, what am I doing? What is to be the end of all this busy life for me? How may I act so that when I go out of the world, it will be the better for my having been in it? This thinking and planning would make us better characters altogether, would prepare us to face the future, ready for anything that might happen, and would fit us for coming duties. An hour a day spent thus would be a bright streak running through the year. You say it is easy to talk about devoting an hour a day to anything and easy to make a start, but very difficult to keep it up. True enough. But there is no end of wonders that can be wrought by the exercise of the human will. We all sorely complain, says Seneca, of the shortness of time, and yet we have much more than we know what to do with. Our lives are either spent in doing nothing at all, or in doing nothing that we ought to do. We are always complaining that our days are few, and acting as if there would be no end to them. An hour a day for a year, squandered in idleness or in foolish pursuits, means the sacrifice of all the advantages just mentioned, and anyone who keeps up idleness or folly for a year usually ends in having a lifetime of it. Selected. End of chapter 41. Chapter 42 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories worth rereading by various. Please, sir, I would rather not. An old sailor tells the following story of a boy who suffered much in resisting temptation. When offered a drink, the lad said, Excuse me, I would rather not. They laughed at him, but they never could get him to drink liquor. The captain said to the boy, You must learn to drink rogue if you are to be a sailor. Please excuse me, captain, but I would rather not. Take that rope, commanded the captain to a sailor, and lay it on. That will teach him to obey orders. The sailor took the rope and beat the boy most cruelly. Now, bring that rogue, said the captain. Please, sir, I would rather not. Then go into the foretop and stay all night. The poor boy looked away up to the masthead, trembling at the thought of spending the night there, but he had to obey. In the morning, the captain, in walking the deck, looked up and cried, Hello up there! No answer. Come down! Still no answer. One of the sailors was sent up, and what do you think he found? The poor boy was nearly frozen. He had lashed himself to the mast. 
so that when the ship rolled, he might not fall into the sea. The sailor brought the boy down in his arms, and they worked upon him until he showed signs of life. Then, when he was able to sit up, the captain poured out some liquor and said, Now, drink that rogue. Please, sir, I would rather not. Let me tell you why, and do not be angry. In our home, in the cottage, we were so happy. But father took to drink. He had no money to get us bread. And at last we had to sell the little house we had lived in, and everything we had. It broke my poor mother's heart. In sorrow she pinned away. Till at last, before she died, she called me to her bedside and said, Jimmy, you know what drink has made of your father. I want you to promise your dying mother that you will never taste drink. I want you to be free from that curse that has ruined your father. Oh, sir, continued the little fellow, would you have me break the promise I made to my dying mother? I cannot, and I will not do it. These words touched the heart of the captain. Tears came into his eyes. He stooped down and, folding the boy into his arms, said, No, no, my little hero, keep your promise, and if anyone tries again to make you drink, come to me and I will protect you. Selected. There were plans of mischief brewing. I saw but gave no sign, for I wanted to test the mettle of this little knight of mine. Of course, you must come and help us, for we all depend on Joe. The boy said, and I waited for his answer, yes or no. He stood and thought for a moment. I read his heart like a book, for the battle that he was fighting was told in his earnest look. Then to his waiting playmate, outspoken, my loyal knight, No, boy, I cannot go with you, for I know it wouldn't be right. End of Please, sir, I would rather not. Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 43 of Stories Worth Rereading this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 43 The Right Word. An instance of the transforming power of the right word is furnished by the following incident. Many years ago a minister was passing through a prison crowded with convicts, showing every phase of ignorance and brutality. One gigantic fellow crouched alone in a corner, his feet chained to a ball. There was an unhealed wound on his face, where he had been shot when trying to escape. The sight of the dumb, gaunt figure touched the visitor. "'How long has he to serve?' he asked of the guard. "'For life.' Has he anybody outside to look after him, wife or child? How should I know? Nobody has ever noticed him all the time he has been here. May I speak to him? Yes, but only for a minute. The minister hesitated. What could he say in one minute? He touched the man's torn cheek. I am sorry, he said. I wish I could help you. The convict looked keenly at him, and he nodded to indicate that he believed in the sympathy expressed. "'I am going away, and shall never see you again, perhaps, but you have a friend who will stay here with you.' The keen, small eyes were upon him. The prisoner dragged himself up, waiting and eager. "'Have you heard of Jesus?' "'Yes.' "'He is your friend.' If you are good and true, and will pray to God to help you, I am sure he will care for you. Come, sir, called the keeper. Time's up. The clergyman turned sorrowfully away. The prisoner called after him, and, catching his hand, held it in his own while he could. Tears were in the preacher's eyes. Fourteen years passed. The convict was sent into the mines, the minister went down one day into a mine, and among the workmen saw a gigantic figure bent with hardship and age. "'Who is that?' 
he asked the keeper. A lifer and a steady fellow, the best of the gang. Just then the lifer looked up. His figure straightened, for he had recognized the clergyman. His eyes shone. Do you know me? he said. Will he come soon? I've tried to be good. At a single word of sympathy, the life had been transformed, the convict redeemed. Selected. End of chapter 43. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Chapter 44 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. A Friend. A Friend. How much it means to be so true in all we do that others speak of us as such and call us by that noble name. A friend, how much it means to have a friend who'll gladly lend a helping hand to help us on when weary seems the path we tread. A friend, may we be such to Christ who gladly gave our lives to save his life a willing sacrifice, and showed himself a friend of men. E. C. Jager End of chapter 44「Chapter 45 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 45 The Saddest of India's Pictures, 1912. I saw a sad little picture when I was at the hills. It haunts me even now. It was a sight that should be seen, for words convey very little idea of the pathos of the scene. We were walking through the thick jungle on the hillside, when on the narrow path we saw a little procession wending its way toward us. In front walked a big, hardened-looking man in the prime of life. Behind him came a child, a slim, wonderfully fair girl of about ten years, lithe and graceful, with large, expressive dark eyes. After her came a woman prematurely old, her face lined and seamed in every direction. Just after they passed us, the little girl and woman stopped, and the child bent low to the earth and caressed her mother's feet. Then she flung herself into her mother's arms and clung to her, while the big beautiful eyes filled with tears. The mother embraced her lovingly, then she tried to thrust her away from her, her own tears running down her face all the time. The child clung piteously, with a yearning love in her eyes. Then she glanced toward that hardened figure, still continuing its way, and, oh, the awful look of terror on that sweet face! It is that look which continues to haunt me, the look of sweet yearning love giving place to that awful terror. Then terror overcame, and the child sped swiftly and silently after that man, ever and anon turning back for one more gaze at her heartbroken mother then she was lost to sight in the thick jungle the wretched mother over and over again lifted up her voice and called her child by name but there was no voice and none that gave answer and she turned her dreary steps homeward we questioned her and it was just as we feared this sweet innocent girl was leaving her mother's care for the first time to go and live with that man to whom she now belonged and only those who know something of the East know what that would mean to that frail, innocent little one. For days that scene haunted me in all its freshness, and it haunts me still. My heart bleeds for the little girls of India, for I love them so. Oh, that something could be speedily done for these little sisters of ours. Vera Chilson
End of chapter 45「Chapter forty six of Stories Worth Rereading。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. A Plea for Missions. O souls that know the love of God, and know it deep and true, the love that in your heart is shed abroad, shall others share with you? And do you count it joy to give of what to you is given, that erring souls may hear the word and live in hope of rest and heaven? If not, lift up your blinded eyes and let the light break in. Behold a world that bruised and groaning lies beneath the curse of sin. Then higher lift your eyes to meet your master's tender gaze, and say, Dear Lord, thy will in us complete, and pardon our delays. Jesse H. Brown End of chapter 46「Chapter forty seven of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb K. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Authors. One Little Widow. Seven years a widow, yet only eleven years old. The shadow, nay the curse, of widowhood had hung over little Sita ever since she remembered anything. The little brown girl had often wondered why other little girls living near her had such happy, merry times, while she only knew drudgery and ill-treatment from morning until night. One day, when the six of the weary years had passed, and she was ten years old, Sita found out what widow meant. Then, to the cruelty she had already endured, was added the terrors of the woe to come. She had gone, as usual, in her tattered garments, with three large brass water-pots on her head, to the great open well from which she drew the daily supply of water for a family of nine. She was so tired and her frail little back ached so pitifully that she sat down on a huge stone to rest a minute. Resting her weary head on one thin little hand, she was a picture of childish woe. Many deep sorrows had fallen on her young heart, but she was still a child in mind and years, yearning for companionship and love. Many Brahmin servants were drawing water near her, and looked bright and happy in their gay-colored cotton saris. A woman so poor that she must draw her own drinking water, but still a Brahmin, came near, and to her Sita appealed for help. "'Will you not draw a little water for me? I am ill and tired, and the well is very deep.' The woman turned angrily and uttered, in a scathing tone, the one word, "'Widow!" Then she burst out, "'Curse you! How dare you come between me and the glorious sun!' Your shadow has fallen upon me, and I'll have to take a bath of purification before I can eat food. Curse you! Stand aside! Poor Sita stood bewildered. She made no answer, but the tears coursed down her cheeks. Something akin to pity made the woman pause. Halting at a safe distance from the shadow of the child, she talked to her in milder tone. She was thinking, perhaps, of her two soft-eyed daughters, very dear to her proud heart, though she mourned bitterly when they were born, because the gods had denied her sons. "'Why should I help you?' she had said." when the gods have cursed you. See, you are a widow. Then, in answer to the child's vacant gaze, she continued, Don't you understand? Didn't you have a husband once? Yes, I think so, said it answered. An old bad man who used to shake me and tell me to grow up quickly to work for him. Perhaps he was my husband. When he died, they said I killed him, but I did not. So you call him bad? The woman cried. Ah, no wonder the gods hate you. No doubt you were very wicked ages and ages ago. And so now you are made a widow. By and by you will be born a snake or a toad, and gathering up her water pots, she went away. The slender, ill fed child hurriedly filled the brass vessels, knowing that abuse awaited her late return. Raising the huge jars to her head, she hastened to her house, a home she never knew. The sister in law met the little thing with violent abuse, and bade her prepare the morning meal. The child was ill, and nearly fell with fatigue. I'll show you how to wake up, the woman cried, and seizing a hot poker, she laid it on the arms and hands of the child. Screaming with pain, the poor little creature worked on, trembling if the sister-in-law even looked her way. 
This was one day. Each of the seven long years contained three hundred and sixty-five such days, and now they were growing worse. The last year, in token of the deep disgrace of widowhood, the child's soft, dark tresses had been shaved off, and her head left bare. When that has been done, but one meal a day is permitted a widow, no matter how she works. Most of the little girls who saw Sita ran from her, fearing pollution. But there was one who shone on her like a gleam of sunshine whenever she saw her. One day after the woman had abused her at the well, Sita found a chance to tell Tungi about it. There is a better god than that, Tungi said. Our people do not know him, and that is why I am not allowed to talk to you. I am married, and my husband lives in a distant city. If I speak to you, they believe that he will die. But in the school I attend, many do not believe these things. How can you go to school? Sita asked. My sister-in-law says that only bad people learn to read. So my mother used to think, said Tungi. But my husband is in school, and he has sent word that I must go until he calls for me to come to his home. Then he can have a wife who can understand when he talks about his books. He says the English have happy families, and it is this that makes them so. The wives know books, and how to sing, and how to make a home pleasant. My mother says it is all very bad, but he is my husband, and I must do as he says. I am very glad, for it is very pleasant there. Thus the bright-eyed little Brahmin wife chatted away, as gay as a bird. The fount of knowledge was open to her. The beaming eye, the elastic figure, and the individuality of her western sisters were becoming hers. But none of these things seemed for Sita. For nine weary months after Tungi went to school, the shaven-head child, living in on one meal a day, went about sad and lonely. When she again saw her bright-faced little friend, her condition had grown worse. Her neck and arms were full of scars where bits of flesh had been pinched out of vindictive rage by her husband's relatives, who believed her guilty of his death. Brutality, growing stronger with use, made them callous to the sufferings of the little being in their power. No one who cared knew of the pangs of hunger, the violent words, and the threats of future punishment. Once or twice she had looked down into the cool depths of the well, and wondered how quickly she could die. Only the terror of punishment after death kept this baby widow from suicide. One day, as she was weeping by the gateway of Tungi's house, the little child wife told the little child widow of a safe refuge for such as she where neither poverty nor ignorance could exclude her, a home under the loving care of one who knew the widow's curse. After many difficulties, Sita found this shelter. Here she forgot her widowhood and found her childhood. Here in the beautiful garden or at her lessons, helping with cooking or leaning lovingly on the arms of her Mumbai's chair, she passed many sweet and useful years. By and by she found the greatest joy in love, higher and better than human love she can ever be. Later, when a beautiful young womanhood had crowned her, she was sought by an earnest young Christian as his wife. Many of the millions of child widows in India never find release from the bonds of cruel custom and false religion. In Hinduism, there is no hope for such accursed ones. Mosaics from India, published by Fleming H. Ravel Company. End of The Little Widow Recording by Deb Kay Chapter 48 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 48 Why the Mite Boxes Were Full. Rosella had a blue mite box, and so had her brother Drew. The mite boxes had been given out in Sunday school, and were to be kept two months. All the money saved in the mite boxes was to go toward sending the news about Jesus to the heathen girls and boys across the ocean. The Sunday school superintendent said so, and so did the sweet old blind missionary woman, who had talked to the scholars. Rosella and Drew carried their mite boxes across the field toward their tent. They and their mother and aunt and cousins had come several miles from their farm to tent with a number of other folks near the farmer's cooperative fruit-drying buildings during the fruit season to cut fruit for drying. Another girl was going across the fields with a blue mite box. She was the Chinese girl. Louis Ming, whose father and mother had come from the city to cook for some of the owners here. 
Louis Ming's got a mite box, said Rosella. Drew laughed. Do you suppose she'll save anything in it? I don't believe she will, said Rosella. Rosella and Drew carried their mite boxes into their mother's tent. We're going to cut apricots and peaches to help the heathen, announced Rosella. Mother nodded. We'll have a whole lot of money in our mite boxes when we carry them back, said Rosella. We'll see, said her mother. For two or three mornings, Rosella and Drew rose early, and after breakfast hurried to the cutting sheds to work. But after a while, Rosella and Drew grew tired. It was more fun to run over the fields, and Mother never said Rosella and Drew must cut fruit anyhow, though she looked sober. The heathen children won't know, said Rosella to herself. Suppose the heathen children were me. I wonder if they'd cut apricots every day to send me Bibles and missionaries. I don't believe they would. The first month melted away. When it was over, Rosella had two nickels in her mite box, and Drew had three in his. The heathen children won't know, said Rosella. But one Saturday night, Rosella and Drew were going by the tent where Louis Ming lived. Inside the tent sat Louis Ming, with her week's pay in her lap. In the Chinese girl's hand was her blue mite box. Louis Ming was putting her money into her mite box and did not notice Rosella and Drew. Why, ee, whispered Rosella. See there. Why, Drew. I do believe Louis Ming's putting every bit of her pay into her mite box. Do you suppose she knows what she's doing? Rosella and Drew stood watching. Do you suppose Lu Ming understands? whispered Rosella again. Why, she's giving it all. Drew, she's been working in the cutting sheds every time I've been there. She didn't cut fruit till she got her mite box. There, she's given every cent. When Louis Ming looked up and suddenly discovered Rosella and Drew, she looked half scared. Rosella stepped toward the tent and said, What made you give all your money? Why didn't you save some? You've worked hard for it. The heathen children wouldn't know if you kept some for candy and things. Louis Ming looked shy. You say what for I give money? She asked softly. Yes, said Rosella. Why do you give so much? Louis Ming looked down at the blue mite box. Somehow it seemed hard for her to answer at first. Then she spoke softly. One time I have baby brother. He die. Mutter cry, cry, cry. I cry, cry all time. I say, never see poor little baby brother again. Never again. And I love little brother. Then I go to mission school. Teacher say, Louis Ming, love Jesus, and some day you will see your baby brother again. Oh, teacher make me so happy. See little brother again? I go home and tell my mother. She not believe, but I get teacher to come and tell. She tell about Jesus to my father and mother. They learn love him. Some day we all go heaven and see little brother. Now I save money to put in mite box. Way over in China, many little girls don't know about Jesus. Their little brothers die. They cry, cry, all the same me did. Maybe some my money send teacher, tell those poor Chinese girls how go to heaven. See their baby brothers again. So I work very hard to put money in my box, because Jesus come into my heart. Rosella did not answer, but stood looking at Louis Ming. Then she suddenly turned and caught Drew's hand, and pulled him along, till they were running toward their own tent. Rosella rushed in. The baby was sitting on the straw floor and Rosella caught him up, crying. Oh, baby brother, baby brother, don't you ever die. I couldn't spare you. Goo, said baby brother, holding out his arms to Drew. Drew did not say anything, but he took baby brother. Drew, said Rosella, I'm going straight to work, aren't you? I'm ashamed of myself. To think that a Chinese girl who once did not know about Jesus would work so hard now for her mite box. And you and I haven't. Why, Drew Hopkins, 
I haven't acted as though I cared whether the heathen boys and girls knew about Jesus or not. I am going to work to fill my mite box. Why, Drew? Louis Ming's box is most full, and she used to be a heathen. Drew nodded and hugged baby brother tighter. The next Monday, Rosella and Drew began working hard cutting fruit. How they cut fruit the remaining month. How they saved. And how glad they were that their mite boxes were heavy when the day came to carry them back. The blind missionary woman was at Sunday school again. After the school closed, the superintendent, who knew Rosella and Drew, introduced them to the missionary. And the blind missionary said, Bless the dear girl and boy who have cut peaches for two whole months to help send the gospel to heathen children. Then Rosella, being honest, could not bear to have the missionary think it had been two months instead of one, and she suddenly burst out, half crying, and said, Oh, I wasn't so good as that. I didn't work two months, and I, I'm afraid if Louis Ming hadn't loved Jesus better than I did, Drew and I wouldn't have had hardly any money in our mite boxes. The blind missionary wanted to know about Louis Ming, and Rosella told the missionary all about her. Then the blind missionary kissed Louis Ming's cheek and said, Many that are last shall be first. But Rosella was glad that she and Drew had worked to send the news about Jesus to heathen children. Written by Mary E. Bamford in Over Sea and Land End of chapter 48 Recording by Survive Chapter 49 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb K. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Authors. Tito and the Boxers. A True Story of a Young Christian. It was late in May when we last saw Tito's father. He was attending the annual meeting of the North China Mission at Tongchao, near Peking, when word came that the boxers were tearing up the railway between Peking and Pao Ting Fu. For twelve years he had been the pastor of the Congregational Church in Pao Ting Fu, having been the first Chinese pastor ordained in North China. Without waiting for the end of the meeting, he hastened to the assistance of the little band of missionaries. During the month of June, dangers thickened about the devoted band of missionaries and Christian Chinese who lived in the mission compound not far from the wall of Pao Ti Fu. There was no mother in Pastor Meng's home to comfort the hearts of five children living face to face with death. But 13-year-old Tito, the hero of our story, was as brave a lad as ever cheered the hearts of little brothers and sisters. Straight as an arrow, his fine-cut, delicate face flushed with pink, with firm, manly mouth and eyes that showed both strength and gentleness. Tito was a boy to win all hearts at sight. By the 27th of June, it was plain that all who remained in that compound were doomed to fall victims to two bucks or hate. Pester Meng called his oldest boy to his side and said, Tito, I have asked my friend Mr. Tian to take you with him and try to find some place of refuge from the boxers. I cannot forsake my missionary friends and the Christians, who have no one else to depend upon, but I want you to try to escape. Father, said the boy, I want to stay here with you. I am not afraid to die. No, the father replied. If we are all killed, who will preach Jesus to these poor people? So before the next day dawned, Tito said goodbye and started with Mr. Tian on his wanderings. That same afternoon, Pastor Meng was in the chapel when a company of boxers suddenly burst into the room and seized him. A Christian Chinese who was with him escaped over the back wall and took the sad tidings to his friends. The boxers dragged Pastor Meng to a temple, and there, having learned that his eldest son had fled, tortured him to make him tell Tito's hiding place. But the secret was not revealed. In the early morning, scores of boxer knives slowly stabbed him to death. But the face of the master smiled upon this brave soul, faithful unto death. Three days later, four of his children, his only sister and her two children, and the three missionary friends for whom he had laid down his life were killed. But what of the little one who had left home four days before? Determined that not one member of the family should be left, the boxers searched for him in all directions. But Mr. Chen had taken Tito to the home of a relative only a few miles from Pao Tifung, 
and they escaped detection. This relative feared to harbor them more than two or three days, so they turned their faces northward, where a low range of Sierra-like mountains were outlined against the blue sky. Seventeen miles from Pao Tingfu, and not far from the home of an uncle of Mr. Chan's, they found a little cave in the mountainside, not high enough to allow them to stand upright. Here they crouched for twenty days. The uncle took them a little food, but to get water they were obliged to go three miles to a mountain village, stealing up to a well under cover of darkness. In that dark cave, hunger and thirst were their constant companions, and the howling of wolves at night made their mountain solitude fearsome. Tito had lived for five days in this retreat when word was brought to him that father, brothers, sisters, aunt, cousins, and all the missionaries belonging to the three missions in Pautifu had been cruelly massacred, and that churches, schools, homes were all masses of charred ruins. After twenty days of cave life, Mr. Tien's uncle sent them warning that boxers were on their track, and that they must leave their mountain refuge immediately. Then began long, weary wanderings towards the southwest, over mountain roads, their plan being to go to Shanxi. One day in their wanderings they had just passed the village of Changhua, about sixteen miles south of Pao Tingfu, when a band of boxers, some armed with rifles, some brandishing great swords, rushed after them, shouting, Kill! Kill! The secondary foreign devils! Escape was impossible. Before this howling horde had overtaken them, a man who was standing near them asked Tito, Are you a Christian? Yes, the boy replied. My father and mother were Christians, and from a little child I have believed in Jesus. Do not be afraid, the stranger said. I will protect you. Then the boxers closed about them. Mr. Tien was securely bound, hound and foot. Tito was led by his cue, and soon they were back by the boxer of altar in the village. When the knives were first waved in his face, and the bloodthirsty shouts first rang in his ears, a thrill of fear chilled Tito's heart. But it passed as quickly as it came, and as he was dragged towards the altar, it seemed as if some soft, low voice kept singing in his ear the hymn, I'm not ashamed to own my lord. All fear vanished. When they began to bind Mr. Tian to the altar, he spoke no word for himself, but pleaded most earnestly for the little charge committed to his care telling how all his relatives had been murdered and begging them to spare his life. Perhaps it was those earnest, unselfish words, perhaps it was the boy's gracious mien and winsome face, that moved the crowd, for one of the village boxers stepped forward, saying, I adopt this boy as my son. Let no one touch him. I stand security for his good behavior. Tito's deliverer was one of the three bachelor brothers, the terror of the region, but it was evident that Mr. Chang's heart was completely won over by the boy. For three months he kept him in his house, tenderly providing for every want. Let Tito tell the story of those days in his own words. Of course I could not pray openly, but sometimes when my adopted father was away with the boxers on their raids, I would shut the door tight and kneel in prayer. Then every evening when the sun went down, I would turn my face to the west, and in my heart repeat the hymn, Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. Mr. Chang was in Pautifu when my father was killed, and told me how they stabbed and tortured him. I suppose that my uncle and his wife, who had gone to Tongchao, had been killed too, and all of the missionaries in China. But I knew that the people in America would send out some more missionaries, and I thought how happy I would be some time in the future when I could go into a chapel again and hear them preach. But Tito had not long to wait for this day of joy. In October, expeditions of British, German, French, and Italian soldiers from Peking and Tientsin arrived at Pao Tingfu, and the boxer hordes scattered at their coming. Soon to the brave boy in the boxer's home came the glad tidings that his uncle was still living, and had sent for him to come to Pao Tingfu. Mr. Chang loved the boy so deeply that he could not but rejoice with him, sad though he felt at the thought of parting with him. Fearful of some treachery or of harm coming to Tito, he went with him to Pao Tingfu then returned to the village home from which the sunshine had departed. Later, Tito studied in this Congregational Academy in Peking, and then in Japan. He is now an earnest teacher of Christianity, for which he so bravely faced death. End of Tito and the Boxers Recording by Deb K. Chapter 50 of Stories Worth Rereading this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories worth rereading by various. What the flowers say to me. Our Father made us beautiful and breathed on us his love and gave us of the spirit that prevails in heaven above. We stand here meekly blooming for the stranger passing by, and if unnoticed we are left, we never stop to sigh, but shed our fragrance all abroad and smile and shine or rain, and thus we do the will of God till he restores again a realm of peace on earth to last the countless ages through where flowers bloom and never fade, and there is room for you. Ida Rees Kurtz End of chapter 50「Chapter 51 of Stories Worth Rereading – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 51. How Nyangandi Swam to Church. Nyangandi lived in West Africa, near the Agowi River. She was going away from the missionary's house one afternoon, where she had been to sell bunches of plantains to the missionary, when his wife said, now you must not forget that you have promised to come tomorrow to church yes the girl replied i will surely come if i am alive the next morning she found that somebody had stolen her canoe and no one would lend her one to go to church in but she had promised to go and she felt that she must she swam all the way the current was swift the water deep and the river fully a third of a mile wide but by swimming diagonally she succeeded in crossing the river remember this little heathen girl in west africa when you feel tempted to stay away from the house of god for some trivial reason selected end of chapter fifty one chapter fifty two of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories worth rereading by various to those who fail. All honor to him who shall win the prize. The world has cried for a thousand years, but to him who tries and who fails and dies, I give honor and glory and tears. O oh, great is the hero who wins a name, but greater many and many a time. Some pale-faced fellow who dies in shame, and lets God finish the thought sublime. And great is the man with the sword undrawn, and good is the man who refrains from wine. But the man who fails and who still fights on, lo, he is the twin brother of mine. Selected. End of chapter 52. Recording by Sarah Hale. Chapter 53 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 53 The Little Printer Missionary. A ragged printer's boy, who lived in Constantinople, was in the habit of carrying the proof shorts to the English editor during the noon lunchtime. The editor was a busy man, and exchanged no words, except such as were necessary, with him. The boy was faithful, doing all that he was bidden, promptly and to the best of his ability. But he was ragged, and so dirty as to be positively repulsive. This annoyed the editor, but— as he was no worse in this respect than most of the boys of his class, the busy man did not urge him to improve his personal appearance, much as he would have enjoyed the change. But one morning the boy came in with clean face, hands, and garments. Not a trace of the old filth was to be seen about his person, and so great was the change that his master did not recognize him. "'Why, 
"'You are a new boy entirely,' he said, when convinced of the lad's identity. "'I am going away, back to my own home,' said the boy quickly, "'and I came to ask a favor of you. Will you pray for me after I am gone?' "'Pray for you?' exclaimed the editor. "'Yes,' returned the boy. "'You think I am a heathen, but I am not. I have been attending chapel and Sunday school in the Bible house. I have learned to read and to write, and, best of all, I have learned to love Jesus and am trying to be his boy. But I cannot stay here while my father, mother, brothers, and sisters do not know about him. So I go back to my own village to tell friends and neighbors about him. I don't know much yet, and I want you to pray that I may be helped when I try to tell my people what he is to me. "'And it is because you are going away that you have washed and fixed yourself up so well?' asked the editor, thinking what a fine boy clothes and cleanliness had made of him. "'It is because I am Christ's boy now,' was the answer. "'I want to be clean and to have my clothes whole in honor of the master I am trying to serve. "'I hope your friends will receive as much from Christ's love as you have,' said the man. "'And you will pray for them and for me,' urged the boy. The man promised, and, full of hope, the lad started on his long walk homeward, to tell the story of the cross to the dear ones there, in his own wretched home first, and afterward to the neighbors among whom he had spent his childhood days. Selected. End of chapter 53. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Chapter 54 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 54 Consecration. Ready to go, ready to wait, ready a gap to fill ready for service, small or great, ready to do his will. Phillips Brooks End of chapter 54 Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California Chapter 55 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Chapter 55 The Missionary's Defense The following occurrence was related by Missionary von Asselt, a Rhenish missionary in Sumatra, from 1856 to 76, when on a visit to Lübeck. When I first went to Sumatra, in the year 1856, I was the first European missionary to go among the wild Batas, although twenty years prior two American missionaries had come to them with the gospel, but they had been killed and eaten. Since then no effort had been made to bring the gospel to these people, and naturally they had remained the same cruel savages. What it means for one to stand alone among a savage people— unable to make himself understood, not understanding a single sound of their language, but whose suspicious, hostile looks and gestures speak only a too well understood language. Yes, it is hard for one to realize that. The first two years that I spent among the Batas, at first all alone and afterward with my wife, were so hard that it makes me shudder even now when I think of them. Often it seemed as if we were not only encompassed by hostile men, but also by hostile powers of darkness, for often an inexplicable, unutterable fear would come over us, so that we had to get up at night and go on our knees to pray or read the word of God in order to find relief. After we had lived in this place for two years, we moved several hours' journey inland among a tribe somewhat civilized who received us more kindly. 
There we built a small house with three rooms, a living room, a bedroom, and a small reception room, and life for us became a little more easy and cheerful. When we had been in this new place for some months, a man came to me from the district where we had been, and whom I had known there. I was sitting on the bench in front of our house, and he sat down beside me, and for a while talked of this, that, and the other. Finally he began, Now, Tuan, teacher, I have yet one request. And what is that? I should like to have a look at your watchman close at hand. What watchman do you mean? I do not have any. I mean the watchman whom you station around your house at night to protect you. But I have no watchman, I said again. I have only a little herds boy and a little cook, and they would make poor watchmen. Then the man looked at me incredulously as if he wished to say, Oh, do not try to make me believe otherwise, for I know better. Then he asked, May I look through your house to see if they are hid there? Yes, certainly, I said, laughing. Look through it. You will not find anybody. So he went in and searched in every corner, even through the beds, but came to me very much disappointed. Then I began a little probing myself, and requested him to tell me the circumstances about those watchmen of whom he spoke, and this is what he related to me. When you first came to us, Tuan, we were very angry at you. We did not want you to live among us. We did not trust you, and believed you had some design against us. Therefore we came together and resolved to kill you and your wife. Accordingly, we went to your house night after night, but when we came near, there stood always, close around the house, a double row of watchmen with glittering weapons, and we did not venture to attack them to get into your house. But we were not willing to abandon our plan, so we went to a professional assassin. There still was among the savage Batas at that time a special guild of assassins who killed for hire any one whom it was desired to get out of the way and asked him if he would undertake to kill you and your wife. He laughed at us because of our cowardice and said, I fear no god and no devil. I will get through those watchmen easily. So we came all together in the evening, and the assassin, swinging his weapon about his head, went courageously on before us. As we neared your house, we remained behind and let him go on alone. But in a short time he came running back hastily and said, No, I dare not risk it to go through alone. Two rows of big, strong men stand there, very close together, shoulder to shoulder, and their weapons shine like fire. Then we gave it up to kill you. But now tell me, Tuan, who are these watchmen? Have you never seen them? No, I have never seen them. And your wife did not see them also? No, my wife did not see them. But yet we have all seen them, how is that? Then I went in and brought a Bible from our house, and holding it open before him said, See here, this book is the word of our great God, in which he promises to guard and defend us, and we firmly believe that word. Therefore we need not to see the watchman. But you do not believe. Therefore the great God has to show you the watchman, in order that you may learn to believe." selected end of chapter 55 recording by christine layman reseda california chapter 56 of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine layman Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 56 Light at Last. Dr. Kirkpatrick, with the Baptist Mission in the Shan states of Burma, tells in the Missionary Review of an aged woman whom he met on a tour in a mountain district where no missionary had ever before set foot. This old woman listened attentively and apparently believed. She had never seen a white man, although, according to her birth certificate, she was one hundred and twenty-three years old. As she sat huddled together by the fire, she said, 
teacher is it true that the lord can and will save me a woman do not deceive me i am very old and must soon fall into hell unless this new religion is true i have made many offerings and made many long pilgrimages to the most sacred shrines and still find no relief from the burden of sin please teach me to pray to this jesus that can save i explained the plan of salvation and god's love for her and taught her a simple prayer of a few words she seemed very grateful as i was about to leave her she said teacher you come from the great american country do you not yes i answered is your country greater than the shan country i assured her that it was are the people there all christians i had to confess that they were not but that there were many christians were your parents christians yes and my grandparents and ancestors for several generations my parents she said died when i was young my brothers and sisters all are dead i have been married three times and my husbands are all dead i had nine children and they are all dead i had many grandchildren and they are all dead except this one with whom i am living i have seen three generations fall into hell now i believe in jesus and hope to go to the heavenly country when i die if there are so many christians in your country and you have known about this lord that can save for so long why did you not come and tell us before so that many of my people could have been saved with the tears running down her cheeks she said i am so glad to hear this good news before it is too late but all of my loved ones have fallen into hell why did you not come before that question still haunts me i wish every christian in america could hear it as i did a few weeks later i saw some of the men from this village in the bazaar at namkam and asked them about the old grandmother of the village they told me that she died the day before and that they had come to buy things for the funeral after much questioning they said they were ashamed to tell me that she was crazy as she grew weaker she told everybody that she was going to die in a few days and she was very happy about it she was going to the heavenly country and other such foolish things when she was too weak to speak aloud she kept whispering yasu hok sung yasu hok sung jesus loves me jesus loves me with her last breath the first and only time this woman ever heard the gospel she accepted it it is an exceptional case but there are others like it end of chapter 56 recording by christine layman reseda california chapter 57 of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Teresa Bauman. Stories Worth Rereading by Various The Brown Towel One who has nothing can give nothing, said Mrs. Sayers, the sexton's wife, as the ladies of the sewing society were busily engaged in packing the contents of a large box destined for a western missionary. A person who has nothing to give must be poor indeed, said Mrs. Bell, as she deposited a pair of warm blankets in the already well-filled box. Mrs. Sayers looked at the last-named speaker with a glance which seemed to say, You who have never known self-denial cannot feel for me, and remarked, You surely think that one can be too poor to give? I once thought so, but have learned from experience that no better investment can be made even from the depths of poverty, than lending to the Lord. Seeing the ladies listening attentively to the conversation, Mrs. Bell continued, Perhaps, as our work is finished, I can do no better than to give you my experience on the subject. It may be the means of showing you that God will reward the cheerful giver. During the first twenty-eight years of my life, I was surrounded with wealth, and not until I had been married nine years did I know a want which money could satisfy, or feel the necessity of exertion? Reverses came with fearful suddenness, 
and before I had recovered from the blow, I found myself the wife of a poor man, with five little children dependent upon our exertions. From that hour I lost all thought of anything but care of my family. Late hours and hard work were my portion, and to my unskilled hands it seemed first a bitter lot. My husband strove anxiously to gain a subsistence, and barely succeeded. We changed our place of residence several times, hoping to do better, but without improvement. Everything seemed against us. Our well-stocked wardrobe had become so exhausted that I felt justified in absenting myself from the house of God, with my children, for want of suitable apparel. While in this low condition, I went to church one evening, when my poverty-stricken appearance would escape notice and took my seat near the door. An agent from the West preached, and begged contributions to the home missionary cause. His appeal brought tears to my eyes, and painfully reminded me of my past days of prosperity, when I could give of my abundance to all who called upon me. It never entered my mind that the appeal for assistance in any way concerned me, with my poor children banished from the house of God by poverty, while I could only venture out under the friendly protection of darkness. I left the church more submissive to my lot, with a prayer in my heart that those whose consciences had been addressed might respond. I tried in vain to sleep that night. The words of the text, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom, seemed continually sounding in my ears. The eloquent entreaty of the speaker to all, however poor, to give a mite to the Lord and receive the promised blessing, seemed addressed to me. I rose early the next morning, and looked over all my worldly goods in search of something worth bestowing. But in vain, the promised blessing seemed beyond my reach. Hearing that the ladies of the church had filled a box for the missionary's family, I made one more effort to spare something. All was poor and threadbare. What should I do? At last I thought of my towels. I had six of coarse brown linen, but little worn. They seemed a scanty supply for a family of seven, and yet I took one from the number, and, putting it into my pocket, hastened to the house where the box was kept, and quietly slipped it in. I returned home with a light heart, feeling that my Savior's eye had seen my sacrifice, and would bless my effort. From that day success attended all my husband's efforts in business. In a few months our means increased so that we were able to attend church and send our children to Sabbath school, and before ten years had passed, our former prosperity had returned fourfold. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, had been given us. It may seem superstitious to you, my dear friends, but we date all our successes in life to God's blessing, following that humble gift out of deep poverty. He may not always think best to reward so signally those who give to him, but he is never unmindful of the humblest gift or giver. Wonder not that from that day I deem few too poor to give, and that I am a firm believer in God's promise that he will repay, with interest, even in this life, all we lend to him. Glances of deep interest, unmixed with envy, were cast from the windows at Mrs. Bell, as, after bidding the ladies adieu, she stepped into her carriage. Her consistent benevolence had proved to all that in her prosperity she retained the same Christian spirit which, in her days of poverty, had led to the bestowal of the brown towel. Well, exclaimed Mrs. Sayers, if we all had such a self-denying spirit, we might fill another box at once. I will never again think that I am too poor to give. End of The Brown Towel Chapter 58 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Chapter 58 Only a Boy More than half a century ago, a faithful minister, coming early to the kirk, met one of his deacons, whose face wore a very resolute expression. "'I came early to meet you,' he said." I have something on my conscience to say to you. Pastor, there must be something radically wrong in your preaching and work. There has been only one person added to the church in a whole year, and he is only a boy. The old minister listened. 
his eyes moistened and his thin hand trembled on his broad-headed cane i feel it all he said i feel it but god knows that i have tried to do my duty and i can trust him for the results yes yes said the deacon but by their fruits ye shall know them and one new member and he too only a boy seems to me rather a slight evidence of true faith and zeal i don't want to be hard but i have this matter on my conscience and i have done but my duty in speaking plainly true said the old man but charity suffereth long and is kind beareth all things hopeth all things ay there you have it hopeth all things i have great hopes of that one boy robert some seed that we sow bears fruit late but that fruit is generally the most precious of all the old minister went to the pulpit that day with a grieved and heavy heart he closed his discourse with dim and tearful eyes he wished that his work was done forever and that he was at rest among the graves under the blossoming trees in the old kirkyard he lingered in the dear old kirk after the rest were gone he wished to be alone the place was sacred and inexpressibly dear to him it had been his spiritual home from his youth before this altar he had prayed over the dead forms of a bygone generation and had welcomed the children of a new generation and here yes here he had been told at last that his work was no longer owned and blessed no one remained no one only a boy the boy was robert moffat he watched the trembling old man his soul was filled with loving sympathy he went to him and laid his hand on his black gown well robert said the minister do you think if i were willing to work hard for an education i could ever become a preacher a preacher perhaps a missionary there was a long pause tears filled the eyes of the old minister at length he said this heals the ache in my heart robert i see the divine hand now may god bless you my boy yes i think you will become a preacher some few years ago there returned to london from africa an aged missionary his name was spoken with reverence when he went into an assembly the people rose when he spoke in public there was a deep silence priests stood uncovered before him nobles invited him to their homes he had added a province to the church of christ on earth had brought under the gospel influence the most savage of african chiefs had given the translated bible to strange tribes had enriched with valuable knowledge the royal geographical society and had honored the humble place of his birth the scottish kirk the united kingdom and the universal missionary cause it is hard to trust when no evidence of fruit appears but the harvests of right intentions are sure the old minister sleeps beneath the trees in the humble place of his labors but men remember his work because of what he was to one boy and what that one boy was to the world do thou thy work it shall succeed in thine or in another's day and if denied the victor's meed thou shalt not miss the toiler's pay youth's companion end of chapter fifty eight recording by christine layman reseda california Chapter 59 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. When Someone's Late. Someone is late, and so I wait a minute, two, or ten. To me, the cost is good time lost that never comes again he does not care how i shall fare or what my loss shall be his tardiness is selfishness and basely rude to me my boys be spry the moments fly meet every day to make be whether fair or foul 
Be there in time your place to take, and girls, take heed and work with speed. Each task on time begin, on time begun, and work well done, the highest praise will win. Max Hill. End of chapter 59. Recording by Sarah Hale. Chapter 60 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Liz Trollinger, Vienna, Virginia. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 60 The Little Protector. He was such a little fellow, but he was desperately in earnest when he marched into the store that snowy morning. Straight up to the first clerk he went. I want to see the Priator, he said. The clerk wanted to smile, but the little face before her was so grave that she answered solemnly. He is sitting at his desk. The little fellow walked up to the man at the desk. Mr. Martin, the proprietor, turned around. Good morning, little man. Did you want to see me? he asked. Yes, sir. I want a wrap for my mamma. I can make fires and pay for it. What is your name, my boy? Paul May. Is your father living? No, sir. He died when we lived in Louisville. How long have you lived here? We haven't been here long. Mamma was sick in Louisville, and the doctor told her to go away and she would get well. Is she better? Yes, sir. Last Sunday she wanted to go to church, but she didn't have any wrap, and she cried. She didn't think I saw her, but I did. She says I'm her little protector since Papa died. I can make fires and pay for a wrap. But, little man, the store is steam-heated. I wonder if you could clean the snow off the wall. Yes, sir, Paul answered quickly. Very well. I'll write your mamma a note and explain our bargain. When the note was written, Mr. Martin arose. Come, Paul, I will get the wrap, he said. At the counter he paused. How large is your mother, Paul? he asked. Paul glanced about him. About as large as her, he said, pointing toward a lady clerk. Miss Smith, please see if this fits you, requested Mr. Martin. Paul's eyes were shining. Miss Smith put on the wrap and turned about for Paul to see it. Do you like it? she asked him. Yes, I do, he answered very emphatically. The wrap was marked twelve dollars, but kind-hearted Mr. Martin said, You may have it for five dollars, Paul. Take it to Pauline and have her take the price tag off, he added to Miss Smith. When she brought the bundle back to him, he put it in Paul's arms. Take it to your mamma, Paul. When the snow stops falling, come and sweep off the walk. I will pay you a dollar each time you clean it. We shall soon have enough to pay for the wrap. Yes, sir, answered Paul gravely. He took the bundle and trudged out into the snow. When he reached home, his mother looked in surprise at his bundle. Where have you been, dear? I went to town, Mama, Paul answered. He put the note into her hand. She opened it and read, Miss May, this little man has bought a wrap for you. He says he is your protector. For his sake, keep the wrap and let him work to pay for it. It will be a great pleasure to him. He has the making of a fine man in him, William Martin. Paul was astonished to see tears in his mother's eyes. He had thought she would be so happy, and she was crying. She put her arm about him and kissed him. Then she put on the wrap and told how pretty she thought it. When the snow stopped falling, Paul went down to the store and cleaned the snow from the front walk. He did not know that Mr. Martin's hired man swept it again, for the little arms were not strong enough to sweep it quite clean. The days passed, and one morning Paul had a very sore throat. "'You mustn't get up today, dear,' his mother said. When she brought his breakfast, she found him crying. "'What is making you cry? Is your throat hurting much?' "'No, Mama." Don't you see it is snowing, and I can't go and clean the walk, cried Paul. Shall I write a note to Mr. Martin and explain why you are not there? Yes, please, Mama. Who will take it? I'll ask Benny to leave it as he goes to school. 
the note was written and benny a neighbor boy promised to deliver it while paul was eating his dinner there was a knock at the door miss may answered it and ushered in mr martin how is the sick boy he asked he crossed the room and sat by paul he patted the boy's cheek and then turned to the mother miss may he said my wife's mother is very old but will not give up her home and live with us she says she wants a home for her children to visit she has recently lost a good housekeeper and needs another since i met paul the other day i have been wondering if you would take the housekeeper's place mother would be glad to have you and paul with her and would make things easy for you and pay you liberally i shall be very glad to accept your offer mr martin i am sorely in need of work i taught in the public school in louisville until my health failed since then i have had a hard struggle to get along answered miss may i will give you mother's address you can go out and arrange matters make haste and get well little protector said mr martin as he rose to go when he had gone the mother put her arms about her boy you are my protector she said you brought me a wrap and now you have helped me to get work to do miss p benford in the visitor end of chapter 60 recording by liz trollinger vienna virginia chapter 61 of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine layman reseda california stories worth rereading by various chapter 61 if i ought to there's a voice that's ever sounding with an echo oft rebounding in my heart a word propounding loudly speaking never still till at last my duty viewing heart replies to charge renewing let my willing change to doing if i ought to then i will max hill end of chapter 61 recording by christine layman reseda california Chapter 62 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories Worth Reading by Various. Moffat and Africaner. Robert Moffat, the poor Scottish lad, who, by living on beggar's fare, managed to get an education in theology and medicine, must evermore stand as one of the great pioneers of Central African exploration. When on the last day of October, 1816, that memorable year in missions, he set sail for the Cape of Good Hope, he was only twenty years of age. But in all the qualities that assure both maturity and heroism, he was a full-grown man. As not infrequently occurs, his greatest obstacles were found not in the hopeless paganism of the degraded tribes of the dark continent, but in the apathy, if not antipathy, of the representatives of Christian governments. The British governor would have pinned him up within the bounds of Cape Colony, lest he should complicate the relations of settlers with the tribes of the interior while fighting out this battle he studied dutch with a pious hollander that he might preach to the boers and their servants afterward when permission was obtained while traveling to the country of the Bequanas, at the close of his first day's journey he stopped at a farmhouse and offered to preach to the people that evening in the large kitchen where the service was to be held stood a long table at the head of which sat a boar with his wife and six grown children a large bible lay on the table and underneath the table half a dozen dogs the boar pointed to the bible as the signal for mr moffat to begin but after vainly waiting for others to come in he asked how soon the working people were to be called oh, working people impatiently cried the farmer you don't mean the hottentots the blacks 
you are not waiting for them surely or expecting to preach to them you might as well preach to those dogs under that table a second time more angrily he spoke repeating the offensive comparison young as mr moffat was he was disconcerted only for a moment lifting his heart to god for guidance the thought came into his mind to take a text suggested by the rude remarks of the boar so he opened the bible to the fifteenth chapter of matthew and read the twenty-seventh verse truth lord yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table pausing a moment he slowly repeated these words with his eyes steadily fixed on the face of the boar again pausing a third time he quoted these appropriate words angrily the boar cried out well bring them in a crowd of blacks then thronged the kitchen and moffat preached to them all ten years passed and the missionary was passing that way again those workpeople who held him in the most grateful remembrance seeing him ran after to thank him for telling them the way to christ in that sermon his whole life in africa was a witness of miracles of transformation he had no scorn nor contempt for the sable sons of africa he found the most degraded of them open to the impressions of the gospel and even the worst of the unimpressionable among them were compelled to confess the power of that gospel to renew one savage cruel chief who hated the missionaries had a dog that chewed and swallowed a copy of the book of psalms for the sake of the soft sheepskin in which it was bound the enraged chief declared his dog to be henceforth worthless he would no more bite or tear now that he had swallowed a christian book this godly devoted missionary preached and taught to the warlike becuanas till they put away their clubs and knives and farming utensils took the place of bows and arrows and spears this strange change in african savages came to be talked over among the people it was so wonderful that the other tribes could account for it only as an instance of supernatural magic there was nothing they knew of that would lead men like the becuanas to bring war to an end and no longer rob and kill mr Waffet was especially warned against the notorious africaner a chief whose name was the terror of the whole country some prophesied that he would be eaten by this monster others were sure that he would be killed and his skull turned into a drinking cup and his skin into the head of a drum nevertheless the heroic young missionary went straight for the crawl of the cruel marauder and murderer he was accompanied by ebner the missionary who was not in favor in africaner's court and who soon had to flee leaving mr moffat alone with a bloodthirsty monarch and a people as treacherous as their chief but god had armed his servant with a spirit not of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind he was a man of singular grace and tact he quietly but firmly planted his foot in africaner's realms and began his work he opened a school began stated services of worship and went about among the people living simply self-denyingly and prayerfully africaner himself was his first convert the wild namokwa warrior was turned into a gentle child the change in this chief was a moral miracle wolfish rapacity leonine ferocity leopardish treachery gave way before the meekness and mildness of the calf or kid his sole aim and ambition had been to rob and to slay to lead his people on expeditions for plunder and violence but he now seemed absorbed by one passion zeal for god and his missionary he set his subjects to building a house for dr moffat made him a present of cows became a regular and devout worshipper mourned heartily over his past life and habitually studied the word of god he could not do enough for the man who had led him to jesus when the missionary's life hung in the balance with african fever he nursed him through the crisis of delirium when he had to visit cape town africaner went with him knowing that a price had been set for years upon his own head as an outlaw and a public enemy no marvel that when he made his appearance in cape colony the people were astonished at the transformation 
it was even more wonderful than when saul the arch persecutor was suddenly transformed into paul the apostle mr moffat once said that during his entire residence among this people he remembered no occasion on which he had been grieved with africaner or found reason for complaint and even his very faults leaned to the side of virtue on his way to cape town with mr moffat a distance of six hundred miles the whole road lay through a country which had been laid waste by this robber and his retainers the dutch farmers could not believe that this converted man was actually africaner and one of them when he saw him lifted his hands and exclaimed this is the eighth wonder of the world great god what a miracle of thy power and grace he who had long shed blood without cause would now with as little hesitation shed his own for christ's sake when he found his own death approaching he gathered his people around him and charged them as moses and joshua did israel we are not now what we once were savages but men professing to be taught according to the gospel let us then do accordingly then with unspeakable tenderness and gentleness he counseled them to live peaceably with all men to engage in no undertaking without the advice of christian guides to remain together as one people and to receive and welcome all missionaries as sent from god then he gave them his parting blessing his dying confession would have graced the lips of the apostle of the gentiles i feel that i love god and that he has done much for me of which i am totally unworthy my former life is stained with blood but jesus christ has bought my pardon and i shall live with him through an eternity beware of falling back into the same evils into which i have so often led you but seek god and he will be found of you and direct you having said this africaner fell asleep himself having furnished one of the most unanswerable proofs that the gospel is the power of god unto salvation arthur t pearson in the miracles of missions second series copyright by funk and wagnalls company new york end of section sixty two chapter sixty three of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by liz trollinger vienna virginia stories worth rereading by various two trifles isn't aunt sue the dearest person you ever saw exclaimed helen fairmont as she and her visitor sank into a garden seat in the beautiful grounds surrounding miss armour's lovely home nothing ever seems to be too much trouble for her if she can make others happy yes answered mary sutton i just felt like giving her a good hug when she told you her plan it is really just for me that she is going to let you give the picnic here just for that very reason it will be simply fine oh she is so sweet you see two weeks ago when you wrote that finally you could arrange to visit me for the summer i was so full of the good news that i couldn't get to aunt sue's quickly enough to tell her about it somehow one always wants to tell aunt sue about things and she said she used to go to school with your mother and was very fond of her and she was all ready to like you too and that just the very minute you reached here we were both to come over i mean you and i were oh dear laughed mary I think you'd better stop and take a good long breath and get the wees and you straightened. I don't care, Helen went chattering on. You know what I mean, just what we've done. We, you and I, is that right? We're to come to her house and choose what kind of entertainment we wanted her to give, so you might meet my friends. Who thought of the garden picnic? inquired Mary, her face all animation. Then, not waiting for Helen's answer, she said enthusiastically, Isn't this a beautiful spot in which to have a picnic? The girl stopped talking long enough to look about at the pride of Miss Armour's heart, the lovely grounds round her home. They surrounded a fine old house of colonial type, for which they made a pretty setting. A double row of dignified and ancient elms flanked a pathway leading from the gate. 
The lawn on each side of the walk made one think of the answer the English gardener gave to the inquiry as to the cause of the velvety beauty of England's lawns. Why, sir, said he, we sows em and we mows em, and we mows em and we sows em. Miss Armour's lawn had the appearance of having undergone a like experience. At the back and sides of the house was a variety of shrubs and bushes whose blossoms in the spring made the place indescribably sweet. Miss Armour boasted that there were forty kinds of bushes, but her husband laughingly said that he had never been able to count more than thirty-nine and a half, for you certainly couldn't call that Japanese dwarf a whole one. June roses ran riot in season. Later, more cultivated varieties, blooming regularly through the summer, took their part in providing fragrance. Sweet, old-fashioned garden plants and more valuable products, procured at much trouble and expense, helped to make a bower that might have satisfied even more fastidious eyes than those which reveled in them now. Miss Armour's great delight was in using her garden, and she had given Helen the privilege of inviting all her young friends to picnic there the following Thursday evening. And, oh, Mary, you just can't imagine how pretty it is here with the Chinese lantern swung from tree to tree and the dainty tables scattered round. Helen scarcely contained herself. Mary laughed merrily. She was equally delighted, but naturally she took everything in a more quiet manner. Smiling at Helen's exuberance of spirit, she asked, What was it your aunt said about the sandwiches? She wants to help us make them, and she was telling me she'd like me to cut them a little more carefully than I did the last time I helped her. You'd never think Aunt Sue has a hobby, would you? No, I don't think I should. Well, she has. She's the most particular old darling about little things that you ever saw. Now those sandwiches I made, I will admit, were not cut very evenly. But dear me, they tasted good enough. Tom Canton ate six. I told her so, but she said they should have looked good too. Well, what's her hobby? I just told you. It's trifles. She says life is made of them, and trifles with the rough edges polished off make beautiful lives. And she loves to quote such things as, Trifles make perfection, but perfection is no trifle. She says trifles decide almost everything for us and shape our characters. She says it is interesting to study how most big things grow from little ones. Helen, I think she's right. Mary's dark, thoughtful eyes looked into her friend's. Oh, I don't. It isn't trifles, trifles that decide things and make the real difference. It is the big things. For instance, it is Brother Tom's education in the School of Technology that placed him in the responsible position we are all so proud of him for obtaining. Yes, but I heard him say himself that he just happened by mistake to leave one of his scribbled figures on your uncle's desk, and your uncle picking it up by mistake, too, said that a boy who could do that should have a chance at the right training. Why, that's a fact, Mary mine, said Helen in surprise. I never thought of it that way. Well, I won't agree that it happens so often, for example. Glancing about for an idea, she caught sight of a young man, a former schoolmate, passing just in front of the Armour home. For example, I don't suppose it was a trifle that made Alson Jarvis turn out the kind of individual he has become lately. He used to be a fine boy but I am afraid he is getting dissipated. He doesn't go with our crowd much now. I guess he is not invited the way he used to be before he began going with those South Town boys. I wish I could prove to you my side of the argument. Let's try your Aunt Sue's idea of studying how the big things come from little ones. Wouldn't it be interesting to find the cause of this one case? I would not be one bit surprised if it were just some little thing which was the pivot that turned him. All right, agreed Helen. I don't believe your theory. But it would be fun, as you say, to try it. Will, Will was her brother, insists Al's not so black as he has been painted lately. We will get Will to find out for us if he can. Then the talk drifted to the more absorbing subject of sandwiches and cakes. At dinner time, the two girls confided to the accommodating Will their desire to find what had changed Al. Trying to pry into private closets regardless of the kind of welcome their enclosed skeletons may accord you, are you? said Will banteringly. Mary, not accustomed to his teasing, blushed, wondering if she had really been guilty of an indelicate presumption, but Helen spoke up quickly in their defense. Now, Will, you know perfectly well it is not any such thing. As a pledge of our good faith, does that sound nice and lawyer like? Will was studying law, and Helen, too, liked to tease occasionally. 
I do affirm that if you will do that for us, I will do something nice for him on your account. Then I certainly will. It is what I have been trying to convince you for a month that you ought to do. The girls told him why it was they were so anxious to know more of Alson's private affairs. I would like to prove that your Aunt Sue and I are right, you know, said Mary. Well, said Will, turning to his sister's guest, don't let them prejudice you against Al. He is off the track just now, I know. The girls are not having much to do with him. But I have seen worse than he is. Will went off whistling. The next day, he was ready with his report. Girls, he began, Mary wins in the argument about trifles, and as a result, I am feeling pretty mean about the business. I guess I am the trifle in this case. Both girls laughed as they glanced at his six feet of length and his great, broad shoulders. Oh, it is no laughing matter, he said, good-naturedly. This is the way it happened. Washington's birthday, you know, everything in town was closed, and I thought, as Al was living in a boarding house, I would better ask Mother if I might bring him home the night before and have him spend the day here with us. We were going to have a kind of celebration anyway, you know. So about seven o'clock that evening, just before I started for the travel lecture, I ran up to Mother's room. It was on the tip of my tongue to ask her if she would not include Al in the number of her guests when I noticed that she looked pretty blue. I know she whisked away a tear, so I should not get sight of it. I pretended I didn't see it, but I said, Got some troubles, little mother? Helen knew in just what a hearty, cheerful way he said it. Not very many, dear, she said. But I didn't feel like bothering her about anything then, and decided it would do just as well to bring Al home the following Saturday night and keep him over Sunday. Will looked dubious. But it didn't do, he continued. Having nothing to keep him busy that holiday, Al went off with a crowd he had always before refused to join. A pretty gay set, I'm afraid. The man who had half-promised him the position he had been slaving for during the past year happened to see him with those people, and the very next day he informed Al very curtly that, after due consideration, he found he had no place for him. Alson guessed why, and now he feels reckless and says he might as well have the game as the name. Might as well be really bad since he has to suffer anyway. He talked in a desperate sort of way this morning when he told me about it. Somehow I feel responsible for the whole thing because I hesitated about asking mother. Will looked thoughtfully across the girls whose faces expressed real sympathy. Suddenly Helen exclaimed, The night before Washington's birthday, you say? Yes. Mother was nearly crying alone in her room? Yes. About seven o'clock? Yes. Is this a cross-examination? Then, said Helen, sitting upright and paying no attention to her brother's question, it's all my fault. How? Bridget was out that evening, and I had to stay home from the lecture to put away the dinner things, and I said I did not see why I always had to do such disagreeable things. I did not see why all our relations were rich and why we had to be always scrimping and missing everything. Of course, I repented in a little while and apologized. It made Mother feel pretty bad, I knew, but I did not think she minded it as much as that, though. It was a pretty serious mix-up all around, wasn't it, sister? Will spoke consolingly, but he looked worried. Well, came Mary's soothing tones, you must not take all the blame, for probably there were a great many more little things that had something to do with it. Al must take his share, too. Yes, perhaps, said Will but we have to take the blame that belongs to us. Helen was aghast at the enormous result of her few minutes' irritability. Such outbursts were not common with her. There was a catch in her voice as she said, Poor Al. Mary went directly to the heart of the matter. It is done, she said. It is somebody's fault, of course. But what is to be done first to rectify it? I don't know, I am sure, Helen answered musingly. I have not had a thought of anything but the garden picnic for the last two days, and I don't seem to have any idea but picnic in my head. Oh, good, ejaculated Mary. The joy of the discoverer shone in her eyes. The picnic, that is just the thing. Ask him, of course. Alson Jarvis had hidden the hurts of his schoolmates, recent slights, under a nonchalant manner. Each one, while it cut deeply, seemed to aggravate him to greater willfulness. Well-bred as he was, took no real pleasure in the sports of the company of which he had made a part since the loss of the position he so desired, and for which he had worked so faithfully. 
He felt himself disgraced and barred from the old associates, so from pure discouragement, he continued with the new. Helen Fairmont's note of invitation came as a surprise. It ran, Dear Alson, I am inviting, for Aunt Sue, a number of my friends to meet Miss Mary Sutton, my guest from Amosville. We are to have a garden picnic Thursday evening. I think you will enjoy meeting Miss Sutton, as she has the same love for golf you have, and I have already told her of the scores you made last summer. Yours sincerely, Helen Fairmont. He read it with pleasure. Then the accumulated unkindnesses of his old friends came before him. A spirit of resentment took hold of him. No, they had shown how little they cared for him. Why should he go among them again? There was plenty of other company he could enter. But why had she asked him if she did not want him? Oh, well, they were all alike anyway. Even if she had not already done so, Helen would pass him by sooner or later like so many of the others. But Will Fairmont had stuck to him. Maybe he had got his sister to pity him. Al winced at the thought. I am getting contemptible. Will Fairmont would not do that. Oh, well, I might as well be done with them all right now. His eyes flashed defiantly. Then he caught sight of the little note. Friendly enough, he said. Sounds as honest and sincere as her brother. Then he added, I might give her the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. Yes, I will go, if for no other reason than that she is Will's sister. He went, and he enjoyed himself thoroughly, thanks partially to Miss Armour's knowledge of human nature. Where others saw only weakness, she found smarting hurts. She felt that he was on dangerous ground, that he was ashamed of himself, and that his self-pride and self-respect needed propping, and she immediately proceeded to prop them. Helen's grief over her own unsuspected part in his career resulted in an especial effort to make the picnic a pleasure and success for him. With that kindly compliance which is more common in those about us than we sometimes think, the other young people accepted the idea of Alson's being one of them again, and he found himself, before the termination of the evening, on almost his old footing with them. "'Wasn't it a success all around?' said Mary that night. "'I congratulate you, Helen, on your ability to extend real hospitality. It was just lovely. They did seem to have a good time, didn't they?' Al Jarvis was on my conscience all the evening. Do you think he enjoyed himself? Yes, I do, Helen. After what I did, it was such a little return to make. Simultaneously, the girls laughed. Trifles again, they keep bobbing up, don't they? I suppose this is one of those of little consequence. Time will tell, sententiously quoted Mary. Time did tell. Years afterward, two successful lawyers sat in an office one congratulating the other on his brilliant speech of the day. It might never have been, Will, said Alison Jarvis, if your aunt hadn't somehow, without a single definite word on the subject, shown me the broken road down which I had about decided to travel through. It was at a party she had in her grounds one night long ago for your sister and Mary Sutton. Do you remember it? Did he? Will's heart glowed with pleasure and gratitude as he thought of the great results of Mary's little suggestion about inviting Al. How unlike this was the outcome of that miserable trifle which had played so important a part in the lawyer's experience. Elizabeth Golden in The Wellspring End of chapter 63 Recording by Liz Trollinger, Vienna, Virginia Chapter 64 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Finish Thy Work. No other hand thy special task can do though trivial it may seem to thee thou canst not shirk god-given work and still be blessed of heaven from sin be free o idler in life's ripened harvest field perform thy task that rich thy work may yield ah sweet the thought that comes at set of sun 
if finished is the work of that one day but oh the joy without alloy awaiting him who at life's close can say i'm ready father to go home to thee the work is finished which thou gavest me mrs m a loper end of chapter sixty four Chapter 65 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb K. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Authors. A Second Trial from Our Dumb Animals. A College Scene. It was commencement day at a college. The people were pouring into the church as I entered. Finding the choice seats already taken, I pressed onward, looking to the right and the left for a vacancy, and on the very front row I found one. Here a little girl moved along to make room for me, looking into my face with large gray eyes, whose brightness was softened by very long lashes. Her face was open and fresh as a newly blown rose. Again and again I found my eyes turning to the rose-like face, and each time the gray eyes moved, half-smiling, to meet mine. Evidently the child was ready to make friends with me, and when, with a bright smile, she returned my dropped handkerchief, we seemed fairly introduced. "'There is going to be a great crowd,' she said to me. "'Yes,' I replied. "'People always like to see how schoolboys are made into men.' Her face beamed with pleasure and pride as she said, "'My brother is going to graduate. He's going to speak. I have brought these flowers to throw at him.' They were not greenhouse favorites, but just old-fashioned domestic flowers, such as we associate with dear grandmothers. "'But,' I thought, they will seem sweet and beautiful to him for his little sister's sake. That is my brother, she went on, pointing with her nosegay. The one with the light hair, I asked. Oh, no, she said, smiling and shaking her head in innocent reproof. Not that homely one with red hair. That handsome one with brown, wavy hair. His eyes look brown, too, but they are not. They are dark blue. There, he's got his hand up to his head now. You see him, don't you? In an eager way, she looked from him to me as if some important fate depended on my identifying her brother. I see him, I said. He is a very good-looking brother. Yes, he is beautiful, she said with artless delight. And he is good, and he started so hard. He has taken care of me ever since Mama died. Here is his name on the program. He is not the valedictorian, but he has an honor for all that. I saw in the little creature's familiarity with these technical college terms that she had closely identified herself with her brother's studies, hopes, and successes. He thought at first, she continued, that he would write on the romance of monastic life. What a strange sound those long words had, whispered from her childish lips. Her interest in her brother's work had stamped them on the child's memory, and to her they were ordinary things. But then, she went on, he decided he would write on historical parallels, and he has a real good oration and says it beautifully. He has said it to me a great many times, I almost know it by heart. Oh, it begins so pretty and grand. This is the way it begins, she added, encouraged by the interest she must have seen on my face. Amid the combinations of actors and forces that make up the great kaleidoscope of history, we often find a turn of destiny's hand. Why, bless the baby, I thought, looking down into her proud face. I cannot describe how very odd and elfish it did seem to have those sonorous words rolling out the smiling mouth. The band striking up put an end to the quotation and to the confidences. As the exercises progressed and approached nearer and nearer the effort on which all her interest was concentrated, my little friend became excited and restless. Her eyes grew larger and brighter. Two deep red spots glowed on her cheek. She touched up the flowers, manifestly making the offering ready for the shrine. Now it's his turn, she said, turning to me in a face in which pride and delight and anxiety seemed equally mingled. But when the overture was played through and his name was called, the child seemed, in her eagerness, to forget me and all the earth except him. She rose to her feet and leaned forward for a better view of her beloved as he mounted to the speaker's stand. I knew by her deep breathing that her heart was throbbing in her throat. I knew, too, by the way her brother came to the front that he was trembling. The hands hung limp, his face was pallid, and the lips blue, as with cold. I felt anxious. The child, too, seemed to discern that things were not well with him. Something like fear showed in her face. He made an automatic bow. Then a bewildered, struggling look came into his face, then a helpless look, 
and he stood staring vacantly, like a somnambulist, at the waiting audience. The moments of painful suspense went by, and he still stood as if struck down. I saw how it was. He had been seized with stage fright. Alas, little sister. She turned her large, dismayed eyes on me. He's forgotten it, she said. Then a swift change came over her face, a strong, determined look, and on the funeral-like silence of the room broke the sweet child's voice. Amid the combinations of actors and forces that make up the clay kaleidoscope of history, we often find that a turn of destiny's hand. Everybody about us turned and looked. The breathless silence, the sweet childish voice, the childish face, the long unchildlike words produced a weird effect. But the help had come too late. The unhappy brother was already staggering in humiliation from the stage. The band quickly struck up, and waves of lively music were rolled out to cover the defeat. I gave the sister a glance, in which I meant to show the intense sympathy which I felt, but she did not see me. Her eyes, swimming with tears, were on her brother's face. I put my arm around her. She was too absorbed to feel the caress, and before I could appreciate her purpose, she was on her way to the shame-stricken young man, sitting with a face like a statue's. When he saw her by his side, the set face relaxed, and a quick mist came into his eyes. The young men got closer together to make room for her. She sat down beside him laid her flowers upon his knee, and slipped her hand into his. I could not keep my eyes from her sweet, pitying face. I saw her whisper to him, he bending a little to catch her word. Later I found out that she was asking him if he knew his piece now, and that he answered yes. When the young man next on the list had spoken, and the band was playing, the child, to the brother's great surprise, made her way up the platform steps, and pressed through the throng of professors, trustees, and distinguished visitors to the president. "'If you please, sir,' she said, with a little curtsy, "'will you and the trustees let my brother try again? He knows his beast now.' For a moment the president stared at her through his gold-bowed spectacles, and then, appreciating the child's petition, he smiled on her, and went down and spoke to the young man who had failed. So it happened that when the band had again ceased playing, it was briefly announced that Mr. Duane would now deliver his oration. Historic Parallels. Amid the combinations of actors and forces that... This the little sister whispered to him as he arose to answer the summons. A ripple of heightened and expectant interest passed over the audience, and then all sat stone still as if fearing to breathe lest the speaker might again take fright. No danger. The hero in the youth was aroused. He went at his peace with a set purpose to conquer, to redeem himself and to bring back the smile into the child's tear-stained face. I watched the face during the speaking. The wide eyes, the parted lips, the whole rapt being, said the breathless audience was forgotten, that her spirit was moving with his. And when the address was ended, with the ardent abandon of one who catches enthusiasm, in the realization that he was fighting down a wrong judgment and conquering a sympathy, the effect was really thrilling. That dignified audience broke into rapturous applause. Bouquets intended for the valedictorian rained like a tempest, and the child who had helped save the day, that one beaming little face in its pride and gladness is something to be forever remembered. End of A Second Trial Recording by Deb K. Chapter 66 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter 66. The Sin of Extravagance. It may be a folly, but you would not think of calling extravagance a sin, asked a young man of his minister. I do not care to offend you by harsh terms, but if we agree that it is a folly, that is reason enough for wishing to be wiser. "'But it is very easy to spend money when one is with others, and one does not like to be called tight.' "'John,' said the minister, "'I do not propose to argue with you, but I want to tell you two stories, both of them true, recent, and out of my own experience. They will illustrate the reason why, knowing you as well as I do, having baptized you and received you into the church, I cannot view without concern your growing extravagance, and the company into which it leads you and the interests from which it tends to separate you.' A few months ago, a young man came to this city, and spent his first days here under my own roof. I have known his father for many years, an earnest, faithful man, 
who has denied himself for that boy and prayed for him and done everything that a father ought. I chanced to remember a word which his father spoke to me a number of years ago, when the boy was a young lad, and was recovering from a sickness that made it seem possible he would need a change of a climate. I happened to remember meeting his father, who told me of this, and how he was arranging in his own mind to change his business, to make any sacrifice, to move to the ends of the earth if necessary, for that boy's sake. The boy is not a bad boy, but he had not been in my home an hour before he asked me for the address of a tailor, and when his new suit came, a suit which I thought he might very well have waited to earn, it was silk lined throughout. I do not believe the suit which his father wears as he passes to the plate in church every Sunday is silk lined. I knew what the boy was to earn, and could estimate what he could afford, and I knew that he could not buy that suit out of his own earnings. I had a letter from his father a few days ago. Shall I read it to you? It is very short. It reads as follows. My dear friend, I hope you will never know how hard it is for me to write to you to say that you must not under any circumstances lend money to my dear boy. And those last three words make it the more pathetic. The second story, too, is recent. Another boy, from another state, came to this city, and for the first few Sundays attended our church. We tried to interest him in good things. We liked him and did our best for him. I saw little in him to disturb me, except that he was spending more money than I could think he earned. Recently I received a letter from his father. It is longer, and I will not read it, but will tell you the substance of it. He wrote saying that his son was employed in a business where, with economy, he ought to be able to make a living from the start, and with hope for advancement, but that from the first week he had written home for money. Not only so, but the father had all too good reason to believe that the boy was still leaving bills unpaid. The father wrote to ask me whether he could not arrange with someone connected with the church to receive the boy's money from home, week by week, and see that it was applied to the uses for which it was sent. He added that he would be glad to consider himself a contributor to the church during the period of this arrangement. I had little hope that any arrangement of this kind would help matters, but I took it as indicating that the boy needed looking after, and I sent at once to look him up. Where do you think we found him? In jail. These are not imaginary stories, nor are they of a remote past. And I see other young men for whom I am anxious. Wear the coat a little longer, but pay for it out of your own money. Be considered tight if necessary, but live within your means. It is good sense. More than that, it is good religion. And now I will answer your question, or rather, you may answer it. Is extravagance merely a folly, or is it also a sin? What do you think? Youth's Companion End of chapter 66「Chapter sixty seven of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. Chapter sixty seven. A Little Child's Work. Near one of the tiny schoolhouses of the West is a carefully tended mound, the object of the tenderest interest on the part of a man known far and wide as Preacher Jim, a rough, unministerial looking person, who yet has reached the hearts and lives of many of the men and women in that region, and has led them to know the master whom he serves in his humble fashion. Twenty years ago, Preacher Jim was a different man. Rough and untaught, his only skill was shown by the dexterity with which he manipulated the cards that secured to him his livelihood. Then, as now, he was widely known, but in those days his title was Gambler Jim. It was during a long, tiresome trip across the Rockies that a clergyman and his wife, having undressed their little boy and tucked him snugly into his berth, repaired to the observation car in order to watch the November heavens. An hour passed swiftly. Then suddenly a rough-looking fellow made his way toward the group of which the clergyman was one. "'Anybody here got a kid what's dressed in a red nightgown and sings like a bird?' he demanded, awkwardly. The father and mother sprang excitedly to their feet, gasping in fear. The man nodded reassuringly. "'They ain't nothing the matter of him,' he said, with yet deeper embarrassment. "'The matter's with... us. You're a parson, ain't you? The kid, he's been singing to us and talking.' "'If you don't mind, we'd take it mighty good of you to come with me. "'Not you, ma'am. The kid's all safe, and the parson'll bring him back in a little while.' 
With a word to his wife, the minister followed his guide toward the front of the train, and on through car after car until thirteen of them had been traversed. As the two men opened the door of the smoking compartment, they stopped to look and listen. Up on one of the tables stood the tiny boy, his face flushed, his voice shrill and sweet. "'Is you ready?' he cried insistently. "'My papa says the bridegroom is Jesus, and he wants everybody to be ready when he comes just cause he loves you.' Then, with a childish sweetness, came the song which had evidently made the deepest impression upon the child's mind. "'Are you ready for the bridegroom when he comes?' "'He sung it over and over,' whispered the clergyman's companion, "'and I couldn't stand no more. He said you'd pray, parson.' As the two approached, the boy lifted his sweet, serious eyes to his father's. "'They want to get ready,' he said, simply. And his boy snuggled childishly in his arms, the minister prayed, as he had never prayed before, for the men gathered about the child. It was only a few moments before the clergyman bore the child back to the sleeping car, where the mother anxiously awaited his coming. Then he returned to talk with the men, four of whom decided that night to get ready, and among them was, of course, the man who sought out the father of the child, Gambler Jim. To this day it remains a mystery how the child succeeded in reaching the smoking car unnoticed and unhindered. As for the little fellow himself, his work was early done. For a few weeks later, upon the return trip through the mountains, he was suddenly stricken with a swift and terrible disease, and the parents tenderly laid the little form under the sod near the schoolhouse where preacher Jim now tells so often the story which never grows old. Youth's Companion End of chapter 67《Chapter 68 of Stories Worth Rereading》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Elizabeth Arndt. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Authors. Chapter 68 Christ is Coming. Little children, Christ is coming, coming through the flaming sky to convey his trusting children to their glorious home on high. Do you love the Lord's appearing? Are you waiting for the day when with all his shining angels he will come in grand array? All who keep the Ten Commandments will rejoice his face to see, but the wicked, filled with anguish, from his presence then will flee. Now while yet probation lingers, now while mercy's voice is heard, haste to give your heart to Jesus, seek to understand his word. Quickly help to spread the message, you to Christ some soul may turn, though the multitudes his goodness and his tender love may spurn. Little children, Christ is coming, even God's beloved Son, when in glory he descendeth, will he say to you, Well done. Dora Burson End of chapter 68《Chapter sixty nine of Stories Worth Rereading》this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b stories worth rereading by various chapter sixty nine the handy box grandmother do you know where i can find a little bit of wire asked marjorie running from the shed where an amateur circus was in preparation. Grandmother went to a little closet in the room and disappeared a moment, coming out presently with the wire. Oh, yes, and Fred wanted me to ask you if you had a large safety pin. Marjorie looked a little wistful, as if she did not quite like to bother Grandmother. There was another trip made to the closet, and the safety pin was in Marjorie's hand. You are a pretty nice grandma, she said over her shoulder, as she ran out. Not very long after, Marjorie came into the kitchen again. This time she stood beside the sink where Grandmother was washing dishes, and twisted her little toes in her sandals, but seemed afraid to speak. Fred wants to know, began Grandmother laughing. Yes, um, said Marjorie, blushing. If I can't find him a piece of strong string, finished Grandmother. Oh, no, it's a little brass tack declared marjorie soberly she was a patient loving grandmother and she went to the little closet again 
marjorie could hardly believe her eyes when she saw the tacks for there were three he said she began slowly and stopped you ought to tell him to come and say it himself and grandmother laughed but we will forgive him this time was it thank you he said he feels thank you awfully i'm sure said marjorie politely but what he said was that if it wasn't too much bother well he could use a kind of hook thing her grandmother produced a long iron hook and marjorie looked at her wonderingly are you a fairy she asked timidly you must have a wand and just make things grandmother laughed come here she said and she opened the little dark closet and from the shelf took a long wooden box this she brought to the table and when she opened it marjorie gave a little cry of delight it seemed to her that there was a little of everything in it there were bits of string pins colored paper bobbins balls pieces of felt and every sort of useful thing generally thrown away when i knew my grandchildren were coming here to spend the summer she said i began on this box and whenever i find anything astray that would naturally be thrown out i just put it in do you want me to help save too asked marjorie who thought the story should have a moral you must start a handy box of your own when you go back and keep it in the nursery you don't know how many times a day you will be able to help the others out a little darning yarn an odd thimble a bit of soft linen and all the things that clutter and would be thrown away go to fill up a handy box you can be the good fairy of the nursery it is just wonderful said marjorie if i had a little just a little wooden box i would begin to-day and when i go home i can have a larger one grandmother smiled and brought out a smaller wooden box just the right size from that moment marjorie was a collector and her usefulness began mira jenks stafford in youth's companion end of chapter sixty nine Chapter 70 of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. The Result of Disobedience. My parents and their six children, including myself, lived in Flintville, Wisconsin, near the Swamaco River and Pond, where a great number of logs had been floated in for lumber. On the opposite side from us were woods, where winter green berries were plentiful. One pleasant Sunday morning in October 1857, one of our playmates came to ask mother if we, my older sister, a younger brother, and I, might go with her to pick some of these berries mother said we might go if we would go down the river and cross the bridge she knew that we had crossed the pond several times on the logs but the water was unusually high for that time of the year and there was danger in crossing that way we promised to cross by the bridge really intending when we left home to do so mother let my two younger sisters one four and the other six years old go with us we left the house as happy as could be my mother smiled as she stood in the door and watched us go she had always trusted us and we seldom disobeyed her but this time we had our playmate with us and she had been in the habit of having her own way as she was a little older than we were we thought that what she said or did was all right we had gone but a short distance when this girl whose name was louise suggested that we run across the logs and get to the berries so much the sooner we reminded her of what our mother had told us but she said your mother doesn't know how snug the logs are piled in and it would be such fun and no danger to cross on them we began to look at the matter in the same way and after playing a few minutes we started across i took one of my little sisters and louise was going to take the younger one but as she was about to start her brother whom she had not seen for some time drove up and took her home with him my brother thinking he could take our little sister across started with her but i called to him to go back and wait for me to do it 
for I was then about half way over. The stream was not wide, and he thought he could take her over as well as I. Just as I started back, oh, what a sight met my eyes! I saw my little sister slip off the log into the water. I ran to catch her, but was not quick enough. As I reached for her, my brother and I both rolled from the log into the water with her. Then my sister, who had been standing on the bank to see if we got over safely, came to our rescue, but we were so frightened that we caught hold of her, and instead of her pulling us out, we pulled her in with us. By that time, our screams had reached our mother's ears, and she came running to see what the trouble was. She saw only one of us, as the others were under water, or nearly so, and supposing there was only one in the water, she came on the logs to help. By the time she got to us, the logs were under motion, so that she could not stand on them, and she too fell into the water. The six-year-old sister, whom I had taken across, saw it all and made an attempt to come to us. Mother called to her to go back. She turned back and reached the shore all right. Just as mother spoke, she felt something come against her feet. She raised her foot with the weight and caught the dress of little Emmeline, who was thinking for the last time. Mother managed to hold her till help came. It being Sunday, nearly every man that lived near was away from home. Fortunately, a Mr. Flint, who had company visiting him, was at home. The men were eating their dinner when a woman who had seen us in the water rushed into the dining room and told them that Mr. Tripp's family were in the mill pond drowning. They rushed from the table, tripping it over and breaking some dishes. When they reached us, the logs and water were so disturbed that nothing could be done for us until boards were brought to lay on the logs. During this time, I had caught hold of a log that was crowded between others, so I could pull myself up without rolling, but could get no farther. My sister Sarah and brother Willard were held ashore. Emmeline, whom mother had been trying hard to hold up, was taken out but showed no signs of life. She was laid on a log while they helped mother out. As soon as mother saw Emmeline, she told the men to turn her on her stomach. They then saw that there was life. She was quickly taken to the house and cared for by an old lady. We called on Betsy, who had come to help. While taking mother to shore, the nine men who had come to our rescue fell into the water. They all had to walk on the same long board to get to shore. The boards have been placed so very quickly it was not noticed until too late that one was unsafe. The men were near enough to shore where they fell in so that they could touch bottom and were not long in getting out. Mother had to be taken home where she was cared for by the best help we could procure. It was impossible to get a doctor where we lived in those days. Little Emmeline and mother were watched over all night and at sunrise the next morning they were pronounced out of danger. The men who fell in got off with only an unpleasant wetting. The water was quite cold. The pond froze over the following night. They did not start for home that day, as they were intending to do, but spent the rest of the day drying their clothing. About noon, our father, who had been away for three days, came home. When he heard the story of our disaster, he wept and thanked God for sparing our lives. All this happened because we did not obey our mother, and we children never forgot the lesson. Mrs. M. J. Lawrence End of chapter 70 Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 71 of Stories Worth Rereading This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories Worth Rereading by Various Chapter 71 Likes and Dislikes I had a little talk today, an argument with Dan and Ike. First, Dan, he said twas not his way to do the things he didn't like. And Ike, he said that Dan was wrong that only cowards dodged and hid, because it made him brave and strong the things he didn't like, he did. But then I showed to Ike and Dan, 
an easy way between the two i always try as best i can to like the things i have to do arthur geiterman in youth's companion end of chapter 71《Chapter 72 of Stories Worth Rereading》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. — Stories Worth Rereading by Various Livingston's Bodyguard the work of David Livingston in Africa was so far that of a missionary explorer and general that the field of his labor is too broad to permit us to trace individual harvests. No one man can quickly scatter seed over so wide an area. But there is one marvelous story connected with his death, the like of which has never been written on the scroll of human history. All the ages may safely be challenged to furnish its parallel. On the night of his death he called for Susie, his faithful servant, and after some tender ministries had been rendered to the dying man, Livingston said, All right, you may go out now. And Susie reluctantly left him alone. At four o'clock the next morning, May 1st, Susie and Chuma, with four other devoted attendants, anxiously entered that grass hut at Ilala. The candle was still burning, but the greater light of life had gone out. Their great master, as they called him, was on his knees, his body stretched forward, his head buried in his hands upon the pillow. With silent awe they stood apart and watched him, lest they should invade the privacy of prayer. But he did not stir. There was not even the motion of breathing but a suspicious rigidity of inaction. Then one of them, Matthew, softly came near and gently laid his hands upon Livingston's cheeks. It was enough. The chill of death was there. The great father of Africa's dark children was dead, and they were orphans. The most refined and cultured Englishmen would have been perplexed as to what course to take. They were surrounded by superstitious and unsympathetic savages, to whom the unburied remains of the dead man would be an object of dread. His native land was six thousand miles away, and even the coast was fifteen hundred. A grave responsibility rested upon these simple-minded sons of the dark continent, to which few of the wisest would have been equal. Those remains, with his valuable journals, instruments, and personal effects, must be carried to Zanzibar, but the body must first be preserved from decay, and they had no skill nor facilities for embalming, and if preserved there were no means of transportation, no roads nor carts, no beasts of burden being available, the body must be borne on the shoulders of human beings, and as no strangers could be trusted, they must themselves undertake the journey and the sacred charge. These humble children of the forest were grandly equal to the occasion, and they resolved among themselves to carry the body to the seashore and not give it into other hands until they could surrender it to his countrymen. Moreover, to ensure safety to the remains and security to the bearers, it must be done with secrecy. They would gladly have kept secret even their master's death, but the fact could not be concealed. God, however, disposed Chitambo and his subjects to permit these servants of the great missionary to prepare his emaciated body for its last journey, in a hut built for the purpose on the outskirts of the village. Now watch these black men as they rudely embalm the body of him who had been to them a savior. They tenderly open the chest and take out the heart and viscera. These they, with a poetic and pathetic sense of fitness, reserved for his beloved Africa. The heart that for thirty-three years had beat for her welfare must be buried in her bosom. And so one of the Nesik boys, Jacob Wainwright, read the simple service of burial 
and under the mula tree at Ilala that heart was deposited, and that tree, carved with a simple inscription, became his monument. Then the body was prepared for its long journey. The cavity was filled with salt, brandy poured into the mouth, and the corpse laid out in the sun for fourteen days, and so was reduced to the condition of a mummy. Afterward it was thrust into a hollow cylinder of bark. Over this was sewed a covering of canvas. The whole package was securely lashed to a pole, and so at last was ready to be borne between two men upon their shoulders. As yet the enterprise was scarcely begun, the most difficult part of their task was before them. The sea was far away, and the path lay through a territory where nearly every fifty miles would bring them to a new tribe to face new difficulties. Nevertheless, Susi and Chuma took up their precious burden, and looking to Livingston's God for help, began the most remarkable funeral march on record. They followed the track their master had marked with his footsteps when he penetrated to Lake Bangueola, passing to the south of Lake Lumbi, which is a continuation of Tanganyika, then crossing to Unyanyembe, where it was found out that they were carrying a dead body. Shelter was hard to get, or even food, and at Kasakera they could get nothing for which they asked, except on condition that they would bury the remains they were carrying. Now indeed their love and generalship were put to a new test, but again they were equal to the emergency. They made up another package like the precious burden, only it contained branches instead of human bones, and this with mock solemnity they bore on their shoulders to a safe distance, scattered the contents far and wide in the brushwood, and came back without the bundle. Meanwhile, others of their party had repacked the remains, doubling them up into the semblance of a bale of cotton cloth, and so they once more managed to procure what they needed and go on with their charge. The true story of that nine months' march has never been written, and it never will be, for the full data cannot be supplied. But here is material waiting for some coming English Homer or Milton to crystallize into one of the world's noblest epics, and it deserves the master hand of a great poet artist to do it justice. See these black men, whom some scientific philosophers would place at one remove from the gorilla, run all manner of risks by day and night for forty weeks, now going around by circuitous route to resort to stratagem to get their precious burden through the country, sometimes forced to fight their foes in order to carry out their holy mission. Follow them as they ford the rivers and travel trackless deserts, facing torrid heat and drenching tropical storms, daring perils from wild beasts and relentless wild men, exposing themselves to the fatal fever and burying several of their little band on the way. Yet on they went patient and persevering, never fainting nor halting, until love and gratitude had done all that could be done, and they laid down at the feet of the British consul on the 12th of March, 1874, all that was left of Scotland's great hero. When a little more than a month later the coffin of Livingston was landed in England, April 15th, it was felt that no less a shrine than Britain's greatest burial place could fitly hold such precious dust. But so improbable and incredible did it seem that a few rude Africans could actually have done this splendid deed, at such cost of time and such risk, that not until the fractured bones of the arm, which the lion crush at Jabotza thirty years before, identified the body, was certain that this was Livingston's corpse. And then, on the 18th of April, 1874, such a funeral cortege entered the great abbey of Britain's illustrious dead as few warriors or heroes or princes ever drew to that mausoleum. The faithful body servants who had religiously brought home every relic of the person or property of the great missionary explorer were accorded places of honor. And well they might be. No triumphal procession of earth's mightiest conqueror ever equaled for sublimity that lonely journey through Africa's forests. An example of tenderness, gratitude, devotion, and heroism equal to this the world had never seen. The exquisite inventiveness of a love that lavished tears as water on the feet of Jesus, and made tresses of hair a towel. 
and broke the alabaster flask for his anointing the feminine tenderness that lifted his mangled body from the cross and wrapped it in new linen with costly spices and laid it in a virgin tomb have at length been surpassed by the ingenious devotion of the crushed sons of canaan the grandeur and pathos of that burial scene amid the stately columns and arches of england's famous abbey pale in lustre when contrasted with that simpler scene near ilala when in god's greater cathedral of nature whose columns and arches are the trees whose surpliced choir are the singing birds whose organ is the moaning wind the grassy carpet was lifted and dark hands laid livingston's heart to rest in that great cortege that moved up the nave no truer nobleman was found than that black man susi who in illness had nursed the ballantyre hero had laid his heart in africa's bosom and whose hand was now upon his pall let those who doubt and deride christian missions to the degraded children of africa who tell us that it is not worth while to sacrifice precious lives for the sake of these doubly lost millions of the dark continent let such tell us whether it is not worth while at any cost to seek out and save men with whom such christian heroism is possible burn on thou humble candle burn within thy hut of grass though few may be the pilgrim feet through ilala pass god's hand hath lit thee long to shine and shed thy holy light till the new day dawn pour its beams o'er africa's long midnight arthur t pearson in the miracles of missions second series end of chapter seventy two chapter seventy three of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen stories worth rereading by various spare moments a lean awkward boy came to the door of the principal of a celebrated school one morning and asked to see him the servant eyed his mean clothes and thinking he looked more like a beggar than anything else told him to go around to the kitchen the boy did as he was bidden and soon appeared at the back door i should like to see mr slade said he you want a breakfast more like said the servant girl and i can give you that without troubling him thank you said the boy i should like to see mr slade if he can see me some old clothes maybe you want remarked the servant again eyeing the boy's patched clothes i guess he has none to spare he gives away a sight and without minding the boy's request she went about her work may i see mr slade again asked the boy after finishing his bread and butter well he is in the library if he must be disturbed he must he does not like to be alone sometimes said the girl in a peevish tone she seemed to think it very foolish to admit such a fellow into her master's presence however she wiped her hands and bade him follow opening the library door she said here's somebody sir who is dreadful anxious to see you and so i let him in i do not know how the boy introduced himself or how he opened the business but i know that after talking a while the principal put aside the volume that he was studying and took up some greek books and began to examine the boy the examination lasted for some time every question the principal asked was answered promptly upon my word exclaimed the principal you do well looking at the boy from head to foot over his spectacles why my boy where did you pick up so much in my spare moments answered the boy here was a poor hard-working boy with few opportunities for schooling it almost fitted for college by simply improving his spare moments truly our spare moments the gold dust of time how precious they should be regarded what account can you give for your spare moments what can you show for them look and see this boy can tell you how very much can be laid up by improving them and there are many very many other boys i am afraid in jail and in the house of correction in the forecastle of a whale-ship in the gambling-house 
in the tippling shop who if you should ask them when they began their sinful course might answer in my spare moments in my spare moments i gambled for marbles in my spare moments i began to swear and drink it was in my spare moments that i began to steal chestnuts from the old woman's stand it was in my spare moments that i gathered with wicked associates then be very careful how you spend your spare moments the tempter always hunts you out in small seasons like these when you are not busy he gets into your hearts if he possibly can in such gaps there he hides himself planning all sorts of mischief take care of your spare moments selected end of spare moments chapter seventy four of stories worth rereading this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen stories worth rereading by various a gold medal right and generous deeds are not always rewarded nor always recognized but the doing of them is our duty even though they pass unnoticed sometimes however a noble unselfish manly act is met by a reward that betrays on the part of the giver the same praiseworthy spirit as that which prompted the act do right be courteous be noble though man may never express his appreciation the god of right will in his own good time give the reward i shall never forget a lesson i once received we saw a boy named watson driving a cow to pasture in the evening he drove her back again we did not know where this was continued several weeks the boys attending the school were nearly all sons of wealthy parents and some of them were dunces enough to look with disdain on a student who had to drive a cow with admirable good nature watson bore all their attempts to annoy him i suppose watson said jackson another boy one day i suppose your father intends to make a milkman of you why not asked watson oh nothing only don't leave much water in the cans after you rinse them that's all the boys laughed and watson not in the least mortified replied never fear if ever i am a milkman i'll give good measure and good milk the day after this conversation there was a public examination at which ladies and gentlemen from the neighboring towns were present and prizes were awarded by the principal of our school both watson and jackson received a credible number for in respect to scholarship they were about equal after the ceremony of distribution the principal remarked that there was one prize consisting of a gold medal which was rarely awarded not so much on account of its great cost as because the instances were rare which rendered its bestowal proper it was the prize of heroism the last medal was awarded about three years ago to a boy in the first class who rescued a poor girl from drowning the principal then said that with the permission of the company he would relate a short anecdote not long ago some boys were flying a kite in the street just as a poor lad on horseback rode by on his way to the mill the horse took fright and threw the boy injuring him so badly that he was carried home and confined some weeks to his bed of the boys who had unintentionally caused the disaster none followed to learn the fate of the wounded lad there was one boy however who witnessed the accident from a distance who not only went to make inquiries but stayed to render service this boy soon learned that the wounded boy was the grandson of a poor widow whose sole support consisted in selling the milk of a cow of which she was the owner she was old and lame and her grandson on whom she depended to drive her cow to the pasture was now helpless with his bruises never mind said the friendly boy i will drive the cow but his kindness did not stop there money was wanted to get articles from the apothecary i have money that my mother sent me to buy boots with said he but i can do without them for a while oh no said the old woman i can't consent to that but here is a pair of heavy boots that i bought for thomas who can't wear them if you would only buy these we should get on nicely the boy bought the boots clumsy as they were and has worn them up to this time well when it was discovered by the other boys at the school 
that our student was in the habit of driving a cow he was assailed every day with laughter and ridicule his cowhide boots in particular were made matter of mirth but he kept on cheerfully and bravely day after day never shunning observation driving the widow's cow and wearing his thick boots he never explained why he drove the cow for he was not inclined to make a boast of his charitable motives it was by mere accident that his kindness and self-denial were discovered by his teacher and now ladies and gentlemen i ask you was there not true heroism in this boy's conduct nay master watson do not get out of sight behind the blackboard you are not afraid of ridicule you must not be afraid of praise as watson with blushing cheeks came forward a round of applause spoke the general approbation and the medal was presented to him amid the cheers of the audience the children's own end of a gold medal Chapter seventy five of Stories Worth Rereading. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Stories Worth Rereading by Various. A Girl's Railway Acquaintance. Most young people do not adequately realize what consummate address and fair seeming can be assumed by a deceiving stranger until experience enlightens them and they suffer for their credulity the danger especially to young girls travelling alone is understood by their parents and no daughter is safe who disregards their injunction to permit no advances by a new and self-introduced acquaintance either man or woman a lady gave some years ago in one of the religious papers an experience of her own when she was a girl which shows one of the artful ways by which designing men win the confidence of the innocent travelling from boston to new york she had the company of a girl friend as far as springfield for the rest of the way she was to ride alone and as she supposed unnoticed save by the watchful conductor to whose care her father had entrusted her she was beginning to feel lonely when a gentlemanly-looking man of about forty-five approached her seat with an apology and by way of question spoke her name surprised but on her guard for she remembered her home warnings she made no reply but the pleasant stranger went on to say that he was a schoolmate of her mother whom he called by her girl name this had its effect and when he mentioned the names of other persons whom she knew and begged to hear something of these old friends with whom he once went to school she made no objection to his seating himself by her side the man made himself very agreeable and the young girl of sixteen thought how delighted her mother would be to know she had met one of her old playmates who said so many complimentary things about her he talked very tenderly about the loss of his wife and once went back to his own seat to get a picture of his motherless little girl and a box of bonbons the conductor passed just then and asked the young lady if she ever saw that gentleman before she told him no but though the question was put very kindly and quietly it made her quite indignant as they approached the end of the journey the man penciled a brief note to her mother on a card signed what was purported to be his name and gave it to her then he asked her if he might get her a carriage provided her uncle whom she expected did not meet her and she assented at once when the train arrived in new york and the conductor came and took her travelling bag she was vexed and protested that the gentleman had promised to look after her the official told her kindly but firmly that her father had put her in his care and he should not leave her until he had seen her under her uncle's protection or put her in a carriage himself she turned for appeal to her new acquaintance but he had vanished when she reached home after her visit and told her experience and presented the card her mother said she had never known nor heard of such a man the stranger had evidently sat within hearing distance of the girl and her schoolmate and listening to their merry chatter all the way from boston to springfield had given him the clue to names and localities that enabled him to play his sinister game only the faithfulness of the wise conductor saved her from possibilities too painful to be recorded here youth's companion end of a girl's railway acquaintance